6.05, I'd like to call this meeting to order for uh, April 23rd, 2019. Board of Selectmen and have a uh, acceptance of the agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Curran, seconded by Mr. Harris. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Um, at this moment, um, are there any walk-ins? Yes. Can I approach? I have gifts for you guys in honor of Earth Day. Sorry, Jim. I will bring yours next time. Thank you. Well, there's no vodka in this. Oh. But um, <laughs> I will ah. work on that. Ah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I can see Thank the straw. you. <laughs> 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 it's really cool. That's All right, to good. open it. Thank you. Thank you. That's very nice. Is it a recyclable straw? <laughs> of course. BPA free. Saw that. I got the bedazzled one. Oh, of course you, you did. did. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much. So we should keep these here at the um, our office. How's that? Keep them with you. They're here. <laughs> <laughs> no, that makes sense. In honor of our Earth. Earth so Day. I'm Freya Schlegel, 9 Westgate Lane, and I just wanted to talk to you guys about the dump and the, all the plastic that's going into the trash. And the trash as in the... Recycle MSW. Recycle yes. as opposed to all of the loose plastic that's wrapped around everything like I've heard that it's getting better as far as manufacturing is concerned they're using less plastic like they're starting to try to phase stuff out but right now at the dump if you bring plastic to the dump you have to throw it in with your the trash, trash. Mm -hmm. and that takes longer for everything to biodegrade mm -hmm. yeah that's a good question um, <clears throat> Because at one time that used to just go directly into a bin. That's what yes, I remember. Yes, they used to and have to the left to the there glass. a big bin of non-recyclables. Right. And um, Kevin, are you? Do you um, have any answers or suggestions as to? I've got plenty of answers and open for suggestions. What is the area you're concerned about? The, the plastic. It's just all the the, the plastic wrapping and the plastic bags. Um, John, do you have that text that I sent you? I left my phone yeah. at home. So what it is, in essence, is there was, Kevin, um, at one point in time, next to the glass, uh, the recyclable for the uh, deposits, there used to be a bin there. It used to be the original glass bin, I think. And then we were putting a whole bunch of plastic directly into that. Is there some way that we're able to continue to keep that separate than putting it into our trash bags? Because I think right now, it's I think we're being told, plastic they is to go maybe. into the trash bags, which creates more Going difficulty to goes into landfill or wherever the they're top is we're not getting the recycling it's not being accepted in the recycling as the plastics like that um, with our suppliers so I thought originally you were talking about the plastic bags or are you yeah um, the plastic, plastic bag, bag it's the plastic um, wrapping that comes around like everything I think that's not recyclable store. right so it there is a company who will take it do you know of the company? Um, I sent you the text. Detect, detect. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what I'll do then is I'll My forward that on to. My charging in the kitchen. <laughs> I'll, I'll send that on to Kevin then to take a look. Because could we take a look to see how, because it makes sense if you're having plastic that is um, in with your trash that's biodegradable, so it creates we've more of a problem. we looked into that in the past and what there actually is, they take styrofoam and the plastic and they create a, like a ball that's somewhat recyclable. But the problem is, is we don't have the quantities to them <coughs> to come in, the company that we were dealing with. Um, if you have another company that can do it cheaper, we'd love to take a look at it. Um, it wasn't cost prohibitive when we looked at it before. The reason we separate the bags is because they get caught in the bail and they cause a lot of problems. And they actually downgrade uh, the recycling grade that's put on our recyclables, which means we get less money for it. Um, and the, the recycling market's been horrible, as I know Sean's brought up a couple times. Uh, talking about the transfer station, but yeah, glad if you have something, uh, we'd love you to we'd love to learn about it. Um, <coughs> you know, we're we're also involved in the Social Recycling Coalition, uh, you know, group. So if it works out, we could set it up so the company brings in and comes in and presents the whole South Shore. Awesome. Um, we'll gladly do that. Uh, I was the former chair of that, so we're we're all for it. Cool. Uh, when we looked at it before, though, it wasn't cost prohibitive. We couldn't supply enough. For them to come in and bring it in. Okay. Bring it in. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's E. L. Harvey. Out of what? They're out of Westboro. Yeah, but I, I think there was issues. I we did reach out to them at one time and we looked at some of the recycling, but 
it's the cost of shipping the stuff and the material and, and to bring them in. It's a, there's a machine that creates, a, it shrinks all the styrofoam and everything and makes it so gross. We looked at, we yeah. looked at it about two years ago. Okay, I do have um, a contact that I can um, reach out to Great. and get in touch with you guys. You can stop in DPW and give me the information. And Excellent. Go forward with it, but, uh, That'd be great. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you. Have a Thank great Thank you very night. much. Thank you. Any other um, walk ins? All right. Um, seeing that, then uh, Jim, I'll turn over to you for the uh, town report. A couple things, real quick. Uh, this Saturday is Ship Shape Day, 27th. Supplies are available at the town hall between 8 and 10, so this is a great event. Then you leave the bags up by the side of the road and the highway department will pick them up. But it's a great event for cleaning up the town, beautifying it, so I hope people get out and we have a nice day. Tomorrow night, 6.30 at the library is our meeting on North Situate. Brad Washburn, our planning and community development director, is going to be leading that meeting. Where? Uh, it's going to be at the library. So we're going to have a wide-ranging discussion on, on North Situate, maybe some things we can do in North Situate also uh, to update people on where we are on the regional SOAR. Uh, on that issue, uh, Cohasset's town meeting is next Monday. After that, they will be discussing and hopefully voting to go forward with what we call this, what I call the smaller plan oh, uh, down South Main Street, connecting our places in North Situate through South Main Street into Cohasset. Uh, they still want to do some study on what the impacts and what type of development they would get if they soared Route 3A. Uh, and obviously, we don't want to wait. Well, we want to get going. So uh, hopefully they'll do that, and then we'll be on that path to get started on that. We've already contacted the engineer, so let's start taking a look at this and, and make sure it's feasible. But um, you know, the original plan was for South Main Street to come up into North Situate, then go loop around 3A. <coughs> so there shouldn't be an issue sending it the other way. And then if we go with the larger plan later, rerouting at least part of that surge that way so hopefully within two weeks they'll make a decision and we'll be able to to get started on that Good. so um, ice pigging is underway you've seen the signs uh, this week we've been on country way doing that main uh, most of the dead ends on there all have dead end water mains I know we talked about this and none of them had a hydrant or a flushing gate at the end of the cul-de-sac so the last anywhere from four to 500 feet of the road, there was no way for us to flush the end of that pipe. Uh, I sent you um, Oakhurst when we put in the flushing gate, what that looked like. So we flushed all those yesterday and today. We think we got some really good results from that. Um, the, the water came out, the pig came out really kind of nasty, but after that, the water looked really good. We will be doing a survey monkey to residents in those areas, asking if they're seeing an improvement in their water quality. Tomorrow we're going to be on Old Oak and Bucket. Uh, we think that's going to be another really productive pigging. Um, as you know, Old Oak and Bucket took well 17A for years, which is very high in manganese. So we think that uh, that pipe's going to be pretty uh, pretty contaminated, for lack of a better word. And we'll get some good cleaning results on that. Then we'll be down Driftway, Kent Street, and heading into uh, Situate Harbor. Ask a question. Sure. How are you sending the survey to those residents? Uh, we said email blast, Kevin. You have Once everyone's email? email? About a survey, I know the water department's working on it. Okay. Um, so we'll find a way to, to target them. I, <coughs> might, have, might be trying to send it to the whole town, which isn't fair because it's hard to pin those areas down. They, they were either thinking going out with the cards, the individually self-stamped cards, and having people fill them out and send them back so that we could get an idea if they did notice any improvements. Okay. Um, we noticed we, we have had a lot of complaints in some of those streets, so we feel like even just putting the flushing hydrants in able to flush those is going to be a huge improvement. Okay. Thanks. Anybody else? No. So, I mean, I, I think we talked about it last time. We also found a couple of, uh, on one street at the end of the main, there was a one inch service coming off, which would go to your house, and then there were three houses connected to the one inch service. Um, I don't know how those people all took showers at the same time, but we've corrected that. So we've corrected a lot of other things that the water department's found on there. Uh, they put a lot of work in it, so hopefully we're going to get the results that we're expecting out of that. But it, it looked really good today when we were out there uh, and yesterday. So, so far, so good. Uh, finally, uh, just so the board knows, Game 7 is tonight. So uh, <laughs> the faster we can get through this meeting, the happier I'll be. I will be streaming it live over here if anybody wants to, wants to know what's going on. Just don't ask me any questions because I'm not going to be paying much attention. <laughs> okay. We appreciate your honesty. <laughs> Just trying to be honest. Anybody else? Any questions? 
Anybody want to know the score right now is, Jim? Has it started yet? Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, thank you. Then let's get started on our 615 uh, review discussion. Uh, Community Campus Senior Center and Recreation Department presentation. We have Nancy Holt, the Finance Director here. Nancy and Town Accountant, I guess, Finance Director and Town Accountant. So that's typically, so is that the exact, just, just Finance Director is what I like to call it. Call me whatever you want, I'll answer to it. <laughs> The they best finance point. director in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. How's that? Well, let's put it this way. Anyone watching at home just turned on the Bruins game or anything else mm -hmm. other than to watch this. Oh, I'm sure there's Maybe some people not. who turned on yeah. to watch Ruth, this. I'm <laughs> pretty confident there are. Yeah. yeah, Ruth, would you, you mind if we could ask you to hit those light switches? Thank you. Seth, can you get those on TV? Uh, yes. Seth, thank you for blessing uh, your presence here with us. <laughs> it's like a long time. We haven't seen you here. I always love seeing you guys. Good. <laughs> Okay, so good evening, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to have a little bit of a debt recap with the board, um, especially so that we can have a discussion about the Senior Center financing and our options for that. Yep. So the objectives of this meeting um, are a summary of the current debt position, projects <coughs> on their horizon and how they will be and could be accommodated, and then financing for the community campus for Senior Center and Recreational Facilities options and impacts. And as always, I will try to talk as fast as possible. <laughs> So our current issue long-term debt for all funds is just over $102 million. And this is where it breaks down to. Most of it is in the debt exclusions. Um, and then the next largest would be the water department. Again, for those of you who don't like graphs, we went for a table and a pie chart, just to have a better feel for how it looks like and how it breaks apart. Um, the general fund debt, that which is covered by the tax levy, whether it be um, by a debt exclusion or within the levy is the vast majority of that, about $74 million. And these are just the categories of where the debt is parceled out for what purposes. And again, sometimes it's easier to see it in a pie chart format. So the bulk of it is in um, the buildings, town buildings and school buildings, because those were the major projects. But you can also see about 6% uh, to foreshore and about 2% um, to roads. Most of the road uh, authorizations we've done in the last few years have been uh, cash authorizations. What's still out there? Um, we have pieces of the three debt exclusions still out there. We will not need to or issue any additional debt for the middle school. We may not need to issue any additional debt for the library or the public safety complex. Public building is closing those projects out now, as is the school building committee. Uh, town meeting, special town meeting, voted to pay down the facilities design and the integrated financial software, so those will fall off. Um, we also have um, the foreshore protection for $2 million, which has not been allocated to any project, so it just sits out there as an available authorization. The septic loan program, which was approved, would be paid off with betterments. Um, we haven't done any drawdowns on that yet. And then we have the FEMA foreshore design, the $4 million that was authorized back in November for those projects, and we'll touch on those. The foreshore protection and athletic field renovation that we just did at the annual town meeting. So again, just a more graphical in, uh, look at how our debt is going to retire. By 2023, a third of the outstanding um, within the levy general fund debt will be retired. By 2025, over half of it, um, and on so on and so forth. And that is from either paying cash as you go or from rapid amortization. So rather than borrow something for 20 years, we borrow it for 10 years and try to pay it down faster. Again, this shows our actual debt service budget. And I know Tony's very familiar with this. We're around the, we try to keep around the 1.5 to $1.6 million <coughs> in our general fund That's budget. Um, so this is our within the levy, within Proposition 2.5 general fund debt. And as you can see, we have retirements. So we have some uh, places in that chart. And this is what I'd like to refer to as the opportunity chart. This is uh, retiring debt. So you can see around 2024, 2025, there's some opportunities. 2026 to 2027, there's large chunks of debt retiring. Usually these coincide with bonds that are uh, maturing. So if you were going to be looking at projects within the levy that you wanted to uh, finance, you'd want to look at those years for potentially being places where that financing could happen. That's if you could push them out a little bit. Uh, the major enterprise capital projects that are out there, the water treatment plant upgrades, those are going to be supported by water rates. Um, it would qualify for a Clean Water Trust loan. We would have to apply for it and see if it was <coughs> accepted. The dollar value of that project is going to depend. We don't know. The engineering hasn't been done. The water study hasn't been done. 
So whether it would be a joining facility for redundancy, subsequent upgrades to the existing facility or a new facility, that's yet to be determined. So the actual cost is going to vary, but it's out there on the horizon. While 17A, uh, the green sand filter facility, was approved at annual town meeting, that has already been accepted for a low interest loan by the Clean Water Trust and will be financed that way, as was the water treatment plan improvements for $4 million in design and engineering. Again, none of that is going, the $4 million is not going to be incurred until the water study is concluded and the board decides how it wants to move forward with that project. Nancy, and quick question mm -hmm. on that. Sorry if I interrupt. The, um, the uh, water um, trust loans, how, uh, <laughs> how long are those? Typically. Clean Water Trust, you can usually um, choose from 20 to 30 years, uh -huh. but you have to be accepted. So the first two phases of the $22 million water pipe project were not accepted into the program. Okay. But the $8 million has been accepted. It has been accepted. And now we, we can had, determine the We had an application for the Hummer Rock water mains, and that was rejected. Hmm. So okay. they choose how they want to structure <coughs> their, their like bond, treatment, you know? and then they accept mm -hmm. or not accept, and then you can reapply the next year but the application yeah, it's not like a two-page thing it is yeah, literally an inch thick oh. so it's something that you have to have engineers do for you oh, good question so there is a cost factor to that thank you yeah, um, the identified major capital projects that exist that are funded by the tax levy would be the athletic fields um, it's a ten million dollar project as everyone knows from a few weeks ago 8.3 million supported by CPA revenues and then the 1.6 million by the general fund tax levy as the town <coughs> administrator has already mentioned um, we're planning to do some free cash pay down of that in the coming year so I don't expect that we would issue a full 1.6 million hopefully we we'll, won't issue anything but if we do it'll be reduced from that the bigger item we haven't talked about that much um, we've alluded to it when we talk about the FEMA um, storms are the subsidized foreshore storm damage repairs from the last four storms. <coughs> As you can see from the dates, this, these repairs go back seven years. None of this work has been done, most of it because we've been caught up getting hit with another storm before we can get mobilized. And the other issue is that the red tape involved. FEMA will pay you to uh, reimburse you for 75% of your cost to repair the damage. So if stone one, four, and six move, you can put one, four, and six back. But when you're talking about a revetment or a seawall, that doesn't work. You can't hire a contractor to move three stones. It's a bigger project. So what we've been talking about with the board and the town administrator and um, MEMA is potentially consolidating some of those projects into bigger projects across the storms. And that discussion is moving forward. Um, and we will continue to update the board as it moves forward. Nancy, do we have to resubmit um, for a percentage for reimbursement for FEMA if you're going to bundle them, if you will? No, but they would have to decide to which disaster they're going to assign it. Mm -hmm. So they can choose that they, um, and we think what they might do is say, okay, we'll take Sandy, Nemo, and Juno, so Third Cliff, who's in all four disasters, and we'll just call it one project under Riley. So we haven't formalized our Riley damages for the foreshore yet. Um, they're estimated at approximately eight million. We're, we were potentially going to have a meeting tomorrow. We'll probably have a meeting next week to finally sign off on the site <coughs> um, assessments. Uh, the town's general fund share that would be four point nine million. We have confirmed with MEMA that the Commonwealth Seawall and Dam Repair Fund, which helped pay for the Oceanside Drive seawall, um, seawall program, we could use that towards our town share. So if we could get a grant through that program, that me helps us meet our 25% or a low interest 2% loan. Um, they also said the coastal zone management grants mm -hmm. and potentially municipal vulnerability grants can be used to help fund the town share. MEMA is <laughs> very motivated to uh, work with FEMA and to resolve situates issues. Uh, we've become uh, very popular in a good sense that they are very, there are a lot of people who are motivated, including the governor, to resolve our um, outstanding FEMA claims and get them moving so that we can make those repairs. Let me, let me just ask you right now then, with just the Storm Sandy, Nemo, Juno, Riley, how much are we talking about that the town is, um, could see for 25%? 4.9 million would be our 25%. Okay, for all those storms? Yeah. Okay. Right now that's at 19.7 million is the estimated damages. Keeping in mind that 2000, uh, Sandy, Nemo, and Juno are all at va the value at that time. Mm -hmm. now, the reason I'm asking, Nancy, is because in the capital plan, there are three different years. I thought maybe it's two, 2021, 2022, where we're looking at potentially seawall repair replacement 
for eight, ten, and twelve million dollars, and that's separate and apart from the four point nine, correct? Potentially, yes. Was we have the um, Turner Road, which would be an Army Corps of Engineers, which is on the capital plan, but the Army Corps of Engineers is still doing the feasibility study for that area. Mm -hmm. If we qualified for their uh, small <coughs> construction grant, that would be a 65-35 match. Same thing, it's a federal program. We could probably use state grants to help us meet our share. Okay. So we don't have to do anything. Um, the only thing that we are going to have to decide as we get closer to coming to a final decision on whether to consolidate these projects with FEMA is we've been using time extensions. And currently, our time extensions now run out on 2021. Mm -hmm. And FEMA is beginning to say, if you're not going to do the repairs, we're just going to cancel the projects. Because obviously, you, you don't need the reimbursement because you're not going to do it, which you can see their point. Um, it doesn't help us in trying to decide what we do and how we finance it. But that's a discussion for another day, and we'll bring it back before you. But it is out there. <coughs> um, we've identified them. We just want to make sure that the board is aware of it. Um, the new elementary school Nancy, or renovations? Much, is yeah. any of that money um, expense reimbursement for the, the FEMA money? Does any of it have to do with firefighter stuff or is it all just repair to rocks? Is there any? This is all repair to rock. So there's no we already got expense. Involved. We've already got all that back yet? Everything but Riley. The Riley claims or the, the million dollars that we spent are still ongoing. <laughs> I can tell you that because I've had <laughs> nine emails from FEMA today and I'm not exaggerating. Um, and those are moving we've gotten one that's gone all the way to um crc which is the claims something center it's fema it's all acronym um and the others are moving along they're all in there they're just reviewing them and then they'll move them off to either texas or california and then we'll begin to see reimbursements i don't expect to see any reimbursements in this fiscal year i would be surprised if we got anything this calendar year but everything now is electronic with them they go through a portal so they say it will work faster we hope so and that all will go to the stabilization fund? It will close out to free cash and town meeting can vote to put it in any stabilization fund, however you want to handle it. That's Last where it came from, right? Um, well, we already replenished it. Oh, that's right. Right, But you can choose to put it um, and add more to it or put it in one of the other stabilization funds. Okay. okay. Um, the new elementary school or renovations to existing schools, um, the superintendent was before you to talk about the statement of interest for Cushing and Hatherley. That's been filed. Looking at what we were previously estimated to, uh, what we previously received for MSBA funding, it was 44% for the Gates Middle School. And this project would definitely have to be a debt exclusion. Just because the statements of interest are filed, it's not guaranteed um, that we would be in the next review cycle. If you may remember where Superintendent Hickey from the South Shore Botech was before you for his budget, and he mentioned that they had been trying for five years to get in the MSB, MSBA cycle, and they, every year they put in their statement of interest and they wait. It depends. It's needs, needs based on facility condition. So even though we say our facilities need immediate attention, if you're going up against a 100-year-old school in South Boston, their, their need may be greater than yours and you may get bumped. So I don't know when we will be accepting the program, um, but it's not a, a guarantee that it's going to be immediate. And even once we're accepted, we would still have to do a feasibility study um, to look at what the options are and what the needs are. Realistically, the process is going to take five to seven years. So this is out there, but it's farther out on the horizon. So are you throwing it like in seven years out or ten years out? I don't even know if I put it on the five-year capital plan okay. because I don't know if it's that close. Yeah. I probably would make some mention of it um, just so you're aware, mm -hmm. but I don't even know in five years if you would be approving this. I would hope we would have some type of movement on it by then, but you don't, you don't know. Um, the Gates feasibility study was in November of 12. The project was voted in 14, and the school opened in 17. And there was plenty of work that was done before that feasibility study. But it, just to give you a, a frame of reference, I know people are concerned about the schools. Um, but again, when you hit state government and federal government, the speed at which they operate is slightly less than what you'd like to see sometimes. So our general fund non-debt exclusion debt service budget, we talked about um, where we were. The blue would be the, uh, the reddish, depending on how good your graphics card is, is the current t general fund debt service that's outstanding. This is non-debt exclusion. The pale blue is the other projects we spoke about at that chart before. 
Um, 500,000 for the FEMA design. We have contracts outstanding already on that. I'm assuming 50% of the fields could be assuming high, could be assuming low, and all 300,000 of the foreshore that was just approved. You can see how that starts to level out that line. Mm -hmm. And then the green line would be um, if we were to bring on $4 million worth of FEMA repairs for foreshore. <coughs> The way it's structured for this graph, it's two million and two million because you wouldn't, you likely would not award one contract to do the work all at once. It would likely be over a period of years, smaller contracts. Um, but just so you have a sense of what it would do if you were to bring on that debt, if you were to do that, it is going to limit your ability to approve other projects for debt within the levy limit without raising that budget above the 1.6 to 1.65 area. Uh, which we have been doing for the last several years. We've tried to avoid uh, recommending items with debt as much as possible. As uh, the town administrator did mention to you, the capital plan would have been larger this year if we'd not put the million dollars back in the stabilization fund for the storm costs. So keeping it on a pay-as-you-go as much as possible gives you the opportunity if something larger comes along. And as you can see, that's beginning to hit. The bigger hit is in 26, 27, that year when we previously said that there was a, a major retirement of a bond. And again, this is just projections. None of this is written in stone. None of this has been approved. It's just potentials. So our existing debt exclusions, what's more of what our discussion is about tonight. These are the debt exclusions that are currently approved when they retire, um, the principal outstanding and also <coughs> the principal and interest. So as you can see at the bottom of the pile is the sewer upgrade. It, there's a major retirement that occurred in the current year that we're in. And then the balance of it will retire in fiscal 21. And by retirement, I mean it'll be paid off. The next one will be Jenkins, um, the Jenkins School and the high school renovations, which will be in 2025. And then after that, you have Wampatuck. Uh, Wampatuck, as you can see, is quite small. So you really don't see a great pickup when you, um, that retirement occurs. This is what our current, on an average home, which is $576,038 this year, the additional amount that's being added to your tax bill. And this is not including any offsets from the solar array <coughs> or wind turbine for the public safety and middle school projects, and that's about $37 a year. Um, those aren't, we didn't guarantee those through the end of the project, so I don't include them when I do this type of uh, valuation. Just for those that are at home, the large purple is middle school, the red is the public safety complex, the green is the library, the black is the is Wampatuck School, uh, the blue above that is Jenkins High School, and then the uh, orange is sewer upgrade. And as you can see, we have the retirement office we spoke about. Again, we have this opportunity chart to see when there's going to be major retirements in the debt exclusions. As I mentioned, fiscal 20 has a significant uh, opportunity that we're going to talk about. And then again in fiscal 26, which is the year after Jenkins and the high school retires. So we do need to talk a little bit more about the uh, impact of the major school project. We've touched on most of this. Um, the only thing I didn't touch on was if such a project were to come forward, the types of things we might talk about would be how long would we finance it for. We finance the middle school for 25 years. You might look at that similarly for this type of expense. And in today's dollars, it would be about $9,300 over a 25-year period of an impact of an $85 million project with a 44% reimbursement. Like I said, that could be any number at any time because we're not accepted into the program. We haven't had a feasibility study. We don't have a final project. But it's out there, so we should touch on it, discuss it, and at least know about what that impact could be in the future. So what we all want to talk about, financing at the community campus for the senior center and recreational facilities. The project cost, this board has already voted, is $12,232,450. There is the potential for offsetting revenue. We have n nothing that's been confirmed yet, so I'm assuming full freight to the taxpayer for the entire project. But potential offsetting revenues include private donations. The um, library's gotten over a million dollars in private donations. I don't expect the same level, but I'm assuming that there are people that would like to make donations if the project were to move forward. Uh, we still have um, the $2 million in the bond bill. If that ever moves forward, we might see something. Um, we'll sale the old building. Mm -hmm. Sale of the old building. Disposition of real estate, yep, we have that or any other property. Um, transfers of unused proceeds from other projects. Uh, I think John is still recovering from reading the capital um, budget uh, motion at town meeting, so that does happen <laughs> and could happen again. Not, not, not for me, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> you can always just make you be the, the 
person who wants to invite it. you back. Um, there are also possible grant opportunities. Um, the Municipal ADA Improvement Grant, we've gotten that for the last two years, once for the um, Town Marina Project for the Gangway, and this year for the ADA Transition Plan, which is on your um, agenda in about four hours, I'm sorry to say. Um, the maximum award on this would be $250,000. So we are making ADA potentially making ADA improvements to the gym. So this would, could be a good match for that. The Community Development Block Grant, we've talked about this before, and Jim has mentioned that we are not a competitive town for that grant because our uh, HUD score, which is a, the HUD low to moderate income score, is low. It's 22.9. Um, I gave the board in their packet a listing of communities who were awarded this grant in mm -hmm. fiscal 18, and next to it I put their score. There was no one with a score that low who got a grant. It doesn't mean we couldn't get the grant. We certainly should be looking at this grant. Um, Marshfield did build their senior center with one of these grants back in 2001. Uh, I did highlight for you that there were some elder services and senior other in recreational items mentioned to other people who were awarded. It all depends on who applies that year, whether we're competitive or not competitive. The next round will be March of 2020. So that would be the next time that we could apply for this grant. We can see if there's anything off cycle, but I don't think there really is. And I also um, put on the presentation just the types of facilities that are covered. And as you see, this project fits well into the type. It would only be the, the fact that um, the economics of the town that might make it possibly not a good fit. The maximum award on, a pro on that type of grant is between 800 and 825,000. So I did find another private uh, grant. We're not in their priority area, but they have made awards to uh, Massachusetts groups before. It's a three-page letter of interest that we could file. Doesn't hurt to file a letter of interest <laughs> and see what happens. Uh, I know Linda's been looking for other grants. I have also been looking for other grants to see if there's anything we can do from the veterans component or any other component. Uh, so it's certainly not without uh, attempts, but these are two main grants that I think are uh, well worth pursuing. Nancy, what's the uh, three-page one that you found? It's the um, Henry Weintraub Foundation. Um, and they do fund capital costs for senior centers, but it's basically in Baltimore, um, New York City, San Francisco, Israel, and one other place. But recent projects, there have been two projects that they've done for housing mm -hmm. in Boston. Mm. So, I mean, it's a De Hail Mary, yeah, but at this point, if the project were to move forward, I can write a three-page letter. <laughs> I can make it very compelling. <laughs> Um, so this project would definitely have to be a debt exclusion. We couldn't afford to um, do this project under, within the debt, within the levy limit. The annual, what a debt exclusion is for people who aren't familiar with or are new to town since the last time this came around, is the annual repayment of the principal and interest on the debt would be added to the real estate tax bill in addition to the amount we were allowed to levy under Proposition 2 and a half. The estimated impact of the project over 20 years is $2,230. For our discussion tonight, I've assumed a 20-year bond. You could go longer. To 25, you're just going to incur more interest for the, the mm -hmm. what you might gain on, on lowering down that cost. But you can look mm -hmm. at it. Um, different options that would be available to finance the project that could affect how much the taxpayer would be impacted. The total amount would not change, just how it would come on to someone's property taxes. So we before we talked about that opportunity chart with the debt exclusions and having a retirement, a major retirement. So normally we would issue the debt at the end of the project. There is a possibility if the, ten, if the board were so inclined to break it into two pieces. Issue six, if the project were to move forward um, and be approved, issue the debt six million basically immediately, um, sometime in this calendar year before the tax rate was set in December, and then issue the balance at the end. Uh, the reason you would do that is for smoothing, and I'll show you what I mean. So this is our debt exclusions for the next approximately 10 years. Debt exclusions go out to 2041, but if I put that on a chart, it becomes completely illegible, so I didn't do that. <laughs> um, so you can see in fiscal 19, which is the second column, that was $811. So that was how much people are paying this year on their tax bill. Next year, because of that <coughs> retirement, it's going to go down to 737, then to 713. If this project were to come forward, I would expect to see that hitting the tax bill around 2022, and you'd see that jump from 713 to 825. So the first year impact for the project is about $140. 
uh, $144. Because of what's retiring, you'd probably feel it as about $112 on your tax bill, just the, the delta, because some stuff's going to fall off as this comes on. So that would be what you would expect. If you wanted to do this other option and split it into two pieces, the pale blue would be the first piece issuing in 2020, and the uh, pale, I don't even know what color that is, salmon, <laughs> um, it's pink on my screen, would be the second piece of 6.2 million, and assume, well, I'm assuming that there are no offsetting revenues to this, issuing for the first payment in 2022. As you can see from the dollar numbers above, that smooths it out. So you don't have these it going down and then popping back up. It doesn't change the total amount that someone's gonna going to pay. We might benefit from some lower interest costs if the rates start to climb back up by the time the last half of it gets issued. Um, but I'm, I cannot predict interest costs at this point. We never thought that interest rates would stay this low this long. So it is something for the board to consider um, I'd like the board to give me a little direction for the other public documents, which way I should consider when I um, present those out. I do have both versions. Um, to me, as much as I don't want to borrow money up front, we'd have to, we'd have to make sure we could spend it, which we, could, we can, because if, if the project were to move forward, um, they were talking about awarding a contract in July, going out to bid in June, awarding in July or close to it. So you'd have shovels in the ground potentially in the fall. Um, so you, I, I don't find it a problem that we could spend the first six million if that was the case. Uh, so it's an option to, s to smooth it out. No. So what does this look like chart-wise? If we were just to do a single issue, if the project were to be approved, and we did a single issue with it coming on board in 2022, the first red um, column Mm -hmm. shows the impact so pro approximately 145 dollars it's 144 something if you were to split it into two different bond issues as we just discussed the um, second red column shows how it would kind of ease in you'd only be paying half of it for the first two years the third year you'd have the full impact and then it would start to decline again and then at the other end of it you have the same thing the last two years would be quite a bit reduced from the, the middle part so again, bottom line, you're still going to pay what you're going to pay for the project, which would cost me $2,230 overall. Um, but it would just change how it came onto the bills, smooth it out overall. Could be easier for some people, might not be easier for other people who would rather not have, it, have that break in between. So it is something to consider. So in summary, <coughs> I know I'm making Tony happy because I said the word summary. The Community <laughs> Campus Center for Senior Center of Recreation Facilities was going to cost the average taxpayer, uh, average homeowner of a home assessed that with an assessed value of $576,038, an estimated $2,230 over 20 years. Due to the retiring debt exclusions in fiscal mm -hmm. 19, 21, and 25, um, there is the ability to uh, put the project in over two phases that would not increase it beyond our current level of debt for the debt exclusion, the, the current impact. Um, and the other approved projects, we're aware of them. We've accounted for them. We know what, what their impact would be. So it's not as if this is a one-off and we're not looking at the others. We're aware of the others and how they would impact and when they would impact. Again, as we talked about, we have that opportunity chart to see where we want to slide some of those things in, the larger projects that we know that are out there. So just to go back to that slide, I just want to show you in 2018, the additional was the first column of uh, dollar values was $831. You're not going to go back above that in either um, way of financing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's 576000 What was it? Uh, $576,038. $38, thank you. You made me question myself there for a minute. I had to go and look. Uh, all right. Um, Ruth could... I ask you to turn those lights back on. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I questions do apologize from the board. for going so quickly. No, that's all right. I have a question, and I don't know that you can answer this, but you know, in looking at keeping 2020 and 2021, I think of the water rates and mm -hmm. you know the increases there that residents are potentially going to see based on 
the water upgrades that are happening. So do you have any numbers? Ex you know, I know it's up to our vote, but do you have any sort of thoughts, projections on what those look like per um, household? The I know it's based on usage, but. Yeah, I don't have like a dollar value. I have the percentage that I think the rates are going to go up. Uh -huh. So for the green sand filter, I'm thinking along the lines of a 17% rate increase to accommodate that. And that depends on when we actually get that debt bill. The difference with Clean Water Trust as compared to how we normally finance is we choose when we go to market. The Clean Water Trust will tell you, here's your debt. Now it's time to pay. They will wait until we start the project, so they won't borrow in anticipation uh -huh. beyond that. So that could be a couple of years out. The only thing that we're going to have to look at for the, our rate discussion for fiscal 20 is the 1.2 million that we did at the November special town meeting for the emergency repairs um, and potentially the uh, 4 million if that moves forward with some type of a contract <coughs> that we're going to have to borrow for. The 8 million, I don't think we need to reflect it in fiscal um, 20s rates at this time okay. unless that project just starts taking off and starts moving. I don't think we can do that within a year. Um, the four million itself, um, we're looking at probably an 11.5 percent if you were to spend the full amount. And I know the board; that all depends on what the board decides to move forward with after the water study. So again, there's some time before that's going to happen. So we might not even incorporate it into the 20 rates if we know um, we're not going to have the results of the water study that quickly because they haven't even awarded the contract for that yet. Okay. Um, and then. <coughs> How long are those increases for? <coughs> How long are the increases for? They would be going forward, and then you could look at once that debt retires. 20 years, is on. that what you're thinking? Yeah, I would think at least 20 years. Um, there's a difference on the $4 million. If you could get a clean water trust financing for that, and I'm assuming full $4 million, it might not, it might not be. The difference in a rate increase is between an 8.5 to an 11.5 if we'd have to go out to market at 4.5. So being able to participate in the clean water trust, even though we lose flexibility as to when, we gain um, relief in interest rates. So I don't think that the $8 million and the $4 million, we can ha we'll have that discussion when we have the rate discussion for water rates. I don't know if you want to reflect it this early in the 20 rates or not. I would think you might want to just reflect the $1.2 <coughs> million, anything else with that we have that's going on with the other smaller projects that, that they have, and then look at that to um, on a mm -hmm maybe 2021, definitely 2021, going forward and see if we can't parse it out. That doesn't include the $40 million for a new plant, right? Doesn't, no, until we know what we're actually going to have to we'll do for that. So that's four times that size, because one's eight and one's four, right? Mm -hmm. Can you remind me what the average water bill is right now? I can't remember. Do we know? I can't remember either. I'm sorry. Yeah. I just Kevin, he knows. <laughs> have this average sewer water bill, bill for our discussion later in this meeting. Mm -hmm. I don't have the average water bill on me, but I can find it while this meeting is going on. John? Any more good news? <laughs> grants, grants, grants. <laughs> We're very good grant writers, as it was <laughs> evidenced by last year's $5 million worth of grants. My head's spinning. We have so some excellent grant writers in town, and we have some opportunities. And um, even for the fields project, there are park grants that we definitely should go after for that one. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think we have we have Brad, we have Linda, who's an excellent grant writer, and Brad for some of the bigger ones, and put them together for, the, for that project because it's a mix of recreational and elder services. So it's multi-generational, and it, it ticks a, quite a few boxes and makes it more attractive. Mm -hmm. right. at, at this point, you know, we apply for everything that we can possibly apply for, and we do really well. Yeah, I think our track record shows that. But as you as you already mentioned, you do have some assets you could that you could sell. Sell. Tony, any more? More? Well, the only question I have, I mean, you're saying there's two options to finance it. One of them is basically prepaying. You know, borrowing it a little earlier than you have to. Are you recommending one of the two? For smoothing, I would recommend doing it in two issues, especially where we know that there isn't any further design. It's basically shovel in the ground, mm -hmm. and you're going directly out to bid. So you could spend down that first $6 million and then you wouldn't issue the latter half. I don't think we would get more than $6 million in any type of offsetting revenue. So I think you'd be safe with that. 
but the smoothing is what, two, three, four, five dollars. Yeah. It's not. It's no, not dramatic. It is when you look at um, where the first numeric column. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're going from eight hundred and eleven dollars to twenty twenty one to seven thirteen, and then you're going to hop back up that hundred and forty five dollars to eight, you know, to eight twenty five. Oh no, I, I understand it, yeah. but when you're paying it, you know, the difference is eight twenty five to eight twenty one. You know, you're, you'd actually give people a break for two years. Yeah, and, and that's that's the thing. Would you rather have do. that two years of break, or would you rather have it so your escrow is not kind of doing this thing? Yeah. Right. If you have an escrow account, I, it's kind of six and one half dozen of the other, and that's why I wanted the board to think about it and and decide how they want to move forward with you know the public impact documents. I can do them both ways because you you don't have to make a decision. Um, it's just helpful if you have a sense of what you think might be easier for a taxpayer yeah I mean you're all taxpayers you're all going to be paying this would you rather see it smoothed out or would you rather have a break for a couple of years and then have it come back on board my two cents on it is I think that smoothing make it, it stick it'd be sticker shock I mean yes it'd be nice to have more money in your pocket in the next couple of years but I think generally speaking you get used to paying a certain amount and it's as you say it's it's built into your escrow if you have a mortgage and it it's not a huge sticker shock when it's just a nominal change every year i think if it goes up 120 dollars in a year then even though if you know it's coming it's still there so i prefer i think that the split makes more sense for um comfort of pay as taxpayers Sean, well, i would agree um People get used to spending a certain amount and live within their means, and so rather than have it going up and down, say the smoother you can make it, the better. So, are you looking for a decision tonight from the board in preparation for the? Um, it's not on your agenda meeting? to vote, um, but I I have prepared impact documents like we did for the public safety complex, right. what we did for the middle school, the library, that we can that we can make available to people so that we get a sense for how this impacts them, not just at the average, but I have like the, the regular chart that says, okay, if I'm, my house is about a million, this is going to impact me. I just need to know, I think it, it'll change. change. So I, I have, um, I'm hearing you two say it, think one way <laughs> and you two think the other. And no pressure, John. You know, <laughs> sticker shock see. actually does, uh, Having sat up here for a while, sticker shock creates a lot of um, discussion <coughs> and debate, no doubt, in the public. Um, but I think from a realistic standpoint, which I think is, makes sense about smoothing, you know, personally. But on the other hand, you know, it's the taxpayer's money. Uh, if it's going to save them <coughs> money, as much as it may seem small for some, it's, it's their money that they can invest or they can do whatever they want until we actually go out to bond it, which would make me inclined to say, I don't want to smooth it. Okay, so. Um, so I'd be inclined to say, um, we do it the way that you had proposed under the it's uh, a single. Ca column three as a single. Um, I, I appreciate the concept of smoothing because ideally that's what you really want to do when you start doing all these capital projects is try to maintain a certain amount, level it, and as some debt goes off, you bring on new debt and you kind of maintain that level. Unfortunately, we're spiking because all the deferred maintenance and the <coughs> lack of, for whatever reason, things weren't done sooner in time, and now we have this huge spike. But um, So that's why I think smoothing is a great idea long term. But I just think right now, for a year or two, I'd be inclined to go more with giving it to the taxpayer until they actually we need it. And again, if the project were the same amount at the end, they're it gonna is going to be amount. the same amount. Mm -hmm. So it's in not the like end, it's going to cost them any more by smoothing. It just means you're not going to you're going to pay first before you. You kind of it's gradual increase. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll move forward with the town oh. administrator. Well, we have to we didn't vote. vote. And vote. Well, it's not on your agenda to vote yeah. either. Well, can't we can't can. we vote? We could as long as discussion is there. Uh, we had mm -hmm. a uh, dis uh, review and discuss. Should we wait till it passes? Well, I well, think I think yeah. it, if I may, Mr. Chair, I think it's important if you're telling folks the first question everyone asks is, "What is the impact on my my tax bill?" And if 
we can't answer them it's going to be well it could be this it could be that you know depending on where the board goes i think it would help the initiative if they had a solid answer as to what the impact's going to be the other thing if, if depending on what the board wants directs me to do is i can just do it as a single project issuing once and that and then just add the note at the bottom saying you know there there may be an opportunity for some smoothing and it will be discussed at the time so you're not looking at either or these types of multiple different numbers this is the number if you want the project this is what you should expect it to impact you on the first year if the board makes a decision later on that they want to do something different because interest rates are going crazy or they want to take advantage of that because they've gotten some feedback from the community we can do it you could do it at that time don't you typically do the average per year anyway? I was just going to say, what's the house value um, that we, you have as We don't on? do the average. I wouldn't average it over all of the years because you're not going to get to that average to the ninth year. Mm. So I wouldn't you, take you the 22, 30, dividing it by 20. Okay. No, but you, I thought in the past you had done that. No. Taking all the payments, the 20 payments. Oh. No, sorry. Badly burned in another community when someone did that to me. And yeah, no, I, I won't do that. <laughs> Hmm. I didn't do it, but somebody else did. <coughs> excuse me. Well, here's the other thought. If we need to put a vote, <coughs> excuse me, we can do it at the next meeting. It'll be pretty quick. If well, in the, in the meantime, I, I do need to get some documents out. If it's all right with the board, I'll put it out as the single issue. We can vote now if you want. I don't, I don't care. I don't mind. I mean, I, I have no problems with it. So at least you have guidance as to what we're going to do. Well, do you need a vote? You've you got a sense right now. That's yeah. what we want. I'm going to vote for rounding if that matters anything. Rounding. <laughs> um, all right. So I think you got the yeah. census of the board then. I'll we'll get something that. out. Thank you so much. Nancy. Uh, actually, let's stop there. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, Jack. Uh, Jack Skoskis, but you mind currently on Drive. Just the question of what interest rate was used for the calculations? We use 4.5%. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Nancy, thank you very much. Thank you, audience, for no questions. <laughs> We're saving it for sewer. Um, <laughs> let's move on to the um, 715. Is, is, can we do the 715 uh, recognition? I think I saw a they, Phil von Erdstein's here. I don't know about Walter. If not, then we can move on to some other things. It's out there. Um, let's go down to the <laughs> Phil and uh, you know, Phil's here. I don't know if Walter Ferry is here. Yeah, this is on. We could probably get it done. Yeah, let's do it. At Norton Clan, they're kind of big. <laughs> You can come around here. <laughs> there you go. Staples. Begin the microphone. Let's see Try. Is that a good one? Jim? Walter Ferrier? Walter here? Oh, there he is. Yeah, he's here. He's, he's just. I just want to. We need a bigger hearing room. Yeah. Phil got every plumber and every resident in town to get here. <laughs> yeah, Should have been <laughs> employees over. Employees and yeah. daughters of employees, <laughs> nieces, nephews. It's the best stuff. <laughs> is Neil here? They're both here. Should come sit right up here. Is Bob here? Yeah. yeah. I'm say Bob too. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Bob looks happy to be here. <laughs> well, I'd like to welcome everybody here um, who's come. Um, this is uh, recognition. Um, I'll just say Walter Ferrier, wiring specter, um, 35 years. Uh, and Phil von Eiderstein, again, plumbing and gas inspector, 27 years. Um, you know, 
I, I find being on this board, it's always been challenging in many ways for various reasons and issues that a lot of people talk about. But one of the most, Im I guess say not important, but one of the most, um, one aspect that's the, uh, the least um, problematic or um, what's the word I want, um, enjoyable, let's put it to you frankly, the most enjoyable aspect of being on this board is occasions like this. You know, we sit up here in public service and Paul, you know, get elected, but it's these individuals who actually have been doing public service, helping all constituents, helping all residents, um, for helping them to get what they need. Um, in this case, you know, we have wiring inspector and we have plumbing. Um, these are public services that people should appreciate, and they do, and they should continue to appreciate it. The difficulty is we've had people who've dedicated themselves for enormous amounts of time. You know, um, uh, <laughs> lifetimes for some. Uh, 37 years is a phenomenal. I mean, I guess I was in elementary school maybe at that point uh, <laughs> when some of them, these people start. In today's day and age, people don't stay in those capacities and those jobs for long. Um, I'm not saying that's a criticism, but what I'm saying is that's the dedication, commitment that people have given to this town and to your residents. And, um, for me, it's, it's a pleasure and it's an honor to be able to sit up here and say thank you, but I'll more importantly to recognize you and um, because it's a great thing for the town and it's a great thing for the residents who really should say thank you personally. Uh, I know there's some departments that tend to get a little bit more because of uniforms or whatnot, but the reality is you touch so many families, so many people to be able to do different things and do it the right way so that they don't get taken advantage of. And um, I just want to say personally, you know, I want to thank you both. Um, that's why we bring you in here. We might like to invite your families because it is a big deal. Um, we spend a lot of time on a lot of issues that are big in town, but this is a, quite an accomplishment. And that's not saying that you're, you're retiring or anything. That's not our <laughs> point. But to be able to say thank you very much for that term, that commitment, um, goes way and above. And so many people can't do that in their own professions or don't do it. Um, and I just want to say, as chairman of the board of the town of Situate for the board of selectmen, I want to say thank you both. And um, I'll turn it over to the rest of my board. We have um, presents for you, but more importantly, it's it's the fact that you've done been doing this for the residents. And um, just want to thank you both. say something at all because uh, I know you've been working with the gentleman. Thank um, you very much John, thank you. Um, and I speak for myself and, and, uh, and Neil Duggan who's worked with them longer than I have as people know. But as you said, you know, the people who do this work are not very visible to most people at all times, but when they're needed, they're desperately needed and they're absolutely critical to the process. Um, these two gentlemen have both been with the town for a very long time. I have both been in the town for a very long time. Uh, I've known Phil since we were both children. Uh, and I would have to say that their service, their dedication, and just the kind of people they are are what makes this town a wonderful place to live in. Um, not just for the people who's, who are touched by their particular duties, but, but really for all of us. Um, the kind of inspection services that are provided by these gentlemen first take a tremendous amount of competence and skill, um, a tremendous amount of knowledge of not only the, the physical uh, workings of their two trades, but of the regulations governing those trades. It takes a tremendous amount of honesty, uh, intelligence, absolute integrity, and, and finally, and, and not at all least important, takes a tremendous amount of people skills. Every time you're out there, you're rubbing up against situations and people, whether they be contractors or owners or other interested parties, who um, have sometimes conflicting views of what's necessary or what has been done or not done, that, that kind of thing. And 
to manage that, to come away with uh, everyone uh, pleased with your performance and knowing at the same time that all of the work that, that you viewed meets all the codes and regulations and is safe for all of those involved. Um, it's no small accomplishment. It's really, I think, a remarkable achievement and to do it consistently day in and day out over the period of time that we're talking about um, is truly, truly phenomenal. I thank you both and, and the town thanks you both. And I'm very glad this is not a retirement party. <laughs> I'd be in serious trouble if it were. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Bob. No, just thank you very much for your service. It's it's unsung, and yeah. and you go out in storms, and you really get people back up on situations when they're hard, hard on their luck. And I, you know, you've done it for such a long period of time. I just want to thank you both for for your service. Likewise, thank you so much. And you know, I don't think anyone can say it better than Bob just did. So you know, but um, you've made this a safer town. So we appreciate it, and thank you for your continued service to the town. The only thing I would add, because I think absolutely Bob covered it all is this saying you know overflow people I don't know if you could see it on on TV land but everyone's here because not only do they respect your work for the town but they respect you as individuals and so we're so happy to have you as part of our community it's you Sean <laughs> thank you I'm amazed at who's here right? there's family <laughs> there's friends there's competition there's <laughs> secretaries and that to me says quite a bit and, and I and I also want to thank you I've worked a little bit with, with Phil not with Mr. Ferrier but uh, you know they covered it but thank you very very much and what what Bob said was is I had a chuckle I mean that that's you're his eyes and ears out there and you're out there and, you know contractors might not be happy with you or the homeowners not happy with what you have to say but you you know you're doing the right thing Make and it making it safer and uh, thank you very much I appreciate it okay. well we'd like to give these if that's okay um, Here, I'll, I'll save you the uh, <laughs> climb over Walter? Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're both welcome to say something. You're both welcome to stay here. <laughs> Frank, I'm, I'm happy to end the meeting after this one, too. <laughs> I move to adjourn, sir. <laughs> Everyone want to stay for the rest of the meeting? I think there's a meeting on, too. I'm sure you guys want to go, too. Hopefully. We'll give you a second to leave then. Get to the, get to the, the game. Score. Thank you very much, guys. Phil. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Shake your hand again. <laughs> Lisa, I'll see you later. <laughs> Thank, you <so> much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello, how are you? <laughs> You're welcome. You're more like Hawaii Chris could see us. Okay. Um, that was nice. So what we'll do is this. We have a public hearing at 720. We're a little early right now. So we're going to wait and go to some other items. Um, so why don't we go down to um, uh, Jesse? I see that you're here for an 810 discussion on the outdoor entertainment permit. Can you come up? Hello, Director Finney. Good evening. Hi. So I'm assuming this is very similar to what you've done last year. Correct. Um, outdoor entertainment for like movies and um, so this this is a concert series um, we would maybe be coming back to you guys for uh, something for movies in the fall All maybe right. um, but this is a concert series funded by our friends of the library um, last year we did it because it tied in nicely to our summer reading theme which was libraries rock um, we had such a great turnout 
between 100 to 200 or more people at each event. Um, we, the weather was great for us. Um, we're hoping it'll be as cooperative this year. So again, we're looking at Wednesday evenings. Um, we are looking to push the time back to 6.30 um, because we did a little poll and the one um, criticism that we got was that it's not quite enough time for those who are commuting in and out of the city to get there. So this will just give them a little bit more of a cushion. Um, well, we, as part of the Library of Things program, we're going to be investing in um, purchasing lawn games that people can check out of the library, but we're also going to have a set that people can use and check out to use on the grounds, um, nice. especially for teens and kids this summer to give them a little something else to do. But we're going to put those out on the lawn about an hour before the start of the concerts so that people can, you know, really just enjoy the space out there. Um, and on the 10th, um, July 10th, is the first concert series. Um, for that one, we will have a snow cone vendor um, at, at from 5 to 7. And um, I have uh, sent um, the chief, um, uh, Chief Stewart, an email about um, a potential police detail just for that one. Um, we had between four and 500 people at the um, kickoff last year. And the Branch Street was a little congested with parking along both sides of the street. So, you know, we may need their, their help with that event. Um, so I've, I've reached out to him about that. Um, otherwise, they're Wednesday, Wednesdays um, through August 14th, again, starting on July 10th. Um, on the lawn, weather permitting, um, you know, hoping people will bring their lawn chairs and their dinners and just enjoy a night out. Um, if the weather um, is, is not conducive, we'll have it in the community room instead. Questions from the board? I just, if you said you're pushing it back to 6.30, are your hours, Jesse, 6.30 to 7.30 or 6.30 to 8? 6.30 to 7.30, we occasionally have a band that will go a, a couple of songs over uh, in a set, but typically right still at 7.30. 730. Mm -hmm. But you still want it to start at 6 to have that flexibility? Um, I'm, did I put 6 on the permit? I apologize. No, I, I, I really do want it to start at 6.30. Okay. Just so we say the right thing. Fair enough. Any questions? That was my interest. Motion. No. No. The only right question ahead. I yep. have is when is do we have a schedule for when the um, the sidewalk construction is going to be done? Is that too early? It's we're we're getting quotes um, right now. We're supposed to be presenting to the building commission on April 30th. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a better sense, I think, at that point. There absolutely could be some impacts that we'll have to think Go about the other way. with this. Yeah. Um, but until until we have you know a contractor on board. Um, I'm just going to move forward with this. Yep. Sure, you can go around the other side too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Oh, it's such a great, great uh, contribution to the community. So, love it. Great. Motion. Move to grant an outdoor entertainment permit to the Situate Town Library Director Jesse Finney for Wednesday evenings, July 10th, July 17th, July 24th, August 8th, and August 14th, 2018, from 6:30 to 7:30 p.m. Okay. Can we just um, modify that to 2019? I, that would that might be nice. Sure. <laughs> 2019. I'm just <laughs> reading away. <laughs> Motion by Ms. Curran, seconded by Mr. Harris. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Join us. Um, great, great events. Yeah. Just gonna jump around. Is Jennifer she in here? Uh, let's see. Get back up. Um, McCarthy's. What about McCarthy's? I don't see them here yet. So how about um, <laughs> who wants to go? The black apron. The common vic. Yeah, I was going to say that ba black apron. Lauren, Uncle. Oh, we wants to come early. Why oh, we're so All right. Efficient. Is um, Milano's Pizza here? Yep. All right, gentlemen. All right. Let's go All right. On. Yay! Yeah, you get to up. jump in line. <laughs> okay. So we're actually jumping around here um, to. 740 discussion vote coming. Victor's license for uh, Amba. Is that it? Ambawanas. Yeah. Ambawanas. Ambawanas. Doing That's business it. Milano's P uh, Pizzeria yeah. at 259 Stockbridge Road. And is it um, Magi, Magi Mikhail? Magdi Mikhail. Okay. Good evening. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, My apologies. the first one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know. okay. So you're looking for a common Victor's license to sell food. Is that basically in pizzeria is that what we're looking at yes all right so want to tell us a little bit about it gets a little PR here as well as on some TV yeah wonderful <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. 
Uh, we just want to establish the basement. It's going to be like Italian style pizza. Yeah. Uh, we just like uh, uh, make made like a kind of like a survey about the town, like like you know like personally we keep asking you know like uh, a lot of residents which style they, they love to do it and all of this stuff we work in both like greek pizza, style pizza italian pizza what we figure out that the town ho- over here in the situate yeah i believe you know they, they recommend the, the italian one so we try to like make a mix between the uh, italian style pizza right yeah pizza and sub salads so whoever is gonna come to our shop he's not gonna go anywhere like Subs, pizza, salads, you name it. Do you have tables for sitting down or is it just yes, takeout? Yeah. Yes. Oh, good. Where is it? It's 259 Stockbridge Road. It's where the, uh, where fish, the, fish, where the fish and, and the, the deli was. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Mike's, please. Okay. Yeah. okay. Are you going to occupy the whole building or just half? No, just the portion of the, uh, the building. Okay. The right it used to be, used to be Mike's, yeah, to the left. Oh, All right. Side. Where the seafood was. Well, if you're walking portion. in the door on the right or if you're walking in the door on the left? In the no. left. Um. <laughs> There's the right door. side. That's the lobster <coughs> place. You know, Mike Subs. Yeah, we took to. all that, all this space. Oh, so you're not Mike Subs. You're on the other side with the fish. No, Where Mike Subs. Oh, then Mike Subs. So there yeah. used to be, used yeah, to be used Mike to be Subs. Mike when you're facing the building, it's going to be on the left side of the, the front door. There you go. <laughs> be honest, looking at from the other direction. <laughs> I get <laughs> lost when I get on the left side. Yeah. Yeah. When do you hope to open? If we are lucky, we're going to be like in mid of May. Right. Yeah, we try to open as soon as possible, but good, good. we're just taking our time to make everything matching together, you know, like <coughs> matching with the, uh, the, the, you know, like the way which the residents going to love it. So good. we're not in a rush to do it something like, <laughs> no, no. we're just taking our time, you know, like to make everything it's good to get it planned nice. out and, yeah. and also get prepared because there'll be a lot of people looking for food, <laughs> especially as the w- warmer <laughs> weather comes. Sean? Your hours. What are your hours going to be? The, la- the, the hours, hours. In, uh, the hours yeah. we try to do it in the winter like 10 to 10 but the summertime because you know we close to the water people like uh, stay late if you can like 11 or 12 just like the uh, Friday and Saturday you know because people come into the water people mm-hmm. walk outside yep if you can open like a couple hours late if not that's that's okay yeah. hours on we try to serve as much as we can like in the summertime only we're looking for like extended hour a little bit not for anything but try to like that extend you know the just live there yeah, yeah. you know <laughs> like you know like to make everybody like if they want to enjoy the, the to get something like while they enjoying outside you know nice weather in the summertime so hopefully good excited for you <laughs> um, questions from the board any further questions um, do don't we need to determine the hours of operation so in our motion yep. um, so could you be a little more specific do you it does 10 to 11 p.m. is that your preferred we have to, um, to put our identify your hours of operation hours. when we do this yeah. it did in a way we can do it like from 10 to 12 well that's a resident what, what are the what are the other places around there because that's kind of a residential area isn't yeah. it yeah. behind it it's in the business. What's, uh, is it midnight? Yeah. yeah. Midnight, yeah. yeah. What t- do we know? So it's kind of it's only in the summertime. It's, it's not summer. every all the year, just a couple months in the summer. Yeah. You know, that's when does Riva start to close the pizza? Nine, I think. I'm not up that late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, 12 o'clock, it's going to be pretty quiet around. Uh, in, but but you never know. For, uh, all right. What are the other places <coughs> open? What are the hours of some of the other places? Okay. Um, I think most of the things shut down pretty early in situate, uh, nine o'clock typically. Mm-hmm. I think Maria's is nine. Reeves yeah. is yeah. Um, ten to eleven on Friday and Saturday. Oh, they're open yeah. till eleven. Yeah, I thought Friday and Saturday. Oh. Who is until Reeves Pizza? Ten o'clock Monday to Thursday. All right. So the reason we're saying is this: <laughs> one is to be consistent. Uh, the other is you probably be sitting at the, <laughs> the, the the desk or the uh, countertop or standing at the countertop from 11 to 12 I getting nothing so. so our thought is why don't we try this we'll cre- create an hour for you if it turns out that it's not going to be helpful you can always come back to the board or next year you can ask to increase it no we're not looking to say no it's just uh, we might be doing you a favor by saying <laughs> you can close early and go home and get some sleep um, so what were the hours again no, do they prefer like just <coughs> 10 to 11 on the weekends and 10 to 10 during the week? That might be a good idea. 10 to 10, no 10, to 10, 10, to 10 from the work weekday, Monday through Friday, or 
uh, or maybe Monday, Sunday through Thursday, and then Friday, Saturday, you stay open till 11. Right, but we're trying to open Sunday too. Yeah, yeah, that's why you said. Okay, Sunday. so we can do stay. Yep. All right, so we'll do Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. All right. Sounds good. So why don't we do this? Can somebody make a motion? Move to approve a common vehicular's <laughs> license for Milano's Pizzeria located at 259 Stockbridge Road, situate Massachusetts, 02066 for hours from 10 a.m. until 10 p.m. Monday, Sunday, no, Monday through Thursday, Thursday and from 10 a.m. until 11 p.m. Um, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, okay. pending Board of Health approval. So moved. Motion by Mr. <laughs> Harris, seconded Second. by Ms. Uh, Canfield. Um, uh, discussion. Any questions from the audience at all? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Gentlemen, welcome and good luck, Aye. all right? Aye. 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 We shouldn't discuss these um, nights when we haven't had dinner yet. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you again, gentlemen. All right, so let's move on to a 720 uh, public hearing discussion vote. The application uh, for new seasonal all alcohol license for Driftway Convenience Store located at 48 New Driftway. Joseph Tibbetts. Is Mr. Tibbetts here? Mr. Tibbetts. Yeah. Come on and have a seat. Um, let me just go through here. It's real. What's that? Did you want to I, th I don't know if there are people in the hallway that are here. I don't know. Could you just open that door? Sure. Just if people want to. <laughs> may not. Um, just going to move this over, Mr. Tibbetts, so we have. I'm uh, going to uh, have you talk into the microphone. Okay. Okay. That's what you're talking. So the people at home like to hear you. You're on TV, man. <laughs> All right. Well, good evening, Mr. Tibbetts. And can you close it? So you're here because you're looking to open a convenience store at the. Um, place that's at is it 48 new driftway is that the uh, exact address that you're looking at okay yes sir and in addition to that you're looking for an application for a seasonal liquor which would include liquor beer and wine license is that what we're you're we're looking for yes sir okay um and um is this something that you are actually going to own or is this something that you're looking to sublease and have somebody else come in and, and, and as it stands right now I'll be the owner okay and who would be the manager that's going to be I'll be the manager owner? okay and as the manager of it um, you realize that you're going to be there on a uh, how often quite often well I kind of need to know like what's what's your what's your proposal for They'll being be on there hours a day I have it all written down. If you want copies, I can give you copies afterwards. Sorry for my being late. I was okay. in Boston in a meeting. So we also have um, William Tibbetts, and that's yes. Uh, thank you. This was supposed to start at seven twenty. What time is it? Seven twenty-three. Seven twenty-one. Seven twenty-one. What time did we start? How long have you been up here? Dad? I have seven twenty-three, and that's why I started at seven twenty, Mr. Tibbetts. Okay. So we're we're actually starting at the time okay. that's uh, approved. Thank um, you. Um, and good, how are you? So, what are what are aside from Mr. the Harris. hours? Ms. Canfield, Mr. Downing, how are you? I am good, Mr. Tibbetts. Um, aside from the hours, so what what what's your what's your proposal for the time? Ten hours a day? Is that what you're you're proposing? I'm trying to get a sense. No, I'd I'd say from seven in the morning till ten at night. All right. And maybe six in the morning, you know, depending on what the traffic justifies. Okay. Um, all this is pretty fluid, too, as we get into it. We'll be having different schedules. Well, that's kind of what we're kind of trying to figure out now, because I'm trying to figure out well, what, what your timing of your average. How long is he there every day? Okay. So I, I guess my question, Mr. Then William Tibbetts, are you the gentleman who's actually presenting this? No, is I'm it going to be you, or is it your father who's actually? Okay. So let's, let's just back up a second, because my understanding it's your father who's presenting this and not you and I'm just trying to get some answers here all right because two questions specifically so mr. Joseph Tibbetts what I'd like to know is what are the hours that you're proposing to be open for the convenience store right now it would be 7 to 10 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. okay 
And is that seven days a week that you're looking yes. to do, sir? And what are you proposing for um, your, your timing that you said as the manager? Because the manager has to be on the premises a majority of those hours. Uh, and we'll uh, charge in on that. Uh, Mr. Joseph Tibbetts, do you have... Do you have in town. We'll Mr. In Mr. William Tibbetts, I'm asking you a question, please. Okay, I'll get you... you I will... Mr. Tibbetts, okay. <laughs> this is, let, let's get let's get the ground rules understood. Give and take in this situation, sir. I'm asking you to listen for one minute, Mr. Tibbetts, okay. This is a give and take. Yes, it is. It's a question and answer, and I will give you ample opportunity to ask questions. And if you need to take a statement, fair enough. I'll give you that opportunity. But we can't talk over each other, okay? So you ask the question. Just go and then we go back and forth. It doesn't. It, there's no like dialogue. So what happens is this board asks questions. Okay, not just me. It's all five members here, and we're going to ask questions. And once we got our answers, then if you have some observations or statements you want to make, you're free to do it. And I'm going to open it up to the audience. Sure. And at that time, I'm going to say to the audience, do you have questions? And then we're going to ask those questions if we think and deem that they're necessary or appropriate. Then we're going to ask you folks. Right now, I'm asking your father because he's the one who did the application, okay? And I understand that you want to assist him and help him. I have no problems with that. Okay, don't but treat me like a child. You Ask can't him interrupt questions. me. No, Ask you can't. Questions. Mr. Tibbetts, you now. cannot interrupt me because I'm the time. chairman. The questions. I can easily bring this to a vote, Mr. Tibbetts, quickly, and it will be very quickly and summarily. And I don't think you're going to like that if you're going to keep interrupting us <laughs> because you're, you're interrupting this process. And if you interrupt the process, you're out. Okay, so do we have ground rules under, do you understand the ground rules here? Do you? Yes. Mr. Joseph Tibbetts. Yes, sir. I'd like to get back to the question about your time that you're planning on being in the store as a manager for this license. Again, I'll be I understand the hours that you have. I just need to know what you're, you're proposing, sir. Seven to 10. I'm sorry, maybe I misunderstood. When you're going to be there, I know the store is going to be open from 7 to 10. That's what you're proposing. Okay. And I'm asking you as the manager, the you need twice. to understand. Said 7 to 10 twice. Would you? Yeah, and the, the reason I'm asking Mr. Joseph Tibbetts is because I know that you can't be there seven days a week, 7 to 10. So I'm trying to get a sense of I what you're operating that. are going to be. That's all. <clears throat> well, my intent is to organize the facility to the point where I don't have to be there 24-7. Okay. And uh, th that's where uh, management skills would be uh, of a premium. And uh, so 7 to 10, and if I have to be there, I'll be there. I only li I live three exactly three miles from there. Okay. What are you proposing for your time for the, li the liquor license, shall we say? If you're to be granted it, what are you well, seeking for the time? I on it? Candidly, I don't know that if, if there are limits as to when you can be open for liquor, but uh, because I'm willing to do, you know, whatever. It's, I, the, uh, you know, it's, I don't know what the, what the limits are. Okay. But, so uh, may I interject, please? He's I just did, seasonal so liquor please. license goes from April, starts April 1st, as far as, I'm, as far as my research, and then it goes for eight months out of the year. It, 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 am I wrong? Yes. Yeah, you are, actually, okay. but can it I, can, can go, it is, a maybe? seasonal license is, can be determined by this board to be anything as long as April 1st until January 15th. That's, the, that's as long as we can grant it. We can also shorten it, too. Okay. The well, board has the discretion to do is, that. Is, is we'd like a, a full, full year. We, we took a big hit with this whole Cumberland Farms deal that everyone knows about. And um, we're trying to make things right here. And um, collect our losses and open a business there. Which I think that in the first place was what the Village Business Overlay District was all about. Bringing um, assets to the community. And I think the Cumberland Farms was still a really good deal. And I'm, I'm really disappointed still in that. And um, we just would like to open a liquor store now with the convenience a country feeling to it. Um, we got a nice spot. We got a nice location. I don't think there's too much competition in the town. We'll be hurting anybody specifically. Um, I understand you didn't want the gas station there, but I mean, the entranceway to um, 
Um, you, you mentioned about the entrance way to uh, situate, um, not wanting it to be a gas station. Like I said before, you know, it's a dilapidated medical building. It's a, a Dunkin' Donuts, a, a, a dump, a doggy daycares, the animal hospital, a train station, um, a construction yard. Um, you know, I mean, there's not this. This would be an asset to your community. I believe, sir. I just want to state, make something that's crystal clear. This board had nothing to do with whatever happened on that property I've moved with, on Com that, uh, with uh, Cumberland Farm. I just, want to, I just want to make sure just you keep raising it. This board had nothing to do with it. I don't even know what was filed. So let's keep that out of the equation, okay? okay. I mean, if you didn't know what was going on, you're the head selectman. That's sad. Mr. Tibbetts, this is not going to be a, shall we say, backslap to the board coming in here and saying these things that are ac absolutely unfounded and that are fake, it. okay? So Don't get off that, okay? You're here up. for a convenience store right now. Yep. You're not here for Cumberland Farm or some gas station issue that you raise, right. okay? Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Chairman, the, the liquor hours in Massachusetts are 8 to 11 Monday through Saturday. 10 to 11 on Sunday. Mm -hmm. That's what we'd like. May I, may I make a statement, Mr. Chairman? One second, so that you understand. This is not a year-round license, though. It, it is only a seasonal. Right. That's, that's fine. So that's I want to make sure we understand. Yes, okay. sir. Thank you for considering it. That was, that yeah, was my point. We, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I, the only thing I would add to that is the reason that you can't come before us for a whole year license is because there are none available. Um, there's a finite amount that the town's allowed by the, um, you know, that we have no control over, I believe, that it's set, and they're already full. I don't want any favors. I just want to be treated fairly. Well, it, we, we couldn't grant it if we wanted to. That's, that's all they're right. just not. I'm and the not reason that they aren't, there aren't available is because the state feels that the town is fully, um, mm -hmm. has enough liquor stores. So I just want to be clear on, on that. Yeah, yeah, based on the population. <coughs> yeah, we. Um, Would you? I guess one question I want to ask <coughs> Mr. William Tibbetts is what is your proposal, uh, your involvement in this convenience store? I'm 50% landowner of the property, I'm the um, landlord. So are you actually going to be working in the store? No. Will you be involved in any way of the management of the store? No. I'm only here for my father's or support my father, my family. Um, questions from the board at this point? I've got a few more, but I didn't know if anybody wanted to. Um, I have a question. I'm just confused. Is the uh, convenience store already approved and no, it's good second. to go? Where are you with your plans with regards to that? There's, I think at 7.30, um, there's a meeting about the vehicular license, vehicular license. <laughs> I, I think it maybe went back, got backwards. Well, it says um, right I, I, 720. Yep, you're right. It's right afterwards. And right after right. That, so. All right. So these plans that are included, are they already underway? Or has um, Yeah, we've filed all the um, paperwork, everything. Right. We've had our lawyer. Paid a $200 fee to the state. You know, we've been working at this for about six months, so, I mean, everything's been in order. There's nothing that, as far as I can tell, that we didn't do. We have the site plan mm -hmm. um, for the planning board, which is tomorrow night, supposedly. So that's um, tomorrow night? Okay. I that's think so. Question, no, we have a meeting with the planning board staff tomorrow. Okay. To go over which site plan needs to be filed. Okay. And then they'll have to file with the planning board for site plan, but it is an approved use in that zone. So it is or yeah, is we'll not speak for the planning board, but it's just it's a process they have to go through. But there shouldn't be any impediment to the planning board approving it because it is an approved use. But they have to go through the site plan process. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so to not to mix the two conversations, but they're related. Is if if you aren't granted the alcohol license, will you still be um, opening be, going forward with doing your convenience store? Right. I didn't. I told you I didn't know the hours that were allowed, and now that we're in, I've been enlightened, you know, we're happy to go. You know, that with those hours. She's talking about right. No, but if you if you're not allowed to sell alcohol, will you still want to operate a convenience store on that site and go forward with the planning? Yes. Okay. Thank you. 
I will read it. I bought the property with the intent to uh, lease, uh, to, to do a land lease with uh, Cumberland Farms. Mm -hmm. uh, they came before the planning board and uh, uh, were, uh, they, did, they discouraged themselves, I guess, because they, they didn't want to put gas tanks behind the store as opposed to uh, in front of the store, the, the conventional situation. And uh, they backed out, they withdrew from the plan. So now uh, I'm in a position where I have uh, quite a bit of money out. Uh, I owe quite a bit of money from the purchase of it. And uh, I have to do some way to, to pay the mortgage. And uh, the, the most, uh, <coughs> I have a, 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 a real estate firm that's uh, commercial, trying to uh, do some uh, a leasing out of the existing space. We've cleaned up the building and uh, cleaned up the site, mm -hmm. and uh, th that's this the uh, we're in a position where we're going to option one is to open up the stores and, and generate the, the, the income that way. And uh, option two is to, uh, which we just, it's in the planning stages, is to uh, develop the real estate by tearing down the building and putting in, uh, uh, a retail and residential. There's a, I think there's an acre and a half there to do it. But uh, that's further down the road, so we you can't if you can't be paying interest in taxes and insurance and not have any income so okay. that's what that's the plan that's why we're here and uh, any whatever it is uh, I'm there to, here to cooperate so that I can go forward John well I think I know the answer to this but I'll just ask it and then you know um, I don't think you've been in this business before so our, our concern is with all our children and everything is liquor and how yeah. serious that is and yeah. tips certified and I don't know much about it but there's a whole courses that not only you'd have to take everyone in the store that might be behind the register is going to have to take have you taken any steps Joe to educate yourself on all that stuff on the whole liquor not sales? to this point no I will uh, you know if if there's a <coughs> if that's a concern, I'll, t uh, that's I'll, wor I'll work with somebody to, to, to get the educate myself and uh, my workers. If you look back at the past few years, if well, there's been violations or there's been people going, you know, uh, Sand Hills went from seasonal to, to year round, I think Tony said it the clearest, and he, he just said it loud and clear that if there are violations, then the penalties will be severe. I mean, the, between us, we probably have ch 20 children, and <laughs> all the kids in this town are our children, so we don't want to hear any accidents, any problems whatsoever. And it's uh, just, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult business. So. Yeah, I've been here, uh, just to, you know, give my background, I've been here since 1953. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Van Eidestein, uh Mr. Vogel, uh, Mr. Faria, I'm close, or not close, but well acquainted with all of them. Uh, and Neil Duggan, also uh, coach Little League at the same time, things like that. So, John, it is a requirement about liquor policies that he would have to get certified in one of those within three months. So he could open and then get certified after Jim? Policy says within three months of taking the position. Okay. Of taking the position. And we'd have to have a liability insurance, I'm sure. So that, that all goes along. One of the things I noticed, um, I'm just trying to get up to, many of the stores have adopted a system where they check the IDs. Yeah. And have you explored anything along that, Mr. Tibbetts, as to, to doing that? Do you intend to do that? I would and intend I to do that. Of, the reason I say it is because of fake IDs as yeah. well as trying to avoid young, younger okay. teenagers from doing it. I just didn't know if, if you've seen or, or have seen no, that that's, before. No, that's something that we work on. I'm 
happy to work. That is also a requirement as a new establishment. You can meet with Anne-Marie, uh, and Anne-Marie can tell him what the different types of machines are that, uh, that she's seen that have a good reputation and seem to work. But that is another requirement. The class, I asked Anne-Marie, the class only takes a day or so, so mm -hmm. we can get it done fairly quickly, even before he gets up and running. Are they run them often? Um, they run them often in different sites. We have one upcoming in situate next week. So, Tony? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you my two cents. You know, I think, one, it's a commercially zoned area, you know, and I think a convenience store would be great there. Um, it's going to be a developed area. There's stuff going across the street. You know, that's going to, the, the whole property in the, in the um, MBTA parking lot is going to be, you know, turning that area around as well. The big thing with me is um, whether a seasonal liquor license is appropriate for the space or not. I think if we did have a full-time a full-time liquor license then that would be another story as far as I'm concerned I I really have to decide whether this is really a seasonal situation because I view it as a little bit differently and I've, I've had come so, sir. I'll tell you in a minute um, but in terms of that property being used for a commercial um, area and being a convenience store I support it 100% um, uh, you know well, if, the bait, if the bait store had stayed they could have bought their beer and their bait. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get it's your property. You can do whatever you want with it. So, yeah, um, Maybe, yeah. yeah I, I guess my my question is more: What do you what are you trying to do with the property? Is it a you know are you using the full building? Is it going to be food? Is it going to be is it going to be like a Seven Eleven? Are you really emphasizing the, the liquor? Goal. Are you are you really emphasizing the food aspect of it? Um, you know, what are your ideas for the space? I think I'd probably get a lot of customers if I gave them a free coffee <laughs> and get started. But uh, the Your business too long, would you? Yeah. No, well, no that's good. you bring them in the door. They're going to spend something. Right. Uh, the uh, the long term goal would be to uh, develop, re enhance the the site, uh, and. Uh, but I don't have a specific plan yet. And, uh, and so that's kind of what you come before us and you want us to give you a license and we really want to, you know, I saw your sketch there, but I, I, you know, we really have to see if that's the best fit for the area. Can if I that's answer a, this question? No. Am I fit to answer this question as his son? Because we've been talking about this. For Mr. Tibbetts, if you can just, if you can just, Mr. Yeah, Tibbetts, yes, Mr. Tibbetts, you interrupted me at town meeting. Well, I was on a roll then. I'm on a roll now. <laughs> so, quiet. So let me just finish what I'm saying, and then you can talk whatever you want. You're just making the process more difficult. No, you are. <laughs> Really? You really, if you just let me go through the process instead of all this stuff, you're going to have a chance to talk well, and ask questions. You're saying that he doesn't have this thing like designed out to right, so, key, so I, that's a problem. That's not a problem. Wait a second. Wait a second it's all a second. process. Wait a second. Life is a process. Hey, Billy. If you want my vote, is yes. Ask him to have like where the chip racks are going to be tonight. Get out of here with that. John? John, if, if you would, if, if you listen to our these hearings before, Billy. I have. All right. They are so specific on, mm -hmm. you know, for restaurants, for example, how many seats there will be, or Tedeschi's in North Situate, what coolers are you going to use for beer and wine? It really is pretty important to this board to know is it going to be like, uh, are you going to be like Curtis Liquors up on 3A and, and have 99% alcohol and maybe a couple of, you know, chips or something on your way out? I think that's what Tony's asking. Or is it going to be like Charlie Reynolds and, and have, you know, 50 50 percent a family store as well as you know liquor i think that's where tony's going but it is very specific here you go i, I do i think i have that picture in, in, in the, the packet, packet. I don't know. I mean, oh maybe not did. we we did but you know what we'll, we'll take, take it anyways it, yeah. if that's yeah. all right so i can the board can see it handy right in front of thanks us. Joe. thank you sure thank you so but, oh yeah yeah, that yeah. Was yeah i have this <laughs> so basically if, we, if, if I could create a 7-Eleven or a Cumberland Farms tomorrow, that's what I would do. That was my plan. Uh, and it didn't happen. So right. now I've got a, piece, a nice piece of real estate, a building that we've uh, cleaned up. We have a, a, it's just like a roller coaster trying to police out the space. 
Because of the planning board. Well, no, it's not the planning board. Yes, it is, Dad. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you. So we have to decide, and, and you know, I, I, I have no problem with the vehicle license. I think put a store there, do great. I have to, I'm questioning whether the liquor license is, is a component of it. And you said earlier, it doesn't, not that it doesn't matter, but you're going to open a store regardless of whether you get the liquor license or not. Right. So we want the liquor license. Like yeah, no, I understand that. And, uh, and we're happy to do whatever uh, you request is with right. control. So how, ha how do you seat, see, have a seat. Don't, yeah. that's okay. how do you see this <laughs> being kind of a, I felt like it was you a, feel like a lawyer, you're in the middle of the argument, that's okay, Mason. <laughs> that's, you had a pay, <laughs> Perry Mason moment, uh, but thank you. Explain the seasonality to me, why you think your, your store is appropriate for a seasonal liquor license. Oh, because it's, when the people are coming into town, like uh, as Burbine said, it's the, uh, the entryway to situate. And uh, you're, gonna, you're driving home, you want to stop for a cold one, or a, you're thinking to yourself, I'm going to, I'm almost home, I can pick up a six pack and go home and watch the hockey game. You know? Yeah, but again, the seasonality aspect of it, because these licenses are specific for, you know, in, in the town of Situate, right. our population almost doubles during the summer. Yeah. And that's kind of, I think, the thought press in my head why we would use a seasonal license for an for a place that is, you know, greatly impacted for that. And there's a need, you know, there's an increase there's in need. There's 100,000 people here in the summer, and there's only 10,000 people. You know, what, here. I'm going to ask to postpone it if, if I keep getting interrupted. We'll, t we'll talk about it in two I'm weeks. Part of this. I told you I'm his counsel. I'm not his counsel. How am I not his counsel? I'm his son. Mr. Years. Tibbetts, Mr. Tibbetts, the um, the point is that when we're all having conversation, we need to take turns because otherwise, Thank you we're not going to get very far. Yeah, well, why don't you answer me then, if, okay. if you're as counsel? Yeah. Why do you see this as a seasonal situation? Because we have a hundred thousand people here. In the we don't have a hundred thousand. Yes, we do. There have been studies that there are harbors flooded to a hundred thousand people on Heritage Days, on these hall on St. Patty's Day. On um, Christmas, on all these holidays, this is a family place. People come down here with their families. There's tons of people around here. I spent a year fixing up that building, watching all the traffic go by my building. There's way, way more people now with the train. There's way, way more people moving from out of country. There's way, way more people here than there was eight years ago. Okay? Explain so to me the seasonality component of it. The people I don't that all keep their boats, the people that come back from Florida, they're all back here. So you have to convince me that you're a no, seat. No, I don't. If you want my vote to be, <laughs> if you want my vote, no, yes, you do. No, I don't have to convince you. Billy, Billy, really shut the is, fuck is, up. This is crazy. The, the questions you're asking. You, you need us to vote yes to give you this license, and you're doing everything you can to make it not happen. Because there's understand. more people here in the summertime. That's why we want it seasonally. And That's why is your establishment, I can understand an establishment being in Hummer Rock saying, okay, there's a seasonal is population. No the town Just let me building. finish my thought. Right? There's more people there. It's it, it the population triples in time. There's no liquor stores, and there's one in this, and there's a need for it in the summer. That's my idea of what a seasonal establishment is. You're in Greenbush. You're in an area that is not really affected seasonally. And I want to get. I want you to convince me why I should vote yes to give you a seasonal license. Okay, because people come down to the beaches, and that rotary, and that train station, and that light is jam-packed with people. And it'd be nice to take a little breather off and pull into a station. People are coming to my building for the past year, and like hanging out in my parking lot and talking on the phone. It's a perfect spot for people in the community to stop and take a breather, and do something, and grab a pack of gum, and to get a beer, or whatever else. There's 100,000 people in some, some weekends here. There's 50,000 people in the summer some weekends. There's 20,000 people down here now. And there's only how many liquor stores? Who's competing is with who around here? We're maxed out so with the number of liquor, li liquor yeah. stores that we can have in town. We have absolutely as how many as we can have. How many convenience stores do we have in town? Not enough. May I? So the convenience goes with the liquor. No, it doesn't. Not always. No, May it doesn't, but it really does in this world. If you can get beers and a scratch ticket or and a pack of cigarettes or and a candy bar, you're going to do that. Or end in some shopping or something. Mr. Tibbetts, you may be right. I'm sorry. I'd like to let you know this. You can't prevent people from doing stuff. Mr. Tibbetts, you may be absolutely right about whether we should it. have it or not. 
but we are governed by the state's mandate of what we are allowed to have as far as liquor licenses. So just because we think it's a good idea, unfortunately, we don't get yeah, to do that. Yeah, that's why we're going for seasonal, not fall year. Right. Well, well we're going for seasonal because that's like what's available. And that's what you told us to when you when you knocked the Cumberland Farms down. I mean, it, 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 if, office, if, and they said, hey, why don't you go for this? This is what we're going to help you do. And now here we're doing it, and you're not helping us do it. This is insane. So the example of a seasonal that I think Mr. Vignani is suggesting, or Tony, you'll correct me, I know, um, would be like Sand Hills General Store, okay? Yeah. Because it was a general store seasonally because all the residents come down there in a very, during the summer. And so we actually did grant a seasonal liquor license, not liquor, beer and wine license. So right. They don't have liquor. They only have beer and right. wine. And then ultimately they had it for a few years. They performed. Uh, they did <coughs> exemplary. They actually are the gold standard for a lot of the monitoring um, and so um, they then applied for year-round when it opened up because one right. of the other stores had closed and so that's why they have it but they started out the seasonal because they were a seasonal location it was uh, and I see what and you it was well, they, se seasonal was what was available right. uh, the, a, a perfect example of a seasonal uh, in the traditional mode would be uh, the, the little place across the, st the river down in Hummer Rock yep I, I don't know, I, Voyager or the something? Voyage right now. Voyage. Yeah, used to be the... Uh, that would be, Cap that Cap would, Cap. in my mind, be a, a, a perfect so seasonal. Uh, we're not, we're going to, we're applying for a seasonal because that's all that's available. And we would hope to follow in the footsteps of the people at Sand Hills and you know, perform well enough that you would feel it was safe or... or uh, a good idea to let us have the next available license. That, that's why we're applying for a seasonal. And I, I don't, know, I don't think that there's any. And we're not trying to say we will. We, 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 the point that one's on Turner Road and one's on Driftway just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's a seasonal community. It's a seasonal I, I, town. Look at that. It makes, it's 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 right on the North Would River. You just, How's that? I'm gonna. I'll be kidding. Kidding. It's Mister. Sand Hills Beach or the North River. Take your pick. I, there's people putting boats in there. There's a ramp down by my house in, on Jericho. Bill, I'm going to be candid with you. The issue I have is if you're involved in this business, uh -huh. because you know what, that's that's the big, huge ten thousand, five thousand. That's the elephant really. in the room. I you got it, it man. And you that's the like, concern because you I don't. You're it. not listening right now. No, no, no. And that question is, what's going to happen with the management the of the store if some kid comes in there? Our biggest concern is the sale to minors. Okay, well, breaking I'll give those you laws. My guarantee and I would love. Will, hold on, let me just finish. I would love for the fact that that never happens there. If you get it, I, that's that's all I care about. But the concern I have is if something happens, because that's the concern I have with Tedeschi's. That's the concern I've had down at the Central Market. I'm worried market. about getting hit by a car when I walk out in the parking lot too. I mean, what are we talking about? We're trying to make a living here. That's it. Uh, yeah, because this give is us a regulated. chance. I mean, what you, you take a risk? You know, waking up in the morning. So give us and I have to say the now. other problem is <laughs> trying to advocate for your dad. Your best thing would be to let your dad talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> be honest with you. Yeah. I, I, the best thing is to let him I talk. I would be honest. No, but I'm telling Mike. you right now because I'm really prepared like to I vote said, right I now. The more you talk, advice. the more I'm willing to take that vote I right now. I need to be your advice, sir. I'm not giving you advice, but I'm just telling you that you're hurting your dad's case to getting an application or I a license for. I don't believe we'd be here and being taken seriously if I wasn't here. Mr. Chairman, are you ready That's for comments debatable. from the board? That's going to be very debatable. We'll let the woman debate you any day. I'd like, may I just, um, you shut I'd up. just like Mr. Yeah. Tibbetts, Joe Tibbetts, I'd like to just state my position. I think there's a lot of work and research that you need to conduct um, before you're provided an alcohol license, whether it be seasonal or permanent. So I would love to see you get your business. What are you staring uh, at, Mr. Tibbetts? Uh, what do you want? Well, you want to get in a staring contest? I'm talking to Mr. Tibbetts. I know, but Judge I'm just telling you, no, I'm the chair here, <laughs> and I'm running the meeting. And you know what? If this is what it's turning into, intimidation, cut it out. Because otherwise, out the door you go. And I'm not talking about your dad, because he's been a gentleman and he's been respectful. You haven't. Cut it out. Go ahead. So I would love to see you be successful with the business starting off as a convenience store get your feet on the ground and see how that goes before I could support a liquor license in that location today. Okay. So I think there's a lot, I think there's a lot to it and a lot of responsibility that comes with it um, and information that neither of you really have handy this evening, 
Um, so well, I just specifically, ma'am, please just tell us all, what all, specifically do you want? I understand all all the questions that we were what at other board members asked. Everything. They didn't say anything was in uh, um, the word uh, invalid. They didn't say anything wasn't appropriate. Everything checked right. out on that. They are all <laughs> things that you still need to pursue and discover and what? get There's licenses and training. No, that's three months. They had a three months grace period. Sure. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. Said. You're absolutely right. Yes. Yeah, so their application right. is in order. Your, your, your application is in order. <coughs> I personally, in order to approve your alcohol application, would like to see a little bit more knowledge and also see... More knowledge? Yes, with regards to the How alcohol... You see knowledge? So, Mr. Joseph Tibbetts, I would love to see you get your business up and running, and I have no problem approving the vehicular license, um, but I know we haven't taken a vote yet, but I'm not ready to approve a liquor license this evening. So that's uh, where I stand. I understand. Thank you. Let me go. Sure. Um, I agree. I, I, I thank you for your, um, your um, characterization of why you went for the seasonal. I understand it. That makes sense from a business perspective to get the seasonal, get it up and running, and then, you know, wait, wait in line, basically. Yeah. Um, my concerns are, and I agree with um, Ms. Curran, that um, I think that's a great location for a convenience store, and I, I think that um, you'll do well with all of, as your son said, all the traffic that was there, and that's great. Um, I am also very concerned that... Um, you know, we've, I haven't been on the board as long as the rest of the members, but I've been here long enough to have several people come in who have, um, have run afoul of the regulations and the rules. They've, you know, either sold to minors or you know, whatever the infraction was, and they've come before the board. And, you know, it's, it's a very serious thing um, because, as the board has said, it affects everyone. So uh, I know you have an opportunity to learn those things. I'm not comfortable granting a license with the... the the um, the not having a, a really good grasp of what the rules and regulations are, and the third point that I have is, um, I really feel that since we are at the max for the number of permanent licenses, which is really more appropriate for your your site, um, I would rather, as more as Ms. Curran said, is is you to get your feet on, you know, learn those things that need to be responsible alcohol. Um, seller and then and then maybe revisit it down the road but um, those are my concerns right now okay so that's a no <laughs> we haven't had a vote yet sir I don't know, I don't know. is that a no from you too we'll have a vote when we're all done with our comments and the and the public has had a chance to comment too In, okay wait for that. I came here tonight you know giving this a lot of thought I said, you know, paying taxes on the property, it's expensive piece of property. You have every right to do it. It's within the dis business district. And uh, you guys have been in town for a long time. And I said, you know, probably see what happens. But Billy, you're getting all wound up, and this is nothing. This is nothing to the pressures of selling alcohol. Hold on, Dave. Oh, Dave, hang on, Billy. Hang on. I'm talking. All right. Um, people behind you know what this is all about. They know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. All right. There's a. People think I've seen it before. They get a beer and wine license or a liquor license, and they think they're going to make a million dollars. I don't know a lot about the business. I just know there's a lot of liability that goes along with it. I'm trying to keep an open mind, but your dad said it earlier that he wouldn't mind a convenience store to start out with. The season, this this license isn't going to go anywhere. There's nobody knocking on our door. You know, I, I, if you want to know how I'm going to vote, I'd say we hang on to the the liquor license. The one grant granted you grant the common vic. If you don't like our decision you can appeal it to the ABCC no, I, I sat I sat I, I sat on this board sat, this, sat on this board when we denied one in the harbor and they appealed it and they got it so I just think I just think it's a real learning experience I, I just think it's a, a business that you need to get your feet wet first and see what it's like I don't think I'd take it on that's <laughs> yeah. okay well so I, you know, I'm not, 
know. Like I said, I, I, don't, I don't see myself granting this license to anyone else. And the seasonal thing, I, 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 I agree with you. I, I do agree with you. It's, you know, I, I know what Tony's saying. It would be perfect in Humrock, you know, where this population triples or quadruples. But I know, I, 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 I see what you're saying. I think the population on the east side of the rotary doubles, all right, in the summer. So I, 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 I'd give you the seasonal without, I, I understand that. So what's the problem? I just think, you, I just. Mine, we're going to sell to miners? That's nuts. You and your dad. You're afraid we're going to sell to miners? That's why you deny on our license? Yeah. Without ever sounding to a minor, it's totally insane. But not fair. But no, no, it's it's it has to do with experience. It's fine. Yeah, I'm okay, just saying. We don't have experience like checking an ID. It's a bouncer. I was a bouncer in Quincy. Check it out. I just, 2007. Just, just, just start. Just start. I haven't been able to get a job. Good job since then. And now I finally got something going, and you won't <coughs> let me have a liquor license? I just, you're denying that's, my gas that's station? The way, that's the way. Treat us Billy, like hang on a second. We had nothing to do with the well, gas station. Well, nothing to do with it. For this well, is crazy. then there'd be a conflict of interest, we Billy. We, uh... You, set up. you can go. I don't see Mr. Joseph Tibbetts, another thought <clears throat> to think about. Um, if, you know, you go forward to the convenience store, what I might suggest is to consider, instead of going for the seasonal from... April until January. Do it for a limited time period from say June till October or November. Just try it for a year or two, see how it goes. And then we did that with uh, Sand Hills because we weren't too sure how they were going to set it up. I think it was one year they came back, operation was running and we said okay at that point we expanded it to max. They came back and they said you know we're doing well, we've been doing things. I think that would be a, an attempt to show and demonstrate that yes you got the convenience and you're looking at maybe uh, and going from that standpoint. Um, I am not going to be sitting on the board at that time, <laughs> but I just want to at least give you an idea that that's a thought process to try to demonstrate to the board, the future board, that yes, you know, you got the convenience and yes, um, uh, the, the, the seasonal. I, when I heard you say it's seasonal, that's why we're doing it, I agree with you. That's kind of how I would do it. I know Tony's saying, well, it's not in a seasonal area. Um, I see the value of it because it's on the driftway and you get a lot of traffic there. Um, and I can see how people during the summer is going to be using it to get food, maybe get some you know, beverages and then head down to their boats or something. I, I get that. But um, at this point, I'm just a suggestion you might think about approaching it that way. Well, why, don't I, why don't I withdraw the application for the seasonal? And uh, that way, I'm not. Yeah. I haven't been denied. That's a good. No, that's, <laughs> a, that's actually a very wise. Really good. And, yeah. uh, <coughs> can we get the uh, Vitchell's license? And, uh, What's up next? Uh, that's coming yeah. up next. So I then I think officially um, we will need from you just in writing to with, that you're withdrawing, or I guess verbally you're, that you're verbally withdrawing the application for yes. the yes. Uh, seasonal liquor license. Okay. It's on the record. It's on the record. Okay. Okay. Um, hold on one second. We'll get to the Victor license. How about that? Um, <coughs> I think we've pretty much discussed the store, and I don't think anybody has any questions on that. Or anybody on the questions up here? Um, we would just need hours for this as well. I think what you're suggesting. I think said seven to ten, though. I think is what he was saying. Is what you said? Okay. Monday through uh, uh, Monday. seven days a week, right, and Mr. Tibbetts? And it still needs to be approved by the planning board. Is that what you said earlier? Yeah. I'm going to meet with them tomorrow morning at uh, 11 o'clock. Okay. Okay. So we would have to do pending approval of the planning board? Would that I, be? I think yeah. selling bait, selling auto parts, in my book, it's like selling, if you're selling sandwiches or candy bars or <laughs> food stock. Granted, you know, it's a little different, but it's the same use in my mind. So I don't see that being a problem for you. Um, so, seven to seven to ten, seven a.m. to ten p.m., uh, seven days a week, and um, pending, I guess, site plan approval, which I can't imagine being an issue. All right. Yeah. So, is there a motion? Um, or actually, strike that. You have a motion. I'm sorry. Yeah. I just want to make sure you include everything. Yeah. Right. I'm gonna. But before I do, are there questions from the audience? We also have pending with health approval of workers' compensation. Insurance. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Is there a motion? Move to approve Move to common it. vehicular's license for Driftway Convenience Store located at 48 New Driftway, Situate, Mass. 02066 um, um, for hours. operating hours of 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. seven days a week, pending uh, Board of Health approval uh, and a copy of the workers' comp compensation and pending um, planning board approval. 
Second. Second. Uh, no, Was so moved. So motion moved. By Mr. Harris, <laughs> seconded by Ms. Curran. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, Mr. Tibbetts, thank you very much, um, and uh, we wish you well. I need that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, so it takes the 7.30 off. Now we're moving on to um, a discussion, new catering service. The black apron is Lauren. Rank call. Uh, Hi there. Come on down. She just popped up. You don't mind? <laughs> I'm running just a few minutes late here. Not too bad. Thank you. Did I skip something? Mm, I don't think so. No. Okay. No, because we we did the pizza already. All right. So. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so you're looking for um, uh, catering to be on the catering list. Correct. And uh, let's get to the site here. Um, it's uh, what page is that? Sorry, we jumped around a little because we were running certified, ahead. so yes. that's important. Okay. Again, as you know, that's that's okay. The most important <laughs> thing that we're concerned about. Um, <coughs> and we've never had knock on wood. I don't think any issues, so that's no. good. And I don't see any that you have, so that's good. <laughs> All right. Questions from the board. <coughs> and, and with you is. This is just a more support. We <laughs> <laughs> work together all the time. I'm giving you five five minutes of. She came in late. Well. Just just sure. Let me get in there. You're yeah. welcome We're to come. Right? No. Yeah, actually, that would have a nice uh, uh, referral here from Jen. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm very familiar with so. Good. She's great. That, yeah. Yeah. So I have no questions. Yeah, can you have? just give a little bit? What are you What are you doing? Give a little overview of yeah. your experience and what you're doing. Sure. So I've been in the business for ever and a day. Been in restaurants and doing <coughs> private parties as well. And I work for the hospitable hostess as the number one person for the last few years. And so when Jen decided to close her doors, I decided to open mine. And so I always say we let the guests be a uh, we let the host be a guest at their own party. So, so, enjoy. so yes. we go in and we do all the setup, the serving, the cleanup, and they get to enjoy their guests. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> explain the liquor component of it. Yeah. So if there's a bartender there, they have to be tip certified, and, and they you just provide them. Correct. So I do service and bartenders. Okay. They're all tip certified, and they do that separately. So that's on the. But you certify that they are before they correct. come and work for you. Correct. Absolutely. Right. Yes. And you're tip certified. Yes. And yeah. are you at who's at the events? Is there always like a manager at, at the event that is? There's always, always a lead person at the event, and they're always tip certified. Okay. Great. I've used you, so I know, but I just. I was going to say, I thought, <laughs> I thought it was you. <laughs> <laughs> and where are you going to be operating out of your kitchen? And no, we don't do any of the okay. catering end of it. We just do we the work serving. With <laughs> oh, so you're the you're the coordinator. <laughs> 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 We're gonna have to separate. I know. Two. Sorry. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> okay. So we just do that. We do, we don't do any of that. End. Okay. Right. Any other questions? No. I was just going to say, how long did you work for um, Jen? Yeah, for Jen. For a, a little over three years. So three years. So you've you're familiar with the area. I was her lead person. So right. yes. And where are you are you working out of an establishment? Do you have a, a just out of my home. Okay. Yes. Great. Good. Motion. Motion, please. Move to approve the Black Apron as a caterer for our recommended caterer list as provided on the Town of Situate website. Motion second. by Ms. Curran, seconded by Mr. Harris. Um, any questions from the audience? Say none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Ladies, Yay. thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on to the uh, 8 o'clock <laughs> discussion vote, Thanks Irish you. Book Collection, Citrate Town uh, Library and Monument on Easter Rising with is. John Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, how are you? We're running a little Hi, bit behind, so yeah. apologize. No, 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 that's uh, fine. Not too that's bad fine. for us, really. <laughs> Can I hear for one quick second? Yeah. I just got a text that the Bruins are winning 2 nothing. For excellence. I'm, I'm pretty sure our town administrator yeah, could have told us. Yeah. up to date here. Are you watching the game? Slacking I'm like, over there. Oh, he's not. The he's text so was gross. from Jim. The text was from me. <laughs> <laughs> 
I didn't want to throw him under the bus. <laughs> I'd be good over here. Six o'clock. What period? What is it? Two one. Two one after two nothing after one. Two nothing. Yes. Sorry, John. The, the Bruins. Oh, no I know. You can all switch back to cable now. <laughs> I, I like give you the floor, Mr. No, no, no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, as far as the library, I know the library was part of the agenda, but it's my understanding in um, at subsequent conversations that that matter is going to be going before the uh, library trustees. Just by way of background, it's something that um, I have appeared in front of the board for before, the idea of having a designated Irish collection of literature and books in the Situate Library, particularly since we expanded, there's a lot more room. <clears throat> and part of the reason for that is obviously there's a great level of interest in Irish heritage and culture that's really expanded tremendously just in the past five years. And also, interestingly enough, I'm a member of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, I think you know, the Plymouth Division, and we helped coordinate and set up the uh, collection that is in existence in the Plymouth Library back around 1990. Um, I actually was fortunate to participate in that. I just spoke to the librarians at the time, and the director of the library, Jennifer Harris, happens to know Miss Finney, and so I've sought some input from her. But I will be appearing, and I'm hoping some other people who are interested will be appearing in front of the trustees on that topic. Okay. Piggybacking on that, um, you have all seen in the last several years the interest in our heritage and our culture, particularly as it relates to the town of Situate. And what has happened really is that our town has been placed on the map in a way that I don't think many of us would have envisioned. The idea that a reporter for an international newspaper would fly up from Washington, D.C., and do an article, and have Jim's picture front and center, by the way. <laughs> would do an article about our town and our heritage it was really rather extraordinary. And then also to see these folks from West Cork and the Sister City group, and you all had the chance to interact with these extraordinary people and feel the bond that's mutual. And the fact that this has been building up and building up is really a tribute to our town. Now, also, we bear the distinction that no other city or town in Massachusetts or in the United States has, which is we have the greatest percentage of Irish per capita of any city or town in the United States. And it's an opportunity we have to celebrate that and to, again, draw the attention not just of the South Shore, but Massachusetts and Ireland to this little corner of the world. We've had a Easter Rising commemoration each year for the last four years. And we are one of the only cities or towns to do it in Massachusetts. And those of you who have been there who have witnessed it, it's a, it's a moving ceremony. And it's a, an honoring of this pivotal event in Irish history that coincidentally happened April 24th, 1916. And this year, once again, we're going to be having a commemoration. We're honored to have the Consul General of Ireland, Fanula Quinlan, who's going to be there, as is the State President of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, Paul Hogan, who's traveling out. I think I gave, I gave a couple of uh, copies of the program to you uh, to take a look at. Mm -hmm. uh, we only had a few. There'll be more on that event. And I also gave a copy of the proclamation. And what? we're proposing to do is to have a granite monument with these words written on it, engraved in granite, and it would be placed ideally on the piece of land as you face the bandstand from the uh, Cole Parkway just to the left of the bandstand. The footprint of the monument would be roughly five feet by one foot two inches. That's all that's necessary. The size of the monument would be about uh, six feet in height, four feet in width, and about eight inches in thickness. And it would be of granite, and this would all be privately funded. What is interesting is from the first time that we had this commemoration, people have 
approach me and I think have approached some other people in this town about the idea of making a permanent monument and it would be something that would be there forever and would also let visitors to our town know that we're also honoring this event one of my neighbors Lyle Nyberg said to me he said you know John he said the only thing really that we have in this town that people can access is the Irish Mossing Museum and that's open <coughs> sporadically and so let's say somebody read the Irish Times article comes to Boston to visit family but wants to come to Situate what is there for that person to see or do and unlike Cohasset which has the magnificent Celtic cross in, in the cemetery to honor the uh, the shipwreck the 99 men women and children drowned for the brig st john in situate all we have is the mossing museum now that is great and it's fascinating and i know the folks from west cork were very impressed with it and particularly um peter mohegan's talk who was himself a mosser when he was younger but this would be an opportunity for our town to honor this event as we have honored and celebrated it so that's what is before you today any questions? Karen. Um, tell me again exactly where you're thinking of the placement. As you face the bandstand from the parkway, there's grass mm -hmm. to the left, to the left and to the right. This there's a space just to the left. There's actually quite a bit of land. Yeah. And I know there had been some concern about the issue of flooding, but that's one section that does not flood because it the land actually slopes down to Rocco's and the CBS. So that section is something that would not flood. Mm -hmm. So that was the area that I was looking. And the reason for the placement there is because it has been the bandstand that we've utilized to have this commemoration since we did it for the first time in 2016. And it was going to be carved, John? It's going to be carved granite. out of granite. Okay. Um, I've contacted Milton Monument Company. Oh, a couple of other things I meant to say, too. The uh, WGBH interviewed folks from our town mm -hmm. because they were interested in how our heritage was celebrated in Situate. And that was broadcast everywhere. And then uh, Seamus Mulligan, who does a radio program, A Feast of Irish Music, he is coming on this Sunday. He's going to record part of this event, and he's going to be playing it over his radio program. And he draws from all throughout the New England region. So there is a great level of interest in our town, and I think it's great if we can keep that going. Sorry. No, that's all right. That was, that was all. Mara? No, I think it's a great idea. I was concerned about the flooding a little bit. Um, so... But I would imagine that we would have to see some drawings first before there's like a final approval, right? Um, because this is still really in concept, right, John? Well, um, I've met with the people at Milton Monument Company, okay. and they, I, can, I can probably have them draw a schematic or something to that effect. But the, the most important part of it is obviously is the language that's going to be engraved on the stone, and that's why is I want This entire to document? Yes. Wow. Yeah, except the footnote. <laughs> you leave that out. <laughs> it may be hard to uh, hammer yeah. in there. But just by way of history, the first time this was read aloud was on April 24th in front of the general post office in Dublin City. And that was the headquarters of the Irish provisional government. And Parag Pierce, who was instrumental in writing this document, stood out in front of the GPO and read it. And that was the first time it was read. And it's a powerful document. Irish men and Irish women. This was a time when women did not have the right to vote. And Ireland was one of the first countries to do that. And in this document, they are very clear that not only men will vote, but women will vote. So it was, in many ways, a rather extraordinary <coughs> piece of work. Sure. Okay, I was just yeah. going to comment to Mara's um, Concern, if they carve it, would they install it? And they they'll can, they can, they install, can it. install it on a base that it wouldn't go anywhere, Mar. My mm -hmm. biggest concern is, is oh, could it oh, be, yeah. and it yeah. make it so it couldn't be tipped over. No, right. it's going to be, it, it's going to have substantial weight right. to it. And right. the and the base, the um, the actual width of the stone is four feet. The base is five feet. Yeah. So yeah, it's not going anywhere. It's our new breakwater. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, one question. I'm sorry. Sure. To need to move on. Um, would there be something added either on the back or a plaque or something that would explain why this is there? You know, like this was placed by the West Cork Association and, uh, you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, um, it, it's out of context if it's sitting in a Citrate Harbor. Okay. So I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great, great question, and I think I, one of the best things to do is to, again, reiterate that this stone is being placed here because we are the most Irish town in America, and it is important that we honor our heritage. Right. So, so maybe we do a, 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 an explainer statement. plaque yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's fine. On the on the other side. Yeah, somewhere yeah. in the yeah. incorporated. But I think more is right. It would the final. We should we should definitely see the mock-up. Just uh, that's not the a concept. Problem. I think is really wonderful, and 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 builds on the West Cork's um, work on the um, Irish Trail or what's a, I forget what it's called. Irish Trail. Social Irish Heritage. I knew you would have the right name. <laughs> I think it just adds to that and, and just supports all of the work that has been done on that. Tony? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. An Italian joke over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Careful. <laughs> Lillian Sweeney is my grandmother. Okay. Um, so um, have you talked to the historical society at all to get their input on it? And I, I think it's a great idea, but have you gotten their endorsement or short answer is yeah. I, I, you know frankly Tony I didn't think of approaching them yeah. um, I could certainly talk to say Bob Chessia um, yeah Doug I don't know who's who's <coughs> the society, society or kind of I mean I, I you know it'd just be nice to get something from them saying yes we support this as well sure. I doubt that they would have anything yeah. and then we just passed a um, article to clean up that area and I know Lorraine you were um, instrumental in that mm -hmm. What is there anything planned for that area that he that they're talking about putting that or is that still? No, we wouldn't impede on any plans. Okay, so none of the benches are going there, and it's. No, we could work together. Okay. Yeah. What? What I was going to curious on the timing of. We're just getting this product off the ground. Yeah. So probably not till next summer. I would. I, I'm hoping for the fall. Of okay. Not this year. Okay. Good. Any other questions? No. That's great. Any questions or observations? Yes. Uh, I, uh, I first of all, I have to say I'm Irish, so that's, that's <laughs> put that out there. And your name. I'm going to have to get <laughs> <laughs> your name. Not Custis, but Lamba. Um, <laughs> I just have one just thought on this, because I'm sitting here thinking, uh, why? Name and, I, I need it for the record, name and address. Jill Custis. And address, Sheila. 9 7 000. Thank you. Yeah. Now you're official. You can okay, <laughs> the heritage of situate, um, thought was like men of Kent in England. And the East Uprising is actually the Irish against the English, correct? So I'm wondering why there would be a statue in the harbor that would commemorate a, something that happened in Ireland that had pitted two groups together, one of which is actually the real heritage of Central besides Native Americans. And I say that it's a risk of really ticking some people off, but I'm just sitting back here thinking, why would we have that in the harbor? Why would we have something about the Easter uprising in the harbor? Why wouldn't we have something that says, you know, we are the most Irish, you know, um, populated town? I'm just, I'm having a really hard time with it. And I'm thinking that we need to think about that. This is not a battle that happened here. This is a battle that happened in Ireland. And it pitted really what were the founders besides Native Americans of Situate, which were the English. So I don't know. I mean, I'm sorry just to bring that up, but it just isn't sitting right with me. And I think we need to think about that. I, I'm not saying there shouldn't be something that says Situate happens to be at this point in our history, most Irish town, but we may not be in 100 years. And we certainly weren't. 300 years ago. So I think we need to think about it a little bit. And I'm, again, I, I say this at the risk of really ticking off some people, but I think we need to take a step back and think about why would we be doing that? So. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. 
Je hold right behind you, Jeff. First. I support this proposal uh, entirely and without conditions. I was just struck by the comment of the previous speaker. Maybe we could remove all the references to the town of Kent and neutralize the town and make it like, you know, uh, a clinical lab with no texture of color. I think we can celebrate more than one element of our history. And I think this is a great way to do it for the Irish. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Stuskis, Colonel Mansfield Drive. I just want to say you're braver than I am because I was going to get up first. But <laughs> thank you. Um, half my grandparents came from Ireland and I grew up in South Boston so I do have some claims of some Irish heritage. But my concern is, is that we are emphasizing only our Irish heritage in this town and we do it with St. Patrick's Day, we do it with having a bouncy house, um, things that don't even really represent what Irish, uh, Irish heritage is all about. This is talking about a, a, a singular event that had great repercussions, but I agree, it, it didn't happen here. So I, I, I want to be careful, I'm not going to say that I'm against this, but I'm concerned that somehow I don't think we pay enough attention to the non-Irish immigrants and the non-Irish descendants who are in this town. And when we say that with the most Irish town, in the country, we don't have the most people who came from Ireland living here right now. We're talking about people who are second generation, third generation, fourth generation. When do you stop being Irish? You're just being American. Any other comments? Anybody? Be on board. I mean, I, I would just say it, no one's stopping any other group from from symbolizing anything that's important to them in the town either. Um, you know, there's people in this town that take their heritage very seriously and are very devoted to it, and I don't think that you you should um, penalize them for wanting to do that. And I think if there was, you know, an Italian group that wanted to come up and put, a, put something somewhere as well, that they would be just as welcome to do that also. So um, I understand your point. Um, unfortunately, during that time of, of history, as, as someone else mentioned, there were battles all over the place for very good things, and that's what I think this group of people feel that this was, just like the 4th of July, just like the 19th of April in, in Lexington. You know, we celebrate a lot of things that good things became from. So um, I, I'm not against it. I know your group has thought about this a lot, and it's important to you, and, um, you know, Irish heritage is important to a large people in town, and, um, you know, I, I think anyone else that feels passionate about some other area, whether it's the men of Kent or some other thing, should should pursue that as well. So, um, you know, I, I, I understand your point. It doesn't resonate with me as much. I, I see more of the positive from it than the than the negative from it. Um, and and I encourage anybody to pursue whatever they're passionate about and and go down that path. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate those comments because it just made me think a little bit more in combining that with Karen's contextual comment. You know, it, it does kind of seem like it might be out of place if it's not brought into context, right? So why, why are we putting there? It might help answer some of those questions. So if we do support this, I think it will be important not just to have the Easter Rising um, proclamation engraved on it, but you know, maybe it's an opportunity for us to also celebrate that it's the West Cork sister city. That's really why we're doing it, right? Like, we're really not doing it because of the Easter Rising. We're doing it because we're honoring our relationship as a sister city. I just think it needs to be combined. Well, like, I think I to provide some context for those who are just going to walk up and see the proclamation there. I want to clarify. I'm not coming before this board as a member of the West Cork sister city group. I'm doing this as an individual. So I am a member of the West Corp group, and that is an important component to our town, but I am not doing that in that capacity. So I guess I would like to know if they support it as well, then. I didn't understand that. <laughs> Brenda. So here, opened up a whole new book of work. No, that's a, that's a legit, legitimate <laughs> yeah. question. Be before we do, I haven't said anything. I just want to say that to Sheila's point, to Jack's point, I, I can understand, you know, the, the context that um, Karen has raised as far as, like, all of a sudden, why it's it there? Um, clearly, there's there's a connection this time, this point in time, that yes, there are more 
Irish Americans here than anywhere else in the country, uh, we've engaged as a town into a twinning, if you will, or a sister city like we did with France, um, Soussion Brie, but now we're doing it with county, West Cork County. And so it, it puts it into context in trying to develop that kind of familiarity, I guess you could say. But to the point of the proclamation itself, what I find is it's, it's very similar to um, declarations. I think Siobhan had mentioned, like uh, the Declaration of Independence, 1776, you could probably say maybe to some degree um, a Gettysburg uh, address by Lincoln or, or um, Constitution in its own way. And it's a very um, more modern 20th century approach. Um, so it speaks more to privileges of just people individually, whether you're in Ireland or whether you're here or whether you're elsewhere in the world. And I think that's a, a very poignant and very powerful um, proclamation to at least describe that. Um, so that's how I'm looking at it and how I, I perceive it. I think it's a, it would be a very um, unique aspect that I think would benefit just not only the people who are of Irish, I think it benefits the town as a whole with our relationship with uh, West Cork County, but um, so that's how I'm looking at it. I'll turn it over to the chair of the committee, Brenda O'Connor. Yes, I'm uh, Brenda O'Connor of Fort Trout and chair of the City of West Cork <coughs> Sister City Committee. Um, we have not taken any official vote on whether to support this or not, but there is an overwhelming consensus of the group that yes, uh, we applied any effort to uh, celebrate that. Um, the reason that uh, we uh, declared the most Irish town in America is according to the 2010 United States Census, 47.5% of the population claims Irish birth or Irish heritage. And you're right, some of them are several generations removed. And they are considered Irish by the Irish, a part of the diaspora. There is a great effort on their part to serve the diaspora worldwide. Uh, one reason, uh, an aside also, is the man who raised the flag over the general post office as that proclamation was being read was from Skibbery, which is in West Cork. So uh, he was uh, met, uh, remembered just this week at a ceremony in Skibbery. But it is uh, the declaration, the uh, proclamation in Ireland is on it, not for just beginning the uh, movement towards independence in Ireland, which followed our, we were the first colony of England to go for independence. Uh, Ireland was their crown jewel. It was the next door neighbor, and they uh, really wanted to hold on to that very much. And once Ireland went for independence, that was the beginning of the fall of the British Empire. So it is significant historically for that. But the words, and that all would be fine. It's the words in the proclamation. And the recognition, as John said, of human rights. That is uh, something that we need to remind ourselves of. It's not just the United States of America that does that. There are many places worldwide that do that. Um, and the Declaration of Independence in Ireland, which is just celebrating its 100th birthday, um, it, the, was signed in January of 1919, um, follows our Declaration of Independence. There is an intertwining of ideas from the Enlightenment in Ireland to the United States and from the United States back. So there, <coughs> there is quite a, uh, a significance there. But also, I would like to say, as somebody who summoned and situated from when I was three months old, and I uh, have lived here year-round for over 40 years. I would like every group in Situate to be celebrated. I can remember um, there was a family, a Cape Verdean family, that had a farm uh, on the driftway that taught my mother how to cook some vegetables, that I still use those recipes. 
And uh, I would love to say uh, uh, 20 in, in, uh, with Cape Verde and uh, Midtown and so much more. And I think of us as perhaps the first. We are doing this, but we are not going to be the last. And I just think that this is a beginning. Thank you. Any other? So at this point then, is it fair to say that we at least would like to have you come back then, uh, sure. John, um, yeah. with more of a definitive? I'll have the language on the back mm -hmm. subject to editorializing <laughs> and Good. adjustment. And also I'll try to have a schematic so you can have an idea what it would look like. Okay. John, if you could get the, uh, the comments from the Historical Society, Historical Commission yes. also, I'd be interested to hear what their thought is on, on it as well. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. I think if he's going to come back, he should also, if we're going to pursue the explanation plaque, have some sort of wording for that. No, I'd have that language. Yeah. I'd have that language. But I understand that even if I presented it at the board the next time you meet, you may want to adjust it. And it's not written in stone, so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Thanks, John. Thank you all. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. May 7th. May 7th. Okay. Thank you very Thank you. Much. Thank you. Every two weeks. Um, all right. So we're going to move on to enough. a discussion vote outdoor entertainment permit for June 1st at 2931 Gannett Road. Um, and here we, it's Peter and Andrea, but it's, um, uh, it's Lauren, actually, McCarthy. So Lauren's here. Lauren, good evening. Um, come on and have a seat. You're going to have to explain. I'm going to have to recuse myself because I um, have dealt with Laura on, on personal matters. Um, so, although I, I feel I could vote on it because it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> I know. Um, Seriously. Is it the McCarthy one? Yes, it is. So, um, I'll turn the gavel over to Madam Vice Chair. Vice Chair, all right. I'll go from there. <laughs> You just wanted to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Okay, so can you tell us a little bit about um, your event on June 1st? My daughter is marrying this gentleman right here. Um, oh. <laughs> and, okay, um, yeah. it, it'd be from 4 to 11. Okay, 4 to 11, Gannett Road, private party with a DJ, and I think I saw that you do have a Butters. Yes, right? I, I notified every one of them. Okay, okay, great. All right. And then Anybody have any other questions? That's my only concern. Yeah. They know about it. <laughs> they do. And they've all given me the... 11's pretty standard time. Uh, what day of the week? Is that a Friday night? Saturday. Saturday, 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 night. Saturday night. Okay. okay. A motion? Sure. Move to grant an outdoor entertainment permit to Peter and Lauren McCarthy from 2931 Gannett Road for a private party with a DJ on 6119 from 4 p.m. until 11 p.m. Second. Moved by Mr. Vignani, second by Mr. Harris. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, all opposed? I should actually have asked. Is, is there anybody in the audience that was opposed yeah. to this? She's rusty. <laughs> okay, I know. I apologize. But there doesn't seem to be any, so I think okay. we're good. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Have fun. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Nice to come with his mother. All right. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Don't tell John. All Jennifer right. Sheehan. So let's see, we'll let him come back. <laughs> Maybe. All right. Someone here for the so block party? Someone here for the block party on Carnslea. Is it Carnslea? Yes. Nice. Lane? Hi. Hi. How, How are, are you? you? Great. Good. Just your name and address for the record. Jennifer Sheehan, 12 Carnsley Lane. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. Good evening. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Good. Block yeah. party. That's oh, awesome. Are we Danny. invited? Uh, <laughs> no, 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 it's debatable. If I get the permit, then maybe. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't get a permit, I don't have a party, right? Well, I have to say, you know, um, having a block parties are great. We, when we moved into our neighborhood, uh, somebody on uh, Seaview decided to do it. And they brought, at that time, ice cream truck and like a food truck. But this goes back like 15 years ago. Which is so nice. You get to meet a lot of your neighbors, hang out. Um, so that's a great that's a great thing to do. Yeah, yeah. It's primarily too to celebrate my dad's seventy eighth birthday. We've lived in the neighborhood since seventy five, so um, we pretty much know everybody unless they moved in recently. But I think the Um and I guess I you've notified all the neighbors and everybody they understand it. Um, and hopefully they're all attending. Um, most, yeah. But questions from the board? Just as long as the fire department knows they can't get down that way. If they if they're needed, they just go in the other way. 
and the chief's sitting right behind you, so. <laughs> the other side, there you go. I'll be invited. <laughs> so I'll have an engine we'll right in. How <laughs> much problem he has with the application depends on what he's about. For a black party, she probably does have to get that so, reviewed, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah you're probably. The fire, because it's not checked off. You should probably just make sure you touch base with the Pending fire department and the fire. Place, just yeah. In case sure. they need to get in there okay. for any reason. Yeah. I felt about that application. Do I. Take uh, that to them. We'll forward it to them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah. Pending. We'll we'll prove it. Pending it. Okay. So that you have it. It's just right. the the thought. It's just make sure because if something happens and they're trying to get down, that's all. Right. That's the right. major. That's right. the yeah. concern. Right. Yeah. Don't. So I'll just touch base with the safety complex then. Sure. We'll, um, we'll, we'll do stop it. shop. Do a fire. We'll do it. Okay, we'll so I don't, if, I'm just wondering what my I'll, responsibility is, other than partying. I'll give you <laughs> <a> <laughs> She's the boss. She's the boss, she'll tell you. Okay. Yeah. No, you really I'm so go going to this party. <laughs> <laughs> I already checked and it's, the okay. You're having a DJ, but it's in the middle of the day. From right, the 11 to 3? Yeah. So. It's really 11 to 2, we're just giving a buffer, I mean. Breakdown. Yeah. 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 Set up. Yeah. Awesome. And is it set up okay from 11? Yeah. Yeah. Motion? Please. Move to approve closing. How do you say the street again? Consley. You said it better than she I did. I didn't. So I say Consley. Consley. Okay, Carnsley. we'll go with that. Consley <laughs> Lane for a block party on June 29, 2019, from 11 a.m. until 3 p.m. Motion by Ms. Fignon. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. It's an Irish street name, by the way. Yeah. That's, that's why we gave it. That's why we gave it. We have one more. We have to do the outdoor well, hold entertainment. Hold on, we got one, one more. Moment. We got to. I want to add pending approval from police and fire. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So a minute. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, I get more attention than or whatever. Well, bicentennial. But in between there, there's a lot of space between. Yeah. There. Yeah, just temporarily yeah. until that fills in. Okay. Otherwise, sure. You could go out back here. It's just that you're not going to have the visibility that I think you well, want. Well, not so much out back, but more to where the police station was. Well, that's... Once the grass takes. Once the grass Then you're there. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 That's all. Maybe you could Traffic work on that, John. I'm sorry? You could work on getting sure. that well, grass Sure. Well, I mean, um, <laughs> garden beds is part two of the uh, <laughs> presentation, right? Some community garden beds out there. Well, long term, I have to say, what would be nice is I'm not sure whether, you know, it can, it can happen, but... It, it, obviously, it'd be nice to have some kind of little structure out there, you know, long term for pavilion of some kind for or farmers market going forward. Yes, so that'd you be have great. Not just you know your tents, but I mean, I think it's a great location. Nothing wrong with Front Street or St. Mary's parking lot. But Correct. They've been very hospitable at St. Mary's. This might be more visible, which might yeah, be better. That was sort of a so. drive-by market, and I realize three A's drive-by, but this could be destination. Yeah, taking a page from Cohasset and Marshfield, where it's on a green space. I think so too. Yeah. Makes hmm. sense. Is there, where would the vendors park? Yeah. I mean, I'd drop off, have them park over the new spots over here. Yeah, yeah there are many new spots, over 30 I can't park park. upon my school drop offs. Oh, <laughs> oh in the back over the there? The back the here as well as side, facing right. the new gates. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the yeah, summer's yeah, bad. Once I get the school students up out of that are parking, they're not right. supposed to be. Okay. So I would be a sort of a pr proposed to be a um, market manager helping to facilitate. I would be bringing. Um, produce that we would sell as well from Holly Hill Farm. Each, each vendor would complete a um, vendor application, which they've been doing for years, mm -hmm. and um, anywhere from 10 to 12 vendors. And live music was also discussed. Um, the possible plug-in. That's, that's up to them. Plug-in <laughs> to, the, um, to the building here. I or pure acoustic. Wednesday. I, um, I don't know how the board feels. I have no problems with that maybe in, uh, they close at what 430 off uh, town hall close to 430 weekdays Wednesday, 445, yes. 445 only depending on the music mm -hmm. if it's um, acoustic I bet you it's kind of nice if it's more <laughs> yeah uh, open your amplified windows. Yes. that I'd be like um, you might want to wait until 445 sure so yeah. keep it low otherwise Jim will be opening position. the window listening yeah. to music I don't have any windows Crash in the front my windows open on the side yeah. Yeah. well when they're over there you're gonna hear it I'm sure they would take requests <laughs> <laughs> Out the okay, that's what I'm thinking. That's yeah. What's yeah, the board I for? Questions. Um, so I, I think I'm the only one here just listening to everybody. I think this is a terrible idea um, because of traffic, mm -hmm. because of the uh, school. You know, yes, yeah, school gets out at two, but you've got <coughs> sports out there, and a lot of we have traffic problems there to begin with. Never mind having people walking around um, in a farmer's market. So I was. Um, is there a reason why you want to move away from St. Mary's? I just think it's a nice, safe spot. It, it encourages business not only for you as a farmer's market, but also drives business into the harbor. People can go for a nice walk. I don't, I don't see that experience here. So <coughs> I, what, I'm missing something. Right, what so missing? What, several reasons for a request to move from there is that um, it was not a place to come and linger, not a place to stay and shop. People would come in and out and attendance has been very very low mm -hmm. it's been a very poorly attended market <coughs> uh, vendors weren't staying and customers were not staying and lingering and making a an hour out of it or a day out of it um, so we'd like to create a, a spot as I've seen other farmers markets successfully where people come and stay and, and shop and maybe stop and have a bite to eat and and linger and with the traffic that you mentioned here and the people here that could be encouraging to get some <laughs> teens and others to to linger after school and maybe come to market on the June or um, those autumn days um, so I've just seen low attendance at the st. Mary's parking lot okay. um, on the on the blacktop there just not a place especially in the hot summer days for anybody to want to stay long or even to go there and people going to the harbor yes there were some walkers by who didn't linger to shop they were on their walk to Peggy or back or into the harbor or back and others were doing their business in the harbor by by car and leaving by car and getting what they needed in the harbor but not thinking of the farmers market as a place to get vegetables or produce or soaps or jams mm -hmm. or things mm -hmm. because they were doing their errands and did we rule out the common because of parking no crossing over 
there's just no I'm pocketing thinking he's that. talking about green space you know that like that oh I, I think the common would be great you ha we'd have to reconsider the whole parking thing I know Cohasset does that and they have a they block off um, areas for parking um, that's a consideration another thought was the library uh, Jess Finney uh, perhaps she was here earlier discussing her live music mm -hmm. I would love to go to the library it was um, not overly encouraged uh, a year ago when I when I brought that up just because of potential building behind Central Park but the library is a lovely considerations too there's Lawson Tower all the new there. green space yeah. there parking is a little bit less but it's another great destination and if just yeah, Penny did present there. something about the live music that's one good thing about at six people right that'd be nice to to feed right into live music and have the market there so I'm certainly not opposed to looking at other sites uh, the library has come to my mind uh, as a possibility. Um, I guess an overarching theme is, is, is green space. Mm. And I understand your concerns about 3A and, and, and traffic. Hmm. I'm open to suggestions and... What are your concerns about the library site? Do you have any concerns about the library site? I mean, the only concern with the library site is there's not a whole lot of parking. Uh, so you'd be competing with the library patrons for parking, right? Or if you parked on the Central Park side, then it's sports. Yeah. I mean, did I'm parking in here. I thought this was a good location because of the traffic, because of the amount of traffic that goes by. Um, I thought briefly maybe up at front of the old gates, but we don't know what's going to be going on there. There is some green yeah. space up there, but that's nice. that would be nice. That's, that's a long term. term. Sure. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, Campus traffic, yeah. but yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so this this just seemed. I was hoping this was going to have grown in. I thought that would be a perfect spot. Well, let's talk about that. Why wouldn't we do gates this summer? I mean, obviously, if it, if it passes, are we going to be breaking ground right away? Yeah, I think they're proposing. You'd right be starting time. probably late summer, early fall. Okay, okay. And you might be taking down the sea wing before that. Right, okay. All right, so that's all I want. I know. So it'd like definitely be starting... I think long term that would be ideal. I do sure. Yeah, I love that spot. It's great. Too. There's or, already or, garden there at the Red School House. Work with the common and have. How about North Situate? Why don't we try and bring some people to North Situate? It, it, it originally was there yeah. in the MBTA parking lot on the um, south side, I suppose, right, right. by the new um, yeah. the WPA so, building. And I think they ran into similar problems of, of a parking North. lot destination for a market. That's no, no green space there at all. And that was back ten. Ten, Ten years, years ago. ago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, before we had a playground so too. True. John, do you, need stuff. Yeah. do you spend much time at in Cohasset or other ones? And oh yeah. And, and why? Why do they work? And why hasn't? And I, I don't care where you go. I just want to see it work and make I it safe. I want to see it work too, and I want to see provide so business and traffic and 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 um, enticement for the town. It's all about the location. I, it's I about see. location, and, and I and I see Cohasset, Marshfield, where I've been mostly. Um, Hingham as well on Saturday mornings. Um, Hingham's in the big, big, they're in the big parking lot, lot, but they are they have a lot of grass space. That's true. For gathering yeah. and, a, and a park area. Right. Um, so I've seen it work in Cohasset where they are hmm? overcrowded with people lingering and picnicking. Parking's difficult. In fact, so there, much right? to the point of, of of them not shopping as much because they're just sitting around. Uh, <laughs> a lot of the a lot of the visitors there, but that's a good problem to have is right. to have a lot of people. Mm. I wish I had a simple solution for you, but I mean, there's there's parking obviously at at um, parking issues at the um, common and what I call the old common on Stockbridge. That is something that to be considered be too. Great. What about the yeah. driftway? Um, that big green space that that's the nest? to the left of that's to the left of um, the until the launching. The, the launching. Yeah, there, there are a lot of nets or no. There's no. Well, there's no parking. Yeah, right. you have people parking, parking on the driftway, which would be problematic. Yeah, the problem is people here are going to park out here in the front. I don't know if that's going to... Yeah, I mean, one day we can accommodate, yeah. you know, the town hall people. We'll just tell them, park out back, park over here. We'll get more visibility. Maybe more people will come. Yeah, you know, come I mean, it, it, is, it is a move that we realize in, in a place where we already are. It's just we haven't really seen any traffic and... Um, this is a chance also, and I know the, the farm I work for is in Cohasset, but you're, you're supporting local businesses. There's a jammer in Norwell. There's another, um, uh, the other local businesses, soap makers, dog treat folks who are local to Situate who's, who would benefit from, from the visibility of being at, a, at a, 
highly drawn, attractive farmer's market. It would well, be I'm zero trash, waste, you know, pack in, pack out. I'm inclined to say, let's give it a try. I mean, I, we want to do something. We're going to do That's something. That's great. Just, I, I'm like, <clears throat> right now, it'd be great to see if you can get the flow or the, get the visibility and the traffic. Okay, because if that happens, and we just end up deciding to shift it to whether it's the library location or and people would follow. People will follow. Right. right. And I think I'd welcome uh, that. That's a that's a thought. So um, if you can generate more traffic, that's the key. Okay. That's me. Other thoughts, Ooh, thoughts? motion or discussion <laughs> questions. Ruth, you got any questions? No. Just questions. <laughs> what a motion. So let's motion, go. please. Move to approve a special event permit to John Belber for the Situate Farmers Market, June 2nd, 2019. June 12th. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. June 12th, 2019 through October 23rd, 2019, from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. Motion by Mr. Harris, seconded by? Second. Ms. Canfield. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Hi. John, thank you for doing good this. Good I luck, really John. Thank you. And it's going to be good fun. And again, Sorry. much thanks to Liz and Mark Flaherty. And thank you, Mr. Pujaro and Mr. Adam for your support. Are there other pieces to follow uh, up with? Uh, we'll get to Perfect. Perfect. Right. Thank you. So, I know everybody's waiting to get into the next discussion about oh. ambulance rates, but it's, <laughs> that was supposed to start at 840. It's 5 to 9. We've been sitting here since 6. So, I'm going to take a 10 minute break and then get started on John. <laughs> with Nancy and then we're going to go to the sewer comprehensive plan with Kevin and um, Will and then um, my question to the board while we're taking a break about maybe pushing the discussion of the board selecting policies and procedures one more meeting um, but we put that on first really? at the next meeting so that we can discuss it because it's I don't think we're going to get everything in because then we have the ADA valuation transition contract yeah. 84,000 that, that that'll, has, be, that'll be quick that'll be very quick so very I figured quick. that would so, is anyone here for that? Oh, yes. Two to one after two. <laughs> well, that was just going to ask my next question. <laughs> All right, good. So we'll we take a break? 10 minute break and we'll be right back, folks. Thank okay, you. Thank you. <laughs> Discussion vote ambulance rates. Chief Murphy's here and Nancy Holt. This is a pickup from our last discussion two weeks ago about the rates. Highlights. Thanks, John. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. So picking up from where we were two weeks ago. So huh? I'm going to turn over to the chief because he put together some cost uh, estimates, which the uh, board was concerned with at the last meeting. Yep. The chief. Okay. So basically over the last 10 years, um, these, some of these are just estimates on the increase in the colas. Nancy can confirm. But uh, if, if you we look at the, back in 2009, we were in one ambulance and we're just getting started with the second ambulance we had a class one and a class five a class five is a non-transport ambulance since then which is our captain's car if somebody goes out of town we want to have ALS equipment for paramedics that are in town to be able to provide care until a mutual aid ambulance comes now we actually have three three vehicles one in each station aside from our three primary ambulances we have three backup fire trucks in a captain's car that also have the Zolmont is on them, so all the equipment increased. So now if somebody's out of town, if both the ambulances are gone, we have every station has ALS equipment and paramedics to provide care until mutual aid ambulance. So all the equipment we had to purchase for that, the never mind the paramedics, we have 24, actually it was 22 at the time, we have 34 paramedics now. Um, so increased costs about 10 grand a year per paramedic for, for the COLA and their pay, but also increased training. Since 2009, we had we had a, every two years you have to certify your paramedic. It was about 48 hours of con ed. Now we go by national standards, which go, it increased to about 100 hours. So we doubled our training costs, uh, doubled our training hours. And if you look at our, uh, our cost with the increase in medics, we've gone from about 22,000 a year to, to 78,000 dollars a year. So long story short, just our training in the colds alone bring us above what we want to increase our annual spending by, which is 120,000 as a recommendation. So those alone, so the, 
the new increased um, the requirements now in the ambulances we have to have the electronic stretchers they're forty thousand dollars a piece we have to have the uh, the old monitors the old ones were twenty thousand the new ones are forty thousand the lucas machines the cpr machines they're fifteen thousand dollars a piece we have three of them and the cpap machines and those are the main things there's a lot of others you know again we have six vehicles equipped with ALS equipment three primary ambulances and three secondary so all, the equ all equipped with all this equipment all this equipment yeah do all the stretches aren't on the engines but they do have those old monitors on there they do it they don't have the uh, Lucas machines because we haven't gotten that far yet we, we just afforded we got the ones with the grant we got three for the primary ambulances but all the the <coughs> engines now have IV ALS bags they have paramedics <coughs> on them so as we increase the paramedics we have that capability now to increase the service to all of our apparatus that are out there um, and running two full-time ambulances now compared to one we're running two front line 24 7 so you have more fuel costs more equipment cost um, supplies vehicle maintenance putting more miles in these vehicles so um, the all these costs aside from the it, just the cost of the paramedics and the cost of the uh, training uh, will far exceed what we're asking to increase the increase the uh, the cost by which just provides us just <coughs> below the average of the towns that Nancy stated last time so we're just trying to make sure that you know the, the increased cost and the other thing is the care right now that we're giving is much better than it was 10 years ago again we have all the engines with all this equipment on it we have three ambulances that are that are ready to go we have two full-time ambulances 24 7 so we've got increased cost but our service is outstanding and it and it's uh it's it's provides a much better service to the town of situate but there are more cost and uh the insurance will offset this the deductibles are non insured. I think it was over $26,000 that the town gets back a year. That includes the deductibles from people's insurance, according to Comstar. It's not just people that don't have insurance, but it also includes those deductibles. So $26,000 out of about, what, $943,000 is a small number. And I think um, we have, I think, a pretty liberal um, program that if somebody has a hardship with a deductible, or to pay their ambulance bill if they don't have insurance we just ask them to provide it's a simple form that Comstock provides us with we have them fill it out and they say the hardship due to due to financial or whatever it is and i think we've always been pretty pretty um flexible yep. to work with them on that whether it's a payment plan or just you know uh, letting them letting them go without paying if they can't afford to um also you have a presentation in front of you i just want to Move you to, or I told the board I would bring them the Medicare reimbursement rates just right. so you could see what uh, the federal government was doing on the reimbursement rates. Uh, it's it's all over the place. Uh, I gave you eight years worth of data. Um, it's anywhere from a negative increase to upwards, I think the highest is 2.48. And for fiscal, for calendar 2019, they increased them about 2.3%. Um, <laughs> I took the situate rates the bundled recommendation um, which is not changing the rates just making them bundled and took them upwards if you applied the medicare re, uh, reimbursement rates mm -hmm. the, what those percentage increases were just to show you uh, what would have happened with our rates with the same types of changes and then the same thing with the consumer price index um, the consumer price index for wage earners in the boston area from november 2011 through 2019 uh, found out what those increases were and then did the same thing and applied those to the rates and then because it's just not enough fun to look at all those charts I put it in a comparison <laughs> format so you have what our current rates are which would be bundled um, the Medicare rate what 2019 <coughs> would be if you had moved every year with the Medicare uh, percentage increase not the Medicare rates percentage increase that Medicare went up same thing with the CPIW and then what we originally requested so that you have even more options to look at than you did at our last meeting because awesome. it's more fun at this time of night to look at more options <laughs> and more numbers more <laughs> numbers um, just to get a sense if what we were requesting was reasonable not reasonable or in the ballpark and I think for the most part um, it's reasonable that the ALS 2 in both instances if we'd gone up by either one of those percentage increases the ALS 2 would be higher than we are now um, it also was looking at the uh, ALS-1 and the BLS. So the BLS would be less than what was recommended, but it would be higher than our current rate. And the same thing with the ALS-1. It would be higher than our current rate, um, not necessarily as high as what was re requested. So 
that gave you some more options to look at if you didn't like the recommendation or you wanted something else to try to tie it to? So you have three items before you. One is to bundle the rates because that's how Medicare is currently billing us and what the, uh, the third party biller Comstar is currently doing. They're actually bundling our rates for us because that's the only way they can submit to Medicare. Um, so we just like to adopt that structure. And most of our neighbors, as you saw bef uh, before in that <coughs> comparison chart, are at bundled rates. The second one would be to um, have discussion and consideration on some type of a rate <coughs> increase. And the third would be consideration of perhaps amending the policy to tie it to some index, index going forward. Um, I did re-rank them based on the same number of the same communities that we looked at before, all of the different options. The, orig the original requests are current rates um, as tied to the CPI and also as tied to the Medicare reimbursement percentages just to see where you would fall if you adopted any one of the rate structures if you decided mm -hmm. to make a change. Mm -hmm. Nancy, is the Medicare column what Medicare charges or just what you increased it by their rate? The latter. It's not what they <coughs> charge. It's the percentage increase that they did year over year applied to our rates. So the Medicare reimbursement is much less than that? Yes, it is. It's on, I think it's on the very first. So that's just a random number to, to increase. It, it has nothing to do with insurance <coughs> coverage. No, it, it's something based on how the federal government is increasing their reimbursement rates, so applying that same percentage. To a much higher, to a higher number. Yep. Correct. Hmm. I do apologize. It is dry for this time of night. So, can I ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> the, um, <coughs> The bundled requested amount going forward, does that have a component of inflation in it? No, they were just add, literally adding up the numbers. No, but going forward, if we were going to pick that option, you would revisit? That's you'd something. have to revisit it annually unless you adopted the CPI one. Two, Apply something to your policy. Okay. Such as number three. Correct. So number three is combined plus have a cost of living or a CPI yeah number one is to combine to do bundle number two is any type of rent increase and number three would be to tie it to an index going forward but yeah tie it to an index but what would be the underlying what am I missing here it would mean you wouldn't have to take any action in oh take or if, if leave it the way it is and just over the prior year there would be the the yeah, but I guess my question is if you change the structure in which you charge, shouldn't there also be a CPI increase built into the formula, or is that something that's just better revisited? I think you revisit it in the second section. Okay. Just, just bundling them alone just is for administrative ease of billing, and okay. they're actually doing it already for the Medicare runs, mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't change the pricing. They're already we're already doing it, just we didn't realize we were doing it. Okay. Sure. Thoughts? It, well, well, I think that answers my questions. This sheet that uh, the chief just went over, I mean, our cost to train the uh, paramedics keeps going up, and we, we just seem to be getting farther behind. Their level of service keeps going up, I, I believe, as well. I think. They're much, as he said, much more advanced than they were 20 years ago. I'm satisfied with this. Answers my questions. Which, um, which, which, um, which, which? <laughs> which? Spit it up. You're sitting right here. <laughs> right. <laughs> which rate are you in favor of? The bundled, the um, tying it to an index, or? The three, three. All, all three of those, I, I believe. I, you have to pick one. You have to pick one, right? So bundled is one thing. Which one of these increases do you want is two, and then you want to tie it to an index is three. So it increases in future years. Yeah. So I'm right, glad. So I, oh, go ahead, Chuck. No, I can't. I, 
I guess I don't understand it. So you could do the original, right, you could yeah, do the original no, request, yeah. and then you could also say we want to tie this to an index every CPI. year going forward. So you really don't have to address this. It's going up by one, right. two percent a year just to keep right. up with your costs. So it's th it's three separate votes. It's completely up to the board whether they want to do any one of the three, all of the three. I think you know where we stand on the issue, but. Mm -hmm. I'm set to do the bundled and vote the bundled based upon Medicare percentage, right? That's what I think. The bundled, does, is, there is no rate increase in the bundled. It's just to make our rates bundled. It's just combining the, the, the mileage and that's the current. That's pretty much done. Current. That's, that's, that's the a, first that's, that's, the that's almost a given. All right. The rate. Most and of our third numbers is the index. gone to a bundled rate. Right. Okay. okay. That's just that's that's now I get it. It just bundles the fee for service and travel. Doesn't do anything to it. Nothing to the rate. short fall. There's no shortfall. No, no, the original request is going to probably get us about maybe two thirds of the shortfall, but it's going to get us in the right direction. And then the third part is. Is there a shortfall or not a shortfall? I'm, I, yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean just it seems like we're going backwards. Just, just alone, mm -hmm. the cost to pay the salary increases right. and the cost to train the medics alone will exceed what the original request did. I'm not even including the cost of the equipment, the cost of the machines, the cost of the, you know, the extra equipment on the trucks and all that, because all the costs on the, um, on the, uh, on the apparatus, we can't travel, we can't transport by, by fire engine, but we have that, that's all part of our treatment, our component to the ALS program, to the EMS program. So it's six vehicles, even though we're just transporting with two. I think what we're missing is that's a <coughs> fixed cost, right. but irregardless of what we charge, the town is going to pay that fee. That's the, that is the fire department budget. Mm -hmm. right. oh, Whether yeah. we do zero trips or we do a thousand trips, right. that is what's going to happen. So w there's three things here. Bundling the, the fees is a no-brainer. That's it has no impact on the on the user, and it's just going to help administratively. We are the only ones that decide whether we want this rate fee to go up or not whether we want to go up by, by one of these three things that they're suggesting or anything else we want. It can go up 1%, it can go up 100%. And then the last one is whether we want it to go up at a certain right, percent every year so yeah. we don't have to talk about this anymore, ever again. Right. Um, you know, but the numbers that the fire department's budget has no impact on this. This money does not go to the fire department budget. This goes to free cash or other local well, receipts. It, it supports yeah. the operating it oper budget. It, right, it supports the operating budget. Because it's receipt. Right, but it, it goes to whatever we want. And I'm not, I'm not opposed to raising the rates, but I'm not looking for another thing to raise for our town residents to have to pay more. If we're gonna ch raise the rates more, insurance is gonna cover it, raise it up to whatever the limit that the insurance is gonna pay. But- we, uh, Can I to interrupt? Are we leaving anything on the table? You can hit to his exact point. So if you wanted to go to the top 50 bundling, which would bring more revenue, probably twice the revenue we're and asking. And not cost somebody uh, out of their pocket more. Am right. I right? All right. It depends on their insurance. Yeah. Depends on their insurance and the deductibles. So like I said, we're talking about $26,000 that we take in from uninsured, also deductibles included, that people, if you pay, say, 90%, the insurance pays, and 10%, they don't. And some people pay that, some people don't. We try to collect that, work with people. But there's hardship forms. If somebody says to the, comes to the town and says, listen, I'm having a hard time paying this deductible. I'm having a hard time paying this. We're very flexible. We work with them. They, they fill out an application. They give us the, some information. And, and, and typically, that is blessed. You, we get collections. You. We Our companies send letters. They make phone calls. They're collecting this money from whoever's on that list. That's what the company does. Mm -hmm. I know because they're doing it to me yeah. because m my son had a trip and the insurance thing got screwed up or whatever. So it's an aggressive collection effort to people. And nowadays, your health insurance doesn't cover all of it. It just doesn't. So you get, you're going to have to pay some part of that fee anyways. And Again, if the insurance is going to cover it, I got no problem. But if all of a sudden we're going to raise 200 bucks to to somebody to get get an ambulance fee on top of the water rates, on top of the taxes, on top of the overrides, then I don't think um, it's something that I that I really want to go to. And it, it's very strange. I mean, look at the rankings. There's got to be a lot of people that are charging a heck of a lot less because we're the difference between our fee at 1950 and 1750, 200 bucks, which is 10 percent only moves us one spot in terms of the ranking. That seems 
What page are you on, Tony? Are you looking at rate options? Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at that. I mean, this is the page that we've got, you know, that they're proposing. Um, I think out of the 12 towns we're comparing to, I think this is going to bring us close to 7th or 8th, even with our increase. And there's three other towns right now on that list that are looking to increase their rates. Right, so but whether we do below. the highest increase or the lowest increase, it only impacts it by one spot in most of the categories. Mm -hmm. So it's... So that just means there's a lot of diversity in what people are charging. It's not like there's a bunch of people charging right. 1800 right, 1825 right, right. 18 So half the people are charging well less than 1621 which we charge now you know right i don't well, look know. at the I, bls I, the bls is we're a lot lower than most too so, yeah. I, mean, you so know. I you know i get it you guys want money you guys want it's, not going, it's not going to my budget no no i know that's I, why we get it we have all the facts we'll decide what we want to raise it um you know you want more money coming in but you know we all complain about raising fees for the buses at the school, fees for um, your kids to play a sport. You know, this is just another one of those that we're increasing. Um, if this not was, really based on it's the about 90% insurance, just guessing. So, I mean, this offsets some of the fees for buses or whatever else you want to use it for, but the majority, the vast majority of this money is coming from insurance. I don't know that that's true because the, our insurance is paying the same amount that it did last year as this year, and we're raising the rates 200 bucks. I think the uh, overall not, rate. I'm here. guessing my insur my company so probably says I'm going to pay fifteen hundred dollars. You got to pay the rest. I'm, I'm guessing, and that's not if we raise it 200. That's all going to me. My company is not going to say I'm going to pay 700 now or 1700 now. A Over. lot of that depends on your insurance plan. Yeah. As Tony and I discussed at the last meeting. I've taken an ambulance ride in the most expensive town on the list, and I didn't pay a dime. I never saw a bill. Right. And I have town insurance. So, I mean, I, it, it's so wildly diversive between what kind of plan you have. You could have a high deductible plan, mm -hmm. and you could take a medically required ambulance, you know, whatever, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. and you're going to pay full freight because you have a $5,000 deductible. I and mean, you have to hit that before it's they own. kick in. It, it can be anything depending on your plan. Well, that's not quite right because all insurance companies pay the reasonable fee. So whatever they, whatever they deem is the reasonable fee for that service, they cover. And then you pay whatever's above and beyond that. On a high deductible plan, you have to meet a threshold first of out-of-pocket. Yeah, but usually they pay they, the usual customary fee they, they, is what they reimburse you for. No. And, and then you have to pay, the the right, and you have to pay typically a copay of something, you know, for emergency care, for ambulance of yeah. 500 bucks. Yeah. I mean, I think Nancy's, it, it, the diff, I mean, we're just splitting hairs at this point, but the difference is that you have a high deductible, which a lot of people do now, and your ambulance ride costs $2,000 and your deductible is five, you're paying all of it. Yes, but if and that's you what, and that's what yeah. a lot of us do because rates are so high when right. you provide I mean, insurance. That's a lot of people. The only way I can save money for my employees is to raise the, the deductible. deductible. Right. So then every dollar of this is going to hit, hit out of your them. pocket. Hit, hit, hit them. Right. Ninety-seven percent right. of the revenue we get is from insurance. Ninety-seven percent. So that's where the increase is. Ninety-seven percent of the increase we're asking is going to insurance, and roughly three percent is not. How do you get, I don't see how you get that. That's completely counterintuitive to what they just said. So we, we collect about 3% of the revenue we get out of say $950,000, we get about $26,000 a year from non-insured. It's 3% of the total of what we collect is, is non-insured. 97% is insured money. That oh, but in. that doesn't, a, you don't know whose pocket it came out of though. Yeah, it's the deductible. means that if you have a high deductible plan, you got to pay all of it. You pay all of it. Well, that's what we collect. They say about over forty people. We've collected twenty six thousand dollars between the non insured and the deductibles is what the Comstock tells us they collected. I don't. I don't know how that could be right. I don't know how, how could that be right with what you just said about the deductibles. Oh, it and could be different. All but for the majority, well, have them. Insured. The difference is it's insured people versus non insured people, and doesn't say right. where the money comes from. So it comes from the both. Comstar says the twenty six thousand is from right. insured people, deductibles, and non insured people. <coughs> right. There's so a total of forty. There could be a little skew in situation because we have a high proportion of Medicare Medicaid. That's why we have that big differential between what we bill and what we can collect. 
we've been allowed two million, we can only collect about a million. We can only collect about 50% of what we actually bill. Right. And those rates are going to go up. There's going to be more and more Medicare, Medicaid. So that's going to help. That's not going to. That's going to go against our, you know, our offsetting costs is going to increase as, as we get to the. We talk about I think it's 2030. Over 60 percent of the people will be 60 years old. So I mean, those numbers aren't getting any better. Well, how does the board feel? It seems like we're kind of split. Well, I would I would vote for a rate increase, but I would do the. Um, the eight percent one. Medicare based. I was gonna say is that the yeah, but that's even it a made-up yeah. number. It's you know it's that's yeah, it has nothing to do with Medicare other than the rate that they increase their stuff. I it, it doesn't mean that it's covered. I I mean again, I, I'm just repeating myself. So <laughs> is that um, just the Medicare benchmark, really? It was the percentage that Medicare went up each year, year over year. So you can call it option C. So on, on, on that particular line where it says <laughs> mileage of 10 percent, and that's just the number. So we're are we voting the percentage or are we voting the actual yeah. dollar amount percentage? But either these all these numbers mean no, just pick what percent you want to raise the rates: eight percent, fifteen percent, twenty. You can do a blanket rate percentage yeah. if you want. That you don't have to do any of these. You can do anything that board <laughs> right. in their wisdom decides that they want to do. Medicare increases theirs annually. Yes, <coughs> every year they they cha they change. It didn't it always go up. The Sometimes it went living? down. Is that what their the rate? Or I couldn't figure out what exactly they were tying it to, and it wasn't consistent across the different services. Mm -hmm. And I apologize, I wasn't here, and I did not watch this particular discussion. <laughs> I do it every time I missed it. I well, know I you do. That's because you're so it. good. Um, <laughs> do you really, um, what is the reason that you want the ambulance rates increased? Because the ambulance rates have not been adjusted since 2011, though our costs have risen. In those 12 towns around us that we're comparing to, and yes. even with the increases, we're going to be about 8 out of 12. So still below the average, even with the recommendation recommended increases. So if somebody comes in and Hingham comes in here, and we charge 1,200, Hingham's going to charge 1,700 for the same thing on a mutual aid. So we're just trying to create some parity with our neighboring towns of what mm -hmm. people are charging uh, for the ambulance rates. Thank you. Hmm. No, anybody? Wanna it might help a program that you're trying to do in town. Like I said, it doesn't affect my budget, but I'm just looking at what, what the comparisons are from other departments, other chiefs' information, as Nancy has too, and it, it might help support another program in town where most of it's from insurance. I don't know. I think wrapping my head around this, to me, it makes more sense to, you know, if you're going to raise it, raise it based on the CPI because that's what the cost, I mean, you can pretty much, I mean, yes, there's training and, and things that impact it, but... You know, it, it, it makes no sense that it hasn't increased by CPI <coughs> over, over, over time, which would be, you know, around 15 and a half percent, 15 percent, and then vote to tie it to CPI going forward. Does that make sense? So you're saying to bring it right up to speed. Bring it up to way. speed and then make sure that we don't get into, to keep falling into the hole again. I mean, it just seems it makes sense. logical yes. to me. Or, or pick any of these, but we definitely need to Maybe tie the CPI going forward. I agree to tying it. I don't know, maybe somewhere in the middle. Don't. Uh, yeah, I mean that's fine, uh, 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 but we um, need the we need to be increasing adjusting it, it you know, every in, year. Increase yes, without us having to uh, vote it. Have this conversation. Tie it to the yeah, tie it to <laughs> what the if we yeah. increase it eight percent? That's what I was this year say, and right. tie it to the CPI moving forward. I, I would be fine with that. Sounds good. <laughs> so moved. Second. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chair, do you have an opinion? <laughs> All right, just discussion here. So let me get this straight. So you're looking to increase the rates that we have that the bundle mileage, ALS non emergency, ALS number one, BLS, BLS emergency, the whole thing, by 8% starting May 1st, 2019, and then tying it going forward to the CPI index. Mm -hmm. right. Every year thereafter. Okay. So moved. Well, that's the <laughs> There's three motions. Right okay. <laughs> um, so I'm just looking at the ranking so just to see because that's what you gave us. Okay. So right. we'll go from mileage six will still remain six. I believe. 
from non ALS non emergency ninth will go to seventh. From ALS one will go from ninth ranking to seventh. Yeah, we'll go to eighth. Go to eighth. Just to keep it simple, John, we only do emergency. We don't do non emergency. Okay. And then um, the BLS emergency will go from thirteenth to thirteenth. It will still remain. Remain the same. ALS still be the best two in will town. be eight to six. It'll <laughs> go up to. And then specialty, I guess you go from eight to six. So you're moving up to. All right. Yeah, I mean, I, I just really wish we could get a sense for what insurance will pay. You know, on the emergency, if the BLS emergency, if insurance will pay twelve hundred dollars, and I'd say raise it at twelve hundred dollars. We, we unless we surveyed everyone right. in town and what their plans are, there, I don't think there's any way of really knowing that. Well, or I guess you could. There's have the three major carriers in the state. You yeah. could look at their rates. Um. All right. All those in favor of the motion proposed by uh, Ms. Curran, seconded by Mr. Harris, or was it Ms. Canfield? <laughs> I forgot. Second. It's Ms. Canfield. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those against? No. All right. And that motion was there a bundle? A yes. Bundle? Make a motion to bundle um, the rates. Motion by Mr. Vignani, seconded by. Mr. Harris, all in favor? Aye. 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 Make a motion to raise the rates by the CPI index moving forward. <clears throat> um, Wasn't that you in your motion? Motion. I think that was, no, it's actually in the it was. Motion. Was that, that in the, the original? He was bundled that? his uh, yeah. motion. Eight, it was 8 percent and then to CPI, tied to CPI. Okay. Was, it? Yeah. was that your motion or was that Ms. Campfield's? <laughs> it's mine. It was Morris. Never mind. Okay. I think we've got it. And if Thank we don't, you. guess what? We're going to see you next uh, two weeks from now just to finalize it. Um, <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Sorry, folks. It's uh, 20 of 10. So let's get on to the next uh, discussion, which is a 9 o'clock review School. discussion. Sewer Comprehensive Plan with Kevin Cafferty, our DPW so director. And Will. Wait, score? Five, one, oh, I five, forget your last five, one, five, one, five, Brand. 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 Really? Thank you, Will. That's pretty good. So now we can slow down and we don't have to go home. That sucks a loser. <laughs> well, gentlemen, thank you for coming. This is a discussion we want to have because there are a lot of people who are interested in trying to tie in, who've asked to tie in because the sewer is in front of them and we keep hearing about capacity or lack there is, the lack thereof. And um, <coughs> um, so this is kind of an important discussion because this, all the stuff that's out there and people saying, why can't we have sewer up here? And, Why'd you give sewer there? And so here's the moment. Let's what's the deal? So first of all, we want to thank our fan club, everybody that stuck around for the for the sewer discussion. <laughs> um, and officially, you know, I'd like to. It's you. you it's know, not Will. It's what? Yeah, I it is. <laughs> I, I introduce Will. Will is no longer the acting sewer supervisor. He's been officially made the sewer supervisor. So um, congratulations. Tommy's done a lot of great work well, down there. Well so <coughs> that being said, um, we updated our standard um, update that we've been doing to the board for the past few years, and, and Will's going to explain it and go through it. Good. Yeah, so we have a sewer summary report uh, that I'm going to be reading through. I'm uh, going to give a brief overview of the infrastructure or sewer infrastructure in town. I'm going to talk about capacity, uh, previous, current, and future capacity. Uh, talk about some recent repairs at the facility and talk about some inflow and infiltration projects. Um, so the sewer system consists of about 2,946 sewer connections across town, uh, about 32 miles of sewer mains installed throughout the town with 480 sewer manhole covers and frames, nine wastewater pumping stations and one wastewater treatment plant located on the driftway. Uh, our treatment plant capacity, we are permitted for 1.6 million gallons per day, uh, rolling average throughout the year from EPA and NIPTES. Uh, our design peak hourly flow, we can push out 4.34 uh, MGD for about an hour only. And our peak daily flow is about 3.33 MGD. Um, the difference between these peak flows and our permitted flows is so that we can handle uh, events like what occurred overnight when we had some rainfall. Uh, just this afternoon, uh, we experienced about 1.6 to 1.8 inches of rainfall. Uh, however, that sent our plant into a high flow situation. Uh, over the last 24 hours, we had a peak flow of 4.21 MGD. What? And over the last 24 hours, an average flow of 3.46 MGD. 
Uh, currently, as we're speaking, the plant is process still processing over at 3 million gallons per day uh, for the current rate. Uh, I'm going to talk about some recent repairs at the facility. We've undergone oh, we'll a... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Let's yep. stop right there. No, I want to <laughs> um, so let's ask some questions on that front. So in other words, recent rain, a lot of I and I going into the system, and the system at our, our treatment plant is pumping out uh, pra practically at maximum, the 4.3 million gallons per day that it's that it's allowed to or that it's can it produce it more or that's that's, <laughs> that's max the, I we would we would be unable to pump at a rate higher than 4.34 that it's just the, that's the just the, speed that's the mechanics of it that's it's it. just designed to that's do that's the that. design okay. yeah so, so well doing that. when it didn't rain on whatever day it didn't rain on probably two Last weeks Friday, ago when it was hot yeah. and sunny yeah. there you go well, how much did we process that day uh, we're looking at about 1.2, 1 1.25 MGD at that time. So, like wait a minute. 1.25 when it doesn't rain, 4.3 when it does? 4.3 4 was the uh, peak I'm sorry, 3.3. 3.34, yeah, you said. 3.3 has been pretty much the average for the last 24 hours. So, wow. almost two and a half times more when it rains. So, it's just raining into a funnel and going right into our treatment plant. And, and to be clear, some, some sewer systems are designed such that storm drain water is sent to the sewer plant. That is not the case in our town. We have a sanitary sewer system. None of the storm drains are connected to the sewer system. Uh, these are all increased in flows directly from influent infiltration. Uh, when it rains, when it pools on the streets, it can pool and seep in through loose manhole frames and covers, uh, which thankfully we are in the process of replacing those throughout town. Uh, it can also seep through the ground and area, a lot of areas in town have old clay sewer mains. Uh, the clay is a material which has been impaired over the years and isn't resistant to any sort of root infiltration and very susceptible to ground shifts um, or other settling issues. Can I jump so, in here, Will, for one second? Yeah. I, you started going there, Tony was asking. So we have a dry, how quick do you see it? So we ha let's say we have a week of not a drop of rain, and then we get you know a downpour the eighth day. For one, when do you see it? Does it take a day to go through the? And then it depends how dry the ground is. But typically, what's the delay before you see it? You know, a jump. It it depends on the event. Uh, things like rainfall. Uh, typically, rainfall events below 0.8 inches uh, in a day don't make a substantial or dramatic impact like the one I just described that's going on today. Uh, but rainfalls that exceed about 1.16 inches per day uh, lead or can contribute to events similar to this. Uh, once it starts raining at a rate like we saw, it could take anywhere on average from about 6 uh, to 16 hours, depending on groundwater conditions and whether or not it happens to be high tide when the rain starts. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I can jump in, well, for the past year and a half, we've had extremely high groundwater tables. Um, it, you know, since we get out of the drought, there's been a lot of rain, and um, our groundwater tables are up significantly higher. Um, so that's permeating the pipes. Right. Yep. So it's seeping up, getting into the clay pipes, and just flowing. Yep. There, there are areas of clay sewer main uh, that, for the most part, throughout the year, stay submerged in either ground or tidal water. The main, not the feeders to the house, the main and the connections. Correct, yep. So would those be, um, they'd have to be some form of a gravity line, right? Because if they were pressurized, they'd be pushing out all over the place, right? So. Yep, all the, all the clay services I described <coughs> are all gravity services. Uh, the pressurized systems are typically made, uh, the mains at least, are made out of HDPE, uh, which is basically a type of plastic, very resilient. Um, lasts a very long time and waterproof throughout. All the service lines that feed into a force system are rubberized and watertight. Um, so areas like the Musquashkid Pond sewer expansion that occurred uh, a few years ago, I believe 2006. Um, areas of town where there are uh, force mains like that, when we have a rainfall event, at the pump station that services the Musquashkid area, we don't see severe or noticeable increases in flow. Uh, the very much the opposite is true for the Sand Hills pump station, uh, which has a lot of services along the coast, uh, a lot of very deep services, old services, and clay services. 
Um, the Sand Hills pump station at times uh, can pump two in excess of two million gallons per day uh, during like a, a flooding event. Um, during an average there, rainfall well. like this, I would anticipate that that pump station today likely did 1.2 or higher million gallons per day just as a single pump station. Um, How long have they had force mains off the top of your head? And I won't hold you to it. <laughs> 10 years, 20 years? I, I think they've, they've been around a little bit longer than that, but they've become a lot more popular and standardized in the last two decades. Yeah. Um, the last decade in particular has seen quite a boom in force main systems, particularly along coast, coastal communities. All right, so any other questions on at least the plant capacity or the... Just one other, are any of the other pump stations not down by the water? Like, is there anything in the West End or any other... Well, I guess there's not, nothing out there. Um, what other areas that is kind of upland, and what's the impact of rain on those? Uh, some of the pump stations away from the coast would include the Herring Brook pump station, the first Paris pump station located outside of Town Hall here. Um, and I believe that's, that's it for one. Oh, and the Country Way pump station, which is not near the coast. Uh, these three stations don't experience as severe an increase as the pump stations along the coast do. Uh, the one along Country Way in Herring Brook uh, does see a moderate increase in flows during rain events, but not a severe one. Um, and that's just due to the large area that those stations happen to serve. Brook on Driftway? Yep. Okay. Yep, located on New Driftway. Yeah, okay. And, and those are newer lines also. Mm, yeah. Country Way is not that old. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. But they do show moderate increases still. They do. Uh, for those areas, we don't suspect that there's any issues with the sewer mains, thankfully. Um, however, it's difficult to pinpoint uh, some leaks. A lot of things could be contributed from um, uh, hookups to the sewer system, like sub pumps, roof drains, and other things that shouldn't be connected to the sewer system that happen to be. Uh, and those contribute uh, directly to inflows during rain events or uh, basement floods or things like that. Can we still put the dye in the smoke? There, we haven't done a smoke test in that area in a while. Uh, typically, we'll start with a CCTV inspection to look for noticeable and severe uh, deficiencies. And then if we can't discover anything with, with the CCTV inspection, we would do more intensive smoke testing or dye testing. Um, but those can be... Uh, we try to wait, stay away from the smoke testing because if somebody's at work and all of a sudden yeah, it fills their house with yeah, smoke, right. or, you know. Hmm. Well, that's the smoke test. I was going to say, how do you, if somebody's connecting their sump pump, inside their home you can't the tv's not going to do you know, you're, you're on private property but the smoke, smoke test goes back up and comes up the up. pump and fills the house up with smoke so. <laughs> that's <laughs> clever um all right sorry it's late <laughs> you don't make any friends when you do that so yeah. well it also shouldn't be doing it so. all right uh, sorry go ahead to, to that end if there are residents that are concerned whether or not they have a sub pump connected to the town sewer system um, I'd be happy to take the time to explore that issue to plumbers or drain layers to address that situation. Um, it isn't permitted in our rules to have those connections. And if we do discover them when we're doing a study, there could be fees associated. Uh, but if someone is concerned that they, they're not sure about it, we'd love to explore that and resolve it uh, and avoid any sort of fees or expensive studies because these INI studies do come with a cost, uh, they do take time, and often they uh, would like to have a second study afterwards. Uh, well, while you're on that subject, and Kevin, so if someone wants to tie a sump pump into a storm drain, isn't there a permit process they can go through? We'll with work DPW? with them if they want to tie it into a catch basin. Right. Um, right. We'll work with conservation to do that, or we'll help them I come up with a solution. In the past, We've done right. it with people in the past, but it's a lot better for everybody else as a town if you tie into our drainage system and as opposed to um, as opposed to a sewer system. Oh, that yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm saying it, so there is a process. So there is a not, process. Yeah, we can help they, people they, out yeah, and right. see if we can do anything. It doesn't mean we're going to tie a major subdivision into, no, into no, but a... Uh, right. But rather than have someone right. discharge in their sump pump onto Hathley Road in the winter when it could freeze, you know, you'll work with that individual, see if you can get it tied into a Yeah, we did that with the, probably about 23 people this year mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. worked on different areas to relocate the water. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Well, go ahead. 
That's right. Um, so I'd like to talk about some recent repairs at the facility. Uh, we've undergone a pretty major maintenance overhaul, restoring systems that had exceeded their useful life. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is the SCADA upgrades or updates that have been made part of a phase program. Thankfully, the final phase of SCADA replacement at the treatment plant will be completed in fiscal year 20. Yeah. Uh, this has allowed us to remotely control uh, the plant and equipment within and has allowed us to respond to high flow events like this in immediate and very prompt manners and make very fine tuned adjustments, uh, which has led to some <coughs> improved efficiencies across the plant. But that's just the plant only. It doesn't go to the pumping stations, right? Currently just the plant. We are currently working with Western and Sampson to make the same sort of upgrades to the Sand Hills pump station. Mm -hmm. uh, because that station floods so severely, access to it becomes difficult and dangerous. Um, so we're looking to get remote control of all the equipment in that station as well. <coughs> Everybody remembers a picture of all gone. I wouldn't be going out there in the middle of the flood and then go three stories underground. <laughs> it's the place you'd find me. It's and special thank you to the fire department for guiding me out there and keeping me there. safe. Um, the the vector at the plant, it's a combination jet and vacuum cleaning vehicle, uh, has been restored to service and is allowing us to begin catching up on the backlog of cleaning and maintenance projects at the treatment plant, pump stations and allowing us to clean sewer mains in preparation for inspections and pipelining projects. Do, does uh, anyone know what a Vector truck is? Pretty cool. It's just, it's just the big truck that would... Like a 12-inch hose, it will, it's like a vacuum. It'll suck up cement blocks. It's yep. great for cleaning oh, catch yeah, bases. I've seen those. They've been around for a long time, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah they <laughs> pretty expensive. I have some name for them when I worked in the parks department, but I won't share it here. It's a little crude. It's our only piece of mobile equipment and we're, we're very happy to see it back in service. Um, we're currently undergoing a design and permitting phase to design a new Vector uh, debris storage site at the wastewater treatment plant. Once we have that site built and installed, uh, we'll be able to catch up on the aforementioned backlog at a, a, a very fast rate and actually clear that backlog in a couple years. Um, moving on, the uh, plant water system has been replaced with a new style of system to prevent the wear and tear issues the old system was subject to. Uh, the previous system would break down multiple times a year and would need the entire pump to be replaced uh, within a five year period. Uh, the new system is designed such that the suction lines are all plastic and won't corrode anymore. Uh, also we installed VFDs for electrical efficiency and made the pump slightly larger for higher capacity. Um, the sludge feed pumps and grinders for the belt filter press have been replaced, allowing for greater capacity and higher efficiency of pumping to the belt filter press. Uh, so far, one set of the pumps and grinders have been installed, with another set remaining to be installed this summer. Um, we've also replaced the, one of our three polymer pumps, which provides a polymer chemical to the belt filter press to allow for better dewatering. Uh, the new pump also has a greater capacity and better efficiency from the previous pumps and the bonus of having a much lower repair cost if and when it ever does break down. Uh, our old pumps were notorious for having very expensive parts. Uh, that also gets more water out of the system, so we have lower rates when we're disposing of the grid um, because it's measured on weight. And, okay. and just getting rid of regular water can be expensive. Mm -hmm. The more we get out, the better off we are. Sorry. No problem. Uh, we've overhauled our UV system by replacing most of the ballast and lamps within and designing a pro uh, maintenance program. Uh, twice a year we like to drain that channel now and clean it out and replace lamps and ballasts. Uh, as part of a green community grant, uh, we got the transformers for the UV system uh, from that grant uh, opportunity and we're going to be replacing them later next month. Um, two of the three return sludge pumps have been replaced, uh, currently making plans to replace the remaining return pump. Uh, those are pumps that work along with our clarifiers, which were repaired uh, about two years ago. Uh, Replace the mixer motor for the main digester. Uh, repaired pumps at the Herringbrook pump station, uh, unfortunately in response to damage caused by grit, debris, and fat buildup within the wet well. We also cleaned the wet well several times as a result. Uh, as I mentioned before, more frequent cleaning of our tanks, wells, and sewer mains. Uh, needs to be done, and that's why we're going to be uh, designing and permitting that uh, vector debris storage site at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, as also, as part of a green community grant, we've replaced the motors for our post aeration blowers and installed new VFDs for each motor. 
Um, so that's just a brief run through of some of the more major repairs at the facility. Uh, there's a countless list of other minor repairs and ongoing projects, uh, but just kind of a, a, an overview of what's going on. Well, oh, what, yeah. is, what is that thing you keep saying you're building? What is, it, what is that actually doing? You're saying it's a storage place for... De yep, so the, the Vector uh, vehicle will suck up all the debris or whatever happens to be in the mains or the tanks into the debris tank of the Vector, uh, which is about 22,000 gallons of storage. Uh, in what tank? The tank's at the treatment center? Tank, there's a tank on the truck, so it'll suck. So if we went to a wet well, he'd drop the hose in and yep. suck all the grease and grit out. And with that, he would get a certain amount of water. He'd bring it back to the plant and dump it in a pit. And by natural gravity, the water, the water would decanter itself. And then you'd just have to dispose of the grit after you gave it time to dry out. And, and it'd, be, it'd be cheaper because it wouldn't be as wet. It'd right. be a lot drier. And a wet well is... A wet wells in the bottom of the, I'm sorry I'm taking up oh, no in the in the pits like if, if you go in I you've been in sand hills I believe and in, in, you know how you get down the stairs all the way down the bottom no I've never okay I was. Yeah. Um, so, so you're talking the pump station in the pump talking. station when yeah. the pump station down the bottom where all the sewage comes yeah. in it's it's the deep deep well that sits down the bottom okay. the liquid gets pumped out in the solids kind of settle at the bottom and then so you pump that out and are you talking out. about that little that you do you just empty that truck on that big flat area on the back side of the is that is that what you're talking about where it dries out and the water goes and then you scrape it up from there uh, currently we have a, a small sized pit uh, that's partially subgrade partially two grade uh, with some filters and baffles installed within it uh, it can handle about one debris tanks worth of material uh, and then because of its location, it's susceptible to groundwater in the area and doesn't really drain too readily. Uh, so it can take anywhere from days to weeks for one debris tank worth to be ready to be sent to Bourne for processing. Okay. And um, you're, building, you're building a new area at the treatment plant to do that? Yep. Uh, we're actually going to be uh, hopefully locating it within that uh, storage yeah. zone Hold that you described. Overflow pits. Yep. That way, if there's any sort of splash over, it would go into a controlled sanitary zone. Um, and all the water that was being separated from the solids in this area are going to be sent directly to the headworks or the influent wet well at the treatment plant. Um, so none of this is, is going anywhere that it shouldn't. Great. Um, That's good. Um, so next up, I'm going to. Oh. I had a question. So, with all these improvements for the plant, and the plant, aside from the INI, is in good shape for capacity, increased capacity? For increased capacity, there'd be a number of other improvements that would have to be done. Um, if we want, uh, right now our biggest obstacle for increasing capacity of the treatment plant happens to be our outfall location um, and restrictions set on us by the EPA and DEP. Uh, EPA has expressed that because of the nature of our outfall, we're at low tides, uh, there isn't any other flow in that ditch other than the effluent from our plant uh, that they've given us a zero dilution factor and likely would not entertain increasing the amount of volume of waters going to that location. Um, certainly not without very, very stringent permit parameters that our current plant probably couldn't handle. If, if we asked EPA to increase, say, to 2 MGD, they would probably drop our limits down to a point where we would need to upgrade treatment systems at the plant. But if you were to increase the outflow or, or extend the outflow, then that wouldn't be an issue with DEP or, or, or EPA? Uh, ho hopefully not. Uh, there would be a lengthy permitting phase to obtain a relocated outfall. Uh, I think we, when we studied that, we estimated somewhere between three hundred and five hundred thousand dollars and $500,000 for the permitting phase alone. Uh, due to it being located in a marsh uh, and proposing to locate it to an ocean. Uh, we, we identified a total cost for relocating our outfall to the ocean uh, starting at $15 million. Uh, we looked at that option as part of a, a way to solve our, our copper issues. That's where I remember the copper, but I'm saying so all parking potentially, if you're able to do that, extend it out there, then that would help potential capacity for the plant because the c plant could it's it's what 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 are we um, um, permitted for? Um, one point six. One point six. But if we were able to permit it or push it out further, we could increase our permitting amount. 
Could we, could we get a permit to do such a thing? Well, a I, I think the first thing they're going to come back to us and say... And well, before you get to I&I, &I, I'm just <laughs> saying. Yeah, right. You know, let's yeah. just talk about... So the plant's there. The outflow pipe needs to probably be extended, but that would be permitting issue plus a big number. But that's my question. In other words, if we were able to, could we get up to two? Or could we do two and a half million gallons per day? With, with the way the plant is currently designed, um, I don't think it's feasible beyond about 1.8 MGD to provide reliable treatment to the same standards that we are today. Uh, we could, beyond 1.8, achieve that, but it would require some capital investment, um, probably to get, like, to say, to two. It would definitely require somewhere between seven and $12 million capital investment at the treatment plant. Okay. Uh, we would have to replace uh, a number of pipes that just aren't the right diameter to support anything larger than 1.8 on a regular basis. Uh, particularly if we increase our standard average flow and then experience a severe flooding event, uh, then we could be pushed to uh, very catastrophic areas. Hmm. Sorry, that's what I wanted to, okay, I'll let you continue, go ahead. Yep. Um, so we've already talked about capacity a lot, but that was the next topic on the summary. Uh, just to kind of dive into this, dive into it deeper, our current rolling average is 1.498 million gallons per day uh, compared to our permit limit of 1.60 million gallons per day. Uh, the highest rolling average for flows occurred at the end of January 2019 at 1.558 MGD. And I'd like to take a moment to talk about why that number in January was so high. Uh, it was due m largely to a combination of, of two factors. Uh, one being Storm Riley that occurred in March of 2018. Uh, we saw some of the highest ever flows on average for a month during that month last March. Uh, I think we averaged about 2.54 throughout the entire month of March last year. Just for that pump station or just? For, for the wastewater treatment plant. Okay. Um, Remember the ocean area? Well, yeah. Yeah, du double the rolling average at that time for an entire month. Uh, just re trying to, re after receiving the impacts of Storm Riley, spending weeks and weeks trying to recover, uh, we had to put uh, over a million gallons of flood waters into storage tanks. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's kind of unfortunate to say, but some of the water from Storm Riley is still in a storage tank at the plant, slowly being drained back into a system at a, at a very slow rate to, to reduce cost of treating that water. Uh. Uh, the other factor which drove that number up in January was the incredibly wet fall season that we've had. Uh, this year, for the months of September, October, November, and December of 2018, compared to the same months in 2017, uh, we saw flows double. Uh, all throughout the fall, uh, just due to rainfall events, uh, groundwater not receding, um, and all that water entering into our uh, sewer mains that have I and I problems. Um, so those two factors, March on one end and the fall on the other end, made January's number very elevated. Uh, something else I will say, I did reach out to our regulators at DEP and EPA to discuss concerns about that uh, and found that we are not alone. Um, thankfully, uh, we're managing those uh, spiked flows and we're staying below our permitted limits and meeting our permit requirements. Uh, there are other towns that have been pushed beyond their permitted flow as a result of this wet fall season. Um, so when you say January, you're talking January 19. January, just a couple months yeah. ago, yep. That's the average for the full year? Is that what, when you say the January 19? That's a 12-month rolling average. Yep. So it's from that February way. to January. That's the 12-month average? Yep. Okay. Um, Going to talk about some of the uh, planned sewer phases of expansion. Before, uh, before you do that, just so you can say it, and if anyone's listening, so we are not over capacity at the plant. Our plan has a rolling average per, uh, capacity of 1.65 million, right? Uh, 1.60. 1.60. <laughs> and the highest that we've been. That permitted average. Yeah. yeah. The highest that we've been in the last one, two, three, four, five, six years is 1.54. And we've been as low as 1.19. Uh, the, the highest we've been is uh, 1.558 in January of 2019. Um, 
for a year total. You're, you're correct, the 1.540 oh. is our highest year in particular. Uh, but like targeting one month for the highest overall number that occurred in January 2019. Okay. So this kind of one anomaly that you just described put us at our highest and we were still below capacity. Yes. Okay. Barely. Barely. <laughs> Un uncomfortably close to right. our capacity. Well, just so people know, people think we're over it right. and that we're, you know. No, 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 you're right. We aren't over it. We're, it's something we've got to address, but it took a freak kind of anomaly to push us to close. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's very important that we maintain below our permitted flow number. Uh, that's very much a not to exceed number. If we were to exceed it, our regulators could impose administrative consent orders upon us to undergo influent infiltration projects. And once you are placed under an administrative consent order, uh, you are ineligible to receive grant funding for the projects you're directed to complete. Um, and thankfully, uh, the state and the, the government and the t and employees of the town have been very proactive in procuring and securing grants for the sewer division and other divisions in town. And we'd like to continue to enjoy that uh, benefit. Well, where do they measure the 1.6? Going into the plant or go discharging? Discharging. Discharging, okay. Yep. If we get close, send a couple trucks over, we'll haul it out. No, I just, uh, that water is quite clean, right? <coughs> yeah, very clean, very high standards. Uh, solids permitted below 10 uh, parts per million. On average, I think we have about two to four parts per million in total solids. Uh, fecal coliform levels well below allowed levels, uh, safe to drink, or not, sorry, not to drink, safe to uh, play in or swim in. Uh, our fecal coliform limit is uh, 14 uh, fecal coliforms sampled per 100 milliliters sampled. Uh, I believe the beach standard is about 108 last time I checked, so we're a large factor below that. Uh, very low nitrogen levels. Uh, we have very stringent nitrogen limits, so we stay below four parts per million on nitrogen. Um, and very low copper limits uh, for those organisms small enough to be affected by it. Uh, our copper is limited to four parts per, per billion um, going out of our plant. Could you fertilize with that water? It's like, a could different we round of permitting because we, we looked into that before possibly uh, using that water at the two golf courses that's around there. I'm, that's where I was going. And we before ran the, into before the meter going out. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Where where uh, right. And one of the water. one of the things that came up was we would have to make changes to our process with the amount of nitrogen that's in there and what could go in, and it'd be a whole round of testing. Would it be that um, difficult though? I mean, uh, talk about close proximity to the two golf courses. It is. It's right there. And yeah. and we spoke about it with DEP, and this was a little before Will's time. He get in there and. We spoke to a couple different engineering firms, and we were looking at permitting and spending well over $100,000 just to get the permits that's, to put the that's, water that's nothing. in there. I mean, it's a win-win situation. One, one thing that would be notably difficult to treat our effluent for to provide irrigation water uh, for the golf courses would be the salt content. Uh, we experience very high salt levels in our effluent and throughout the plant. Um, and, and not to beat a dead horse, but a lot of that salt comes from mm -hmm. tidal and floodwaters entering the well, sewer Maybe mains. if we fix that, that's something we could revisit down the road for sure. Yeah. It, it would certainly make it much more feasible. Right. Yep. Hmm. That was my idea. Make well, we're okay. that was your idea. Sure. You're getting to the phases. Yep. So the town has a phase sewer expansion plan, uh, of which three phases are complete and three phases are remaining. Uh, phase four uh, is referred to as the Tree Streets area of town, uh, has an expected flow contribution of 0 0.14 MGD. Uh, phase five uh, is the North Situate area of town with an expected flow volume of about 0 0.15 MGD. And phase six is the Minot Beach area section of town uh, with a proposed flow total of 0 0.13 MGD. Uh, these three remaining phases have a total of 0 0.42 MGD, and we'd like to position the plant through INI projects to be able to begin uh, at least one of those sewer expansion phases. Well, are uh, those um, are those uh, phase numbers um, current, or are they from the original engineering plan that was done a gazillion years ago? Plan. So, how do you ensure that those are accurate? 
Uh, phase four would probably need to undergo another study to refine the numbers. However, phases five and six have been part of the uh, regional sewer plan that we've been exploring with Cohasset and Hull. Uh, thankfully, the regional plan will provide enough capacity both for phases five and six, uh, as well as a few other areas of town. Quite, quite a large area of town could be sewered through this regional program. Okay, thank you. Um, where was space? I didn't hear it. Where was space for what area of town? Tree uh, streets. Okay, just one chair. Thank you. <coughs> Are you going to get to the current average yearly flow rates? Uh, that's provided in a chart table. Um, I think you've probably heard enough numbers from me, so well, you can the reason why I want to make yeah. sure so people understand what the rates were in 2014. So in 2014, the average flow rate for that year was 1.305 million gallons per day so when you begin to take a look at the next phase that we were talking about whether it's the tree streets or whether it was North Situate you could have brought at least one of them on and then 2015 it went to 1.194 so it dropped million gallons per day the average so in 2015 we were really positioned to maybe potentially bringing on maybe not only one but maybe if we were talking about phase two phases in conjunction with some money with I and I and then 2016, it went up to 1.203 million gallons per day. So there was, again, some kind of movement back up, but not like it was in 2014. And then in 2017, it jumped to 1.327. And then 2018, 1.54. And so when people begin to say, well, you know, we were looking at trying to expand. We were, because we thought we had the capacity to do it. And now we're finding in 2018, it went to one point five four so I'm like the problem is the water that's coming into the system is really preventing us from trying to expand these phases so I just exactly. want to put that out there because there's a lot of misinformation potentially disinformation that people seem to think that we are ignoring numbers or that the numbers are playing or we're fooling around with the numbers strictly on the flow that you're getting at the plant and that we're capped at 1.6 million gallons per day Yep. And so that's why I wanted to at least raise that because I think it's important that people at least hear the, hear the numbers or better yet, you know what we should publish if it hasn't been published, your, your um, analysis or your, your memo so that people can take a look at it for themselves and then decide whether I'm so. accurately telling yep. these has, numbers. Has, so has anyone done it, I, and I know this is a massive thing to try to figure out, but in that time frame between 2014 and 2018 and this increase, do we have even anecdotally or maybe through the planning department, is there any way to, to analyze how much of that is due to new development versus infiltration? I mean, we should be able to say 200 new houses were built in that time frame, and that translates roughly into X number of gallons. I'd be really curious to see. Yeah. Yeah, some I don't increase. think that the impact will be that much, right. but it would be a good thing to kind mm -hmm. of pull out and say, and, and really un get and wrap our ha heads around. Yeah, well, I, I could talk to Brad about that and see how many houses went I think that would be I mean, that'd be pretty like easy, really 110 gallons per bedroom. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So right. Well, then you'd have a better idea how much of it really is attributable to I&I. I &I. Right. Oh, yeah. I would imagine that you would, you do have that. I mean, wouldn't mm. the engineering guys that are doing yeah, Cedar Point pull all that? I would say that uh, an interesting data point to compare when comparing the, the numbers just requested uh, would also be to take a look at average groundwater levels in comparison to new homes constructed. Uh, there are a number of developments going on across town, and among the largest of them, uh, they have yet to connect or provide any sewer use yet. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, we so they talked about Toll Brothers, we haven't yep. talked about um, the MBTA parking lot, and the only one that potentially is partially connected are the apartments down on way. 50 Country Way. Yeah. Right. And we, if I remember correctly, we approved Toll Brothers back um, when the numbers were 1.2. It was 1.1. Yeah. No, it was 2000. Because Kevin, I remember you coming in saying, no, you've got capacity, you've got capacity, and then we were all kind of shocked two years later when we were at capacity. Yeah, no. Right. Yeah. We're okay. very right. vulnerable to weather fluctuations. Yeah. Yeah. And storms. I mean, storms kill us. Right. Right. You know, Which right. speaks to the infiltration, not development. Now to the I and I. Yeah. Is that where you're going next? That that yeah. is. Yep. I think we've we've been there a little bit already. But uh, to continue on, 
Uh, coastal flooding is among some of the most severe uh, influent infiltration that we see at the plant. Uh, thankfully, a number of improvements have been made to try to mitigate coastal flooding effects. Uh, the seawalls along Oceanside Drive have been repaired and raised. Uh, during the winter months, uh, we still continue to experience heavy flooding in the Sand Hills area. Uh, whenever it floods, it has a direct impact on our flows. Um, sometimes anecdotally residents even think of the Sand Hills pump station as like a, a drain for the neighborhood. Um, unfortunately, until those high tides stop coming over the seawall, uh, there isn't much we can do to, to remove that water from the location. But you do actually when it's done <laughs> and you open up literally the, the, the gate, the door, and psh, it's, it really drains a lot of that basin out. Yep, and the uh, drainage improvements made in the ocean side area have also helped a lot. Once that seawater gets below the drain outlet for that area, it, it leaves very quickly, uh, which is, is very nice to see now instead of it staying for so days Will's, after. So Will's talking about, we changed, it used to be the old-fashioned flapper valve there, yeah. and we changed it what's called an elephant trunk, so it's a large rubber piece that only opens up when the flows are going out then when the tide comes back in it clamps down and shuts down automatically so instead of the old flapper which used to get stuck because rocks would come in or rocks would move in, would get in and it would, it would get stuck and we've even had like furniture stuck <laughs> you know yeah. that, that yeah. comes through there that somehow gets down the storm drains but this new section we built we built the manhole ahead of it with a deep sump and then another man a second manhole so that we could keep it clean and then we have this uh, what we call the elephant trunk in and it allows water out but it doesn't allow anything in it's a big thick rubber unit so far we've had good luck with it <laughs> um, <Angie's> favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so four, like four areas along the coast that experience flooding where there's sewer service uh, we need to continue to address that issue by continuing to raise repair seawalls uh, re repair or install new drainage systems uh, replacing gravity sewer services with low pressure force systems, uh, replacing manhole frames and covers that are no longer watertight with watertight frames and covers. Um, very excited to say that we have a number of covers already procured and are in the process of replacing some across town. That's great. Um, we've gone through and conducted a few sewer main inspections. Uh, there are areas on Ermine, Hatherley, 5th and 6th Ave that have been inspected for I&I. &I. Uh, where deficiencies and leaks were found. Uh, we're currently soliciting quotes to repair and reline these areas. Uh, repairs should be taking place uh, early this, or within the next month uh, or by July at the latest. Um, like I said, we're undergoing a sewer manhole replacement program. Uh, about 48 watertight frames and covers have already been procured and are in the replacement a pro uh, process of replacing them across town. Uh, about a dozen of them had replaced already, uh, with another dozen identified to be replaced. Um, and lastly, the Cedar Point Sewer Main Replacement Project. Uh, we've identified Cedar Point as among the highest influent infiltration areas in town. Uh, it is estimated that about 0 0.04 million gallons per day enter the system with a daily average from this area. Uh, this old deep clay gravity sewer will be replaced with a pressurized system that will minimize I and I in this area. Uh, this project is currently out to bid. Um, already mentioned. Oh, it. Can we? Go ahead. I'm out. That doesn't <laughs> seem so. Yeah. That doesn't seem like a lot of I and I. Point oh four. You know, I know this has been identified as our one of our worst sections, but when you look at how much is coming in up top, you know, like two hundred. Right, point two, right? Uh, or up to um, over 400,000 gallons yeah. annually on average from inflow and infiltration. So this is what, 40,000? 40, 40,000 gallons a day. About in normal 10%. circumstances, in flood events, it's, it's significantly higher. And how much do we think is coming in up, you know, on point number three, where you're looking at Ermine, Hatherley, and all that? Do we have, you know, those leaks? What, what? We did Any find sort of deficiencies in that area. We didn't study the severity of those leaks because the, the area was so small, we decided to just reline and, and repair them uh -huh. uh, because it was within our budget to do that. Or hopefully once we get the quotes back, we'll find it will be within our budget to do that. Um, I would estimate- well, I'm sorry, more relining of pipes? 
We're not going to do that anymore, are we? On Ermine, Hathaway, 5th and 6th, uh, it's looking like relining will probably be uh, the best. It's, it's a small section with like some roots that have grown in, uh, a couple caps that have been busted. Um, it's not very severe. I'd estimate maybe two, 3,000 gallons per day uh, coming in from the deficiencies we found. Is that very effective? I mean, I've seen it, or not really seen it, but... I know the board one was done before, and I'm just not convinced that that's effective. No, but it's, it's death by a 1,000 paper cuts, as I like to say, with the inflow and infiltration. If we could eliminate 2,000 gallons, anything we eliminate is, is a positive. Um, you know, it, it does work. All right. Um, I'd like to see it done, if yeah. you don't mind. All right. Yeah. yeah, and this is a smaller project, mm. so we're looking at it again. This, you know, it, it's something we're okay. looking at. All right. Back to Moore's question. Do you consider that a big amount for Cedar Point? That's 10 percent. 10 percent what? Of our I and I, right? Yep. For you think that's the single largest area in town? That's what our our study report provided to us. Uh, in addition to that, it was also the highest rate of I and I per lateral foot of sewer. Uh, so it had the greatest cost benefit to target that area first. So tell me how that's that percent. So it's. 40,000 gallons a day is what they're treating. You're treating from that area. Yep. Some of it's real. Well, no, totally, as, as they told us, you got this figure in the middle of the night when they weren't, how many people are up in the middle of the night flushing toilets and taking showers? That's how I... So this is this all I&I? &I. I. That, that 40,000 is all inflow and infiltration. And you said that was what percent? 10. 10% of 10 the total. of overall system wide yeah. inflow and infiltration. Because if the total's 400,000 400, gallons, gallons, I just said a day. Percent. If you're looking at 400, are we 400 or 450,000? If that's going to remove 40,000, yeah. it's 9% then. Or, I got you know, it. Yep. So on a non rain event, that's what we right. think is a. In as part of that study, there were, there were times when that had gone up to 185,000 gallons after you know, tidal events or to that effect. Oh. So the, the 40,000 gallons is an average, uh, taking into account a rain event, a low tide cycle, a high tide cycle, and a slack tide cycle. Who did that study for us? Ty and Bond, or was yeah, it? Yeah, Professor McKee. Right. So I mean, I've been going around telling people that that's a fact. So I certainly <laughs> hope, and I, no, seriously, I've yeah. been telling people that that's, what, that's a fact. I can give you the sheet, copy of the sheet. As long as it's right, I, you know, I'm happy. It's all right, okay. Yep, we do have a complete report from CDM Smith. It's about 62 pages, uh, about 40 of which are graphs and charts and flow metering and okay. uh, the rest of its conclusions and price estimates and flow estimates. Hmm. Um, any other questions about um, Cedar Point before I? Well, what do you think the second most is, if that's? Likely the Oceanside area. Uh, but there are some unique challenges to that area. There is a, main, a sewer main interceptor on Oceanside proper, uh, which carries flows not only from that neighborhood, but all the flows from the chain pond pump station and all the flows from the Musquashkit pond pump station passes through that interceptor. Uh, roughly about uh, 60 to 68 percent of the town sewage passes through the Sand Hills pump station. Uh, and that interceptor. Um, and that being a large concrete gravity interceptor, uh, there are a lot of uh, challenges when it comes to replacing that with a low pressure force main. Um, so it's probably going to take us a while to design and figure out the best plan for the ocean side area. Hmm. Is that a 42 inch? Yeah, it's, it's huge. It's a big 42 inch pipe. It's a, you know, huge. Yeah. That's yeah. on ocean side. On ocean side, yeah. Hmm. And you believe that that's possibly, or you know that based on your numbers, the flow, that it tends to be the second largest area for I and I. You believe that that vicinity somewhere in there. Yep, a uh, about fifty percent of Oceanside uh, was sectioned off in an area of the study and identified to be priority two uh, of the worst of the most severe inflow and infiltration areas. Uh, priority one being Cedar Point. Mm -hmm. And Kevin, when are they going to start that construction? Well, Ocean, Oceanside. Oceanside Drive, the water should be starting up in about four weeks. So we'll do the sewer at the same time? No, we won't. We will not be doing the sewer. We were doing the um, water lines. And then just a temporary patch 
because at some point a temporary like, patch and we'd have to do an evaluation if I mean that might be the type of scenario that because of the type size that you might do a bypass a giant bypass and do it in the summer in the driest month and actually physically go in and do do repairs that would be a whole different study that on the a, on the sewer the pipe it's uh, 48 inch diameter so yeah, it's right. a significant pipe right um, you know I don't think that's something we would be ripping up and putting in my, my gut feeling but we we have four different high prior we have four or five different high priority areas um, okay and we went with the when we chose this originally we went with the um, lowest hanging fruit right right I, mean, I just I was down that road the other day there isn't a smooth spot on Oceanside Drive <laughs> wait till wait till one of the neighbors who's been complaining about the road fights <laughs> Well, it's just, yeah. I mean, it's nice and straight. It, it, uh, all right, okay, let's move on. Thankfully, the Cedar Point project includes curb to curb paving um, and as a bonus. And with Oceanside Drive, we'll, we're going to evaluate that um, after the water lines, and we'll obviously consult Will which direction we're going with sewer in that area. But I definitely want to pulverize that road and rebuild that road. Yeah, but not until the sewer's done, too. And, right. and make some improvements. Um, and that's how we'd have to look what we'd do with the sewer. Right. Yeah. I mean, if it's something we could access by manholes or do some injection or something like that to control it, you know. Um, that was installed probably the same time, the point in the um, avenues and the Alphabet right. Streets back in the 70s, I think, I remember. Yeah. <coughs> uh, another obstacle with our I&I programs is um, these larger projects have a high capital cost and our retained earnings... Uh, won't allow us to support continued projects like Cedar Point moving on. Um, on the bright side of well, things... I mean, to, to support <laughs> Cedar Point, we already have $2.2 million for Cedar Point. Yeah, pro so projects so like Cedar oh, Point. Like, moving I'm sorry, forward. Okay. Yeah. I'm saying it doesn't have say No, it does. Right Thankfully, now. Cedar Point has been allocated and also is benefiting uh, from a grant from the state. Um, in brighter news, the, the, we've been working with the towns of Cohasset and Hull to explore the feasibility of a regionalized sewer program. Uh, the town of Hull is going to make upgrades and repairs to their treatment plant to restore it to service. Uh, they have a direct ocean outfall and excess permitted capacity. The engineering study for feasibility of this project will be released, uh, releasing a report to the towns by June of this year. Uh, so we're very excited to see that report and get input from the other towns once that report is published. Um, like we mentioned earlier, the regional system will provide sewer for North Situate, which we have identified as a high priority area to provide sewer service to, uh, both for economic and environmental reasons, uh, as well as the Minot area, uh, areas in between, and areas up Country Way. Um, these areas also contribute to the Cohasset watershed. Uh, and will help clean up those waters and uh, scores very highly on environmental reports. And we're hoping that the regional system will be eligible to receive uh, a large number of grants because of the impact it'll bring. Um, lastly, I want to talk about current uh, and potential future development for the sewer system. Uh, roughly 50,000 gallons per day in sewer usage is expected to go online from approved developments in town. Uh, with potential future developments, uh, there's an estimated additional 14,000 gallons per day uh, in contribution to the sewer system usage. Uh, and again, just wanted to underscore that we have a high inflow and infiltration rate that is limiting our capacity. Uh, the INI in situate is estimated to be 0 0.45 million gallons per day, and this is the primary uh, limiter to our capacity and limiter to providing sewer service to new areas of town. Great job. Yeah. That was good. Thank you. Well, yeah. well as um, can I, I just have one question. As uh, the new official mm -hmm. sewer superintendent, um, you feel good about these numbers, meaning like accurate, you know, you've been looking at them for what, a little bit over a year now? Yep. So I, I guess I think some of our challenges over the years have been just really getting a grasp really where we stand. Um, so I mean my intent is not to like put you on the spot but it's just really to kind of understand I guess I am I know I'm so tired I can't are you talk. lying to us I know <laughs> <laughs> that's not well, really what I'm insinuating I'm just trying to I'll translate I, I just want to make sure that these numbers are pretty solid <laughs> that, that's all you know 
Um, I've been I given no poor choice of words. It's late. It's, just, it's late. More. Yeah. I'll just be She quiet. needs a Snickers bar. <laughs> Uh, I will say that uh, a lot of our numbers are based off of the CDM Smith study uh, that was conducted in 2016 and completed in 2017. Um, we have high confidence in these numbers and that's not just because of that one report, but the town seems to have been studying this issue for a very long time and a lot of these numbers uh, match closely with previous studies. Uh, however, with the notable difference of as time goes by, the numbers have increased and become more severe. Uh, Thank you. What's the buffer comfort zone that you have? I mean, we're at 1.562, no. <laughs> um, and you, you know, right? Is that what it will bring our, with the if everything additional right. developments that are in town? Yeah. So, what's what's the area where you're like, this is the zone where we just can't. You know, this, that's our buffer, if you will. Um, as we were approaching January, uh, just a couple months ago, I was becoming very concerned uh, where our flows were at and where they were heading. Uh, thankfully, that trend didn't continue because if the trend had continued, uh, we may have been running up against our permitted limit. Um, it had been my hope uh, a couple years ago by this time to be pushing for uh, another phase of sewer expansion. Um, in order to provide more sewer service and, and bring more into the plant. Um, however, I, I can't, in, in any, with, with any good faith, recommend an expansion at this time uh, because we, it would push us to exceed our permit, uh, which would have some pretty severe consequences. So for that's for phasing. You can't agree to that. Yeah. Okay. So the, the good news is, I assume when we come into summer, our average drops and every month we get away from that bad month of january our average drops <laughs> so yeah, that, that's uh, a, a notable irony I, I wanted to mention actually that during the summertime when the number of residents in town increases and the water use in town increases uh strangely the opposite is seen on the sewer end whereas sewer usage decreases in the summer months despite the increased water use by the residents. Because it's all wow. ground and ground. Water 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 yeah. table dropping. That's just crazy. It is. <laughs> so. We need to tap more water out of the groundwater. And we'll try it. And your numbers that are these extra 40,000 gallons or whatever per day, that includes the Toll Brothers, right? Yep, that, that 50,000 number includes Toll Brothers, uh, 50 Country Way, and a, a couple other smaller okay. homes. So had we known these numbers back in 2015, 2015 no. we probably would have made a different decision. Um, At, back in 2016, we were trending in the other direction. Um, like I said, I was hoping that that trend would have continued and we could have yeah. done phase four or five. Um, but that, that trend reversed in a very dramatic way, and, and now our flows are uh, among the highest that we've seen. And how many gallons do we think uh, the cycling of it through Cohasset will take out approximately? It won't take anything out of what we process, yeah, right. but it will. It'll provide entirely new sewer, sewer service. Areas. Areas. New areas. No, I know, but oh, we're not, we're not system. redirecting it. No. no. We're, we're not sending them our got it, got it, junk. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay, okay. Well, we are sending a mark. We're sending oh. our no, new junk. No, I was junk. thinking that we were going to redirect some <laughs> yeah. some area, but That'd we're not. Be. We're just going to bring on north. Could we? Okay. we could but but our closest is probably Musquashkit, which right. is the most efficient. Pretty far. Right. right. Yeah, because it's, it's the new yeah. system. Because it's the newest system. Mm. So we so we need to maintain the level so that we don't. What what did you call it? Administrative. The, when they consent on it. Consent yeah. because. That's the only way that we can still apply for grants to pay for the I and I reduction that we desperately have to do. Yep. Okay. And then uh, okay. I'm just summarizing because my brain stopped working a half an hour ago. But um, half hour. We've also so and one of the reasons that we asked you guys is <laughs> somebody slapped them. <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> I is John talk. still here? I heard him. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we've had, <laughs> I think, three or four different individual requests to tie in, which is one of the reasons that we asked you guys to come in. Is to say, we all went time out, 
we don't know if we can do this one offs because we want to know where we are. Um, that's where we are. That's so where what, we what is one house do? Yeah. Uh, um, one house title five estimate, uh, it, it conser a conservative estimate for what they could use would be about 210 gallons per day. Uh, I think the average water use in situate is closer to uh, 95 to 110 gallons per day average usage per household. So, so it's tell not me the number. Only title five, 110 per bedroom. It's it's you're saying it's you use those calculation numbers, yeah. but yeah. but we've been less. Okay. okay. So tell me the number again. 100 is a good number to go by. Roughly 100, 110. Okay. Would be a, a safe assumption. You, you said no. The no, house. Two, house. Two, two, house. Ten for a house. Two, two ten for a house. Two ten for a house. If it's a four bedroom house, it's 55 gallons yeah. per bedroom. So 110 by you know by two two you know two. two 20. You guys yeah. are confusing. Well, that's How much is one house? 220. 220. Two, so 200 for a house is a good estimate to if we had a spaghetti line here or Based there. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Because we also need to generate revenue to pay for your budget mm -hmm. um, and to do all the stuff we want to do. And pulling new houses on for 16 grand into an infrastructure we already have is the easiest way to make money. So, I, if you could think about that and tell us what comfortably you thought, if you thought we could give up 25 units a year or something, um, houses a year that would add to it without having an impact, that'd be good to know also. Maybe it's 10, maybe it's five, I don't know, what, whatever the number is. Because I think we seriously have to think about a program of generating revenue by doing that. In, I don't, in, you don't have to do it now at 11 o'clock. One of the things we noticed, too, it, it's cyclic because, as you said, back a couple of years ago, we were talking about this, the water was real low, and then we get hit with a drought, and it was even, you know, lower. Um, and now the weather pattern's changed a bit. It's a lot wetter, and our, our rates have gone up. So um, if if he said 10 houses in, in another year, with a reduction in the groundwater table, he could say, yeah, we could take on a lot more. Um, but it just depends how that level yeah up. I mean we can only talk about like the upcoming year you know yeah and then every year we'll have to reevaluate if that changes yeah. yeah what's what's most concerning to me is that the the revenue for the sewer division is is largely dependent on connection fees um, and with our capacity with us coming up to our, the limit of our permitted capacity uh, we can't really plan to continue that mm -hmm. um, because if like if we run into that capacity we're going to suffer consequences for it um, right so rates right. are going to have to go up and you know smaller increases to existing infrastructure will have to help fund some of the stuff yep both both ongoing modest I and I projects somewhere between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars per year should be undergun uh, undertaken um, and as resources become available or as grant become grants become available these larger projects identified in the CDM report uh, need to become priorities for our, our capital planning for sewer. Here's, I just don't know. On 40B, if we're at capacity, they don't, they can't, we, we can't be required to provide sewer, or we can. Unless you have a moratorium. moratorium they get Even if up. we're at 97.6% of they capacity? Yep. yep. Well, that's not good. Because they can turn around and say, you need the town needs to do more I and I to remove it. You're not at your capacity. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, our our current high flows could be justification for a sewer commissioner issued moratorium. Um, however, that goes directly to the point I just made about sewer hookup fees largely <laughs> supporting our revenue um, and the difficult position we would be in with a moratorium. So just so I'm clear, again, we are in that buffer or zone that you're not comfortable expanding at this point. For a, a phased expansion, definitely not. Uh, for modest uh, existing homes uh, or homes abutting sewer, uh, that's a different story. Homes abutting sewer have a right to connect. Um, and smaller uh, existing properties generally contribute less flow. Uh, but substantial projects, projects in excess of a dozen sewer units or more, uh, I would I would hesitate uh, before approving uh, too many of those okay. and, so until we start down. Yeah, it should be. 
unless they did some sort of corresponding I and I first to quote cab out their own capacity. That would be the I ideal um, right. way to, to position posi to position projects in larger than ten or twelve units uh, to have some sort of requirement or contribution to address I and I uh, would be a very ideal situation. I think we did Thank that with, you, Will. We did that with True, didn't we? The True Project's doing their I&I? &I? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I just want to say thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Will, in particular. This is the type of um, explanation that's been extremely helpful for the board, probably more importantly for the public, so they understand exactly the situation. I feel like we go from sewer to water and to seawalls and <laughs> back again to yep. whatever the crisis is. Um, but... Um, in any event, um, I'd like to, like I said, we should put this on the website so people can have access to it to see exactly the situation. And um, hopefully, maybe it will improve with the, the water, but um, it's really I and I. That's what it comes down to. Any questions from the audience? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bob Lorenzo, 26 Green Lane. Um, very helpful. And thank you very much. Um, I don't know if Ms. Canfield's question was answered, but I think it was, that for those situations for uh, communities or houses that have come before the board and made the request, it, it sounds like that doesn't necessarily fall within the concern of a larger phase. And, and if that's correct, what would be the next step that we would take uh, having come before the board on about a month ago? How many, Bob, how many houses was it again? Uh, well, there's there's 24 in the development. There's there's six right along Tilden Road, All right. 18 on Persimmon and Hickory, and and we know that there's there's 10 uh, of, of those that would be definite, you know, definitely willing to hook up. So maybe Will, when you think about it, and tell us what that what that number of comfortably adding. No, uh, so one offs. You don't have to do it tonight. You're impressed. He's ready. <laughs> I think we have it scheduled for the May 7th meeting, so maybe. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Yeah. I'll probably need you back there for May 7th. Well, yeah. so come back on, on May 7th? Yeah, we can get in touch with you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, May 7th. Thank you. I'll put it earlier on the agenda. <laughs> First, we're going to talk about policies. Mm. Um, any other questions? Will, Kevin, thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate thank it you. For, you know, for doing this. Um, all right. Um, thank you. Great night. <coughs> You're here for the 10 o'clock discussion of the ADA evaluation <laughs> transition plan contract for $84,800. I'll try line? to present it faster than you said it. Um, the, the ADA transition plan went out to bid back in September. The bids came in far in excess of what the town had appropriated in a prior capital project in 2017. We went back to town meeting with another capital project for additional funds, and Jim was successful in getting a grant from the Mass Commission on Disabilities for $50,000. We did put it back out to bid before town meeting so that we would be able to make use of the grant before it expired in June 30th. We did get our bids back on Monday, yesterday. Um, we had two bidders. One did not comply with the requirements for how to pro um, provide his price proposal, um, which was the preferred uh, proposal. And the second one, uh, which was a very similar firm, could do the work as well, um, did comply with the price proposal, and we could afford their price proposal, which was $84,800. And this would provide a survey of all the town buildings, parks, and parking lots, and then phase two could uh, be awarded after July 1st, and that would be for the rights of way. So looking at the sidewalks. Did you say all town buildings? Yeah. Hmm. All 56 of them? Right? Gave them a list of them all. Wow. Doesn't really seem like that. What, what did we have anybody? set aside for it? What do we estimate? Um, we have $50,000 already appropriated and a $50,000 grant. So we have $100,000 okay. that we can spend immediately, and this is $84,800. Great. Good and they job. can meet our deadline, which was they need to finish the work by June 30th. We put it in the proposal June 19th. That's how the contract is written. Wow, um, so they agreed to it. in a month. Yeah, because we have to spend the grant money or we lose the grant money. All right. Questions from the board? 
No. Motion. No, I think I do that. Move to award a contract to Disability Access Consultants in the amount of $84,800 for Phase 1 of the update to the town's ADA evaluation and transition plan. Motion by Ms. Curran. Second, Second by Mr. Harris. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Lights you later. Uh, we are skipping the policy for tonight, but we will address it. If I could only ask everybody to take a look at the proposed revisions that people have submitted, if you have, so that we have it ready to go. Um, preferably, maybe um, we can adrill, deal with it right off the bat so we can get it taken care of at our next meeting. No. Quick, quick yeah. so we, I took the feedback from two of the selectmen that submitted information to me. Combined into the hot topics, so but you didn't. Of, but you didn't edit anything, right? Because I, I did not edit. Yeah, anything. that's what I thought. Okay, I read the comments, but I um, didn't oh, see I any have the changes. One document that was not edited. I have two documents that were edited by right. selectmen. Yep, and all three were on packet. Yeah, and then With on the you. executive action page is a summary of what they both identified as sort of hot topics. Right, I saw that. Good. And other things are like mine. Yeah, so you don't have to discuss the whole thing. Just those. Uh, hot topics. Got it. <laughs> hot catches, hot talks. All right, good. Next time, uh, next meeting, we'll have that. Let's move on to uh, new business, and we have a um, what is it? One day well. Uh, move the board selectman approve a one day wine and malt license for tailor made bartending for an event at Situate, Situate Maritime Center on May fourth, two thousand nineteen, from eleven until three p.m. Motion by Mr. Vignani, seconded yes, by Mr. Harris. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, that takes care of that. Takes care of that. Um, are there any liaison reports? No. No. Seeing none. Correspondence. Do we have any correspondence? Uh, just a couple of things. Um, Jim already mentioned that um, tomorrow night is the North Situate meeting, um, public meeting to discuss all things North Situate. It's going to be conducted um, by the MAPCs coming in to facilitate that. Um, friends of North Situate and oh the same thing they're inviting everyone to come it's at 630 at the library um, the um, on the 25th which is Thursday night 530 to 8 will be the um, citizen of the year business of the year awards held at the Mill Wharf honoring um, Carol Bowman Dr. Price and the Mill Wharf I believe oh no I'm sorry CP's Pizzas uh, correspondence from Living with Coyotes that? and yeah. Yeah. Living's, Living with Coyotes and Wildlife in Situate on Tuesday, April 30th from 6 to 7.30 at the Emergency Operating Center at the Public Safety Building will be um, information about um, coyotes presented by the Mass Fish and Wildlife as well as the Environmental Police. Um, MassDOT has sent us information concerning <laughs> their capital investment plan and announced public meeting schedule, the closest of which will be in Braintree on Thursday, May 23rd at 6.30 at the Thayer Public Library if you would like to participate in that conversation. And Plymouth County Commissioner sent us a regional public hearing on issues of women and girls on April 24th, 4.30 to 6.30 at the Plymouth Public Library, and um, so, and that we already took care of, and that's it, sir. <laughs> you got to read. You got to read. Regional public hearing on issues of women. They want to know about issues that affect you, your children, your family, and your community. Um, why are they doing that? I'm wondering. From the county. County commissioners. They are a legislative body that affects proposed legislation on women and girls. So they want to be informed before they write legislation. So they need your input. Since when do they Look get involved you. with writing legislation? Uh, this is okay, we'll have this conversation later. No, we're not. <laughs> we'll have it now because I don't only have one more meeting on uh, to be able to discuss and bash Actually, the we're Plymouth appointing you to the Plymouth County Board. <laughs> These guys. Yeah, should just stop. <laughs> This is ridiculous. Please. This is unbelievable. We'll put it on the agenda yeah, for we'll next put, week. Yeah. <laughs> another another waste of taxpayers' dollars. Plymouth John, what do you really think? Telling it right the way it is. Uh, you missed. There is the uh, Easter uprising commemoration on Sunday, April 28th, uh, at noon at the Cole Parkway Bandstand, Situate Harbor. Do we have to read the proclamation? And um, 
No, no. Oh. And then also there's a um, candidates forum sponsored by the Situate Chamber of Commerce. That's actually going to be held on Monday, April 29th from 7 to 9 p.m. at the GAR. Um, I'm pretty, um, I'd be willing to bet it's going to be really a lively uh, debate or discussion. Uh, if tonight's not any indication. Um, and then finally, I did want to at least raise that there's Pizza Palooza which is going to be on May 7th, that's Tuesday, from 5 till 6.30 p.m. Um, at the high school, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's right? at the high school. It's at the high school, the way it was at the gymnasium, which is, which is awesome. I love it. So what I'd suggest is this. Go to that, get filled up, and then come to our selectmen's meeting. Uh, right <laughs> I did forget yeah. one thing. There, is, there was something that was just posted online that not only do we have the most Irish people per capita, but we also have the most pizza shops per capita. <laughs> yes. After tonight. So that's here for the Italians. I go. forgot one thing that I yes. promised so I would mention. Um, on Saturday, uh, they've got Ship Shape Day in the morning, but also the um, Gates Steam um, present, uh, uh, Steam Spectacular is being held at Gates School, and there's something like 200 student um, exhibits that they've worked on it and last year there were 1500 people came to it so it's a really good you go to ship shape day then go over to gates and then go get pizza <laughs> well not all on the same day well when is steam no well, those two but the pizza is not you have to go to read this that day when, when is isn't that <coughs> you saw the sign out here for the steam it, it's, it's saturday yeah oh, it, it's, saturday. it okay. is saturday there. That's awesome. now i can go to bed because there's also an art show that's what i'm thinking yeah. Spring for the That's Arts. Right. Nope, no. not Spring for the Arts, but at the Maritime Center on Friday mm -hmm. for the middle school and I think high school as well. Mm -hmm. A juried. What? Here, juried. Yes. Lots of stuff going on. And a lot of baseball games. Yes. Can we go home now? Um, anything else? Anybody? All right. How about. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. just going to say, let's get Whoops. to approve the minutes for. Your pack and have just a couple of minor changes. You want to move to accept the minutes of April 2nd, 2019, and April 8th, 2019, Board of Selectmen meetings? So move. Second. Second. Motion by Mr. Vignani, seconded by Mr. Harris. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great. And is that it? Move to adjourn and sign documents. Uh, motion by Mr. Vignani, seconded by Mr. Canfield. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, folks.